Conscious Immortality, Conversations with Sri Ramana Maharshi, recorded by Paul Brunton. Chapter 1, Beyond Yoga. Miracles, Wonders, Clairvoyance, Clarideance? What are these? The greatest miracle is to realize self. All these are sidetracks. The realized man is above them. Liebeter describes hundreds of former lives, seen by clairvoyance. Of what use is this? Does it help him or others to know the self? Where these lives but body births, the true birth is in the self. You could be in England now astrally, but will you be better off? You will not be a bit nearer realization. The sights and sounds which may appear during meditation should be regarded as distractions and temptations. None of them should be allowed to beguile the aspirant. Question. Do the appearance of visions or the hearing of mystic sounds come after the concentrated mind is still and blank or before? Answer. They can come both before and after. The thing is to ignore them and to still pay attention only to the self. The Maharshi has one unvarying attitude towards psychic visions to teach disciples. Even when his disciples come and report that they have seen his own picture appear to them, transfigured in brilliant light, he counsels them to put aside all form to remember that what is thus seen is perishable. It has had an origin and must have an end. That what has to be seized upon is the intuitive perception of the self. The mind is the real Kundalini life force. The representation of Kundalini as a serpent is merely to assist duller minds. The forms of representation of chakras are also illusory. What good will Siddhi's occult powers do? Suppose you exercise all these wonderful powers. You are desiring and trying to fulfill that desire, and when a fresh desire breaks out, you expend your energy and attention to that. Is not the net result mere worry to the tossed mind? If happiness is your real goal and aim, you must ultimately come back from your diversion with sit eyes and try to find yourself by inquiring who it is that wants the happiness. Question Why is the peace which I feel in your presence not enduring after I go? Answer These flashes are only signs of the enduring revelation of the self. That peace is the real nature. Contrary ideas are only superimpositions. This is true yoga. You may say, however, that this peace is acquired by practice. It is the wrong notions that are given up by practice. People often misunderstand samadhi, absorption. He Bhagavan told the story of the yogi who spent hundreds of years in trance on the Ganges and on awakening his first thought was for some water he had asked for before entering trance. Thoughts had resumed their sway. The trance was useless. Maharshi said real attainment was to be fully conscious, to be aware of your surroundings and the people around, to move among them all, but not to merge your consciousness in the environment. Remain in your inner, independent awareness of IT. That is the highest, not to sit in trance which merely halts the mind. The mind must be destroyed entirely, not merely arrested. Man runs the course of his samskaras. When taught that he is the self, the teaching affects his mind and his imagination runs riot. His occult experiences are only according to his imagination of the state I am the self. But when he is ripe for receiving the instruction and his mind is about to be sunk into the heart, the imparted instruction works in a flash and he realizes the self. Otherwise there is a struggle. Visions add zest to meditation but does nothing more. To one who declared he had gone to Mathura and seen Krishna in a vision, Maharshi said, The seer, the seen and the seeing were all one, all within yourself. Nobody else saw it. It was your own fancy. Yet, that you really did see Krishna was also true. Occultism and the like are roundabout and circuitous routes to the same goal. Ultimately their followers will arrive at the self. But their leaders do not teach the meditation on the self. 
Thus a school in North India teaches how to listen for sounds and look for lights. Meditation on self is the direct, quickest and right road to realization. The Upanishads declare that which sees not, hears not, thinks not, that is the infinite. Yet these teachings instruct their pupils to listen to sounds however exalted the seeb. It is just the same with those who meditate on the sound of Aum. All these are meditating on hearing something where, as the infinite itself, cannot be heard. Similarly with those occult groups which are developing psychic visions, clairvoyance, chakra centers, etc. They are trying to see forms while the reality is not to be seen. In Vichara self-inquiry there is no attempt to see or hear the real, but to realize it. The school of sound meditation is a roundabout way. They are making for the same goal, but they are wandering around to get there. Meditation on self is the straight, short and direct path which does not concern itself with planes and degrees. Just as in a school there are different classes, lower grades and higher ones, so these occult, psychic and mantric systems represent lower grades. The highest class in the school of life is that devoted to vichara, inquiry into true self. This is practically the same as jhana yoga. It is a matter of maturity. The main object or central teaching of systems like the Vedas which give much consideration to cosmogony is that Brahman is real and that the world and all other things are unreal, but all sorts of aspirants have to be appealed to the dull and the sharp alike. To enable the dull to follow the central teaching a graded cosmogony is given namely Brahman begetting Prakriti, primal nature, whence Mahat Tatham, intellect principle, followed thence the ten matras, the subtle essence of the five elements, the elements, the world, and the body in succession. But to the sharp intelligence of other aspirants, the Vedas say, it is by the self being clouded by avarana, or a covering of ignorance, this dreamlike illusory or phenomenal world appears. In reality the self is not covered. It only appears to be covered to the eye of persons who are under the impression that they are the body. The theory of evolution, the philosophies of planes and degrees, the systems of spirit descending into matter and evolving back, the idea of the self developing towards perfection, all these things are for spiritually uncultured materially minded people. They keep the mind tied to forms and objects, therefore they are false from the highest standpoint, but for advanced spiritually minded people these thoughts are discarded. Similarly, certain esoteric schools talk of evolving selves. How can that be? The true self is infinite, formless, beyond time and hence beyond evolution. It cannot grow to perfection because it is already perfect, free, boundless. But such systems are useful for beginners, for those who think I am the body or I am this person. These teachings are at the stage of kindergarten. They are half-truths. Advanced minds do not need them. Realize the whole truth that you are free now and be free. Forms which interfere with the main course or current of meditation should not be allowed to distract the mind. Bring yourself back into the self, the witness, unconcerned with such distractions. That is the only way to deal with such interruptions. Never forget yourself. A sana is not necessary for the jhani's way. He can practice in any place or posture. Question, what if one meditates incessantly without actions? Answer, try and see. Predispositions will not let you do it. Dhyana unbroken meditation comes only progressively with gradual weakening of asanas, latent tendencies, by the Guru's grace. The intellect booty is the basis of the astral body. It is only an aggregate of certain factors. What else is the astral body? In fact, without the intellect, no kosa is cognized. Who says that there are five kosa s? Is it not the intellect itself? 
There is no kind of sorrow for one who leaves off seeing through his physical senses and begins to see everything as his own self. Further, this grief of the loss of his wife does not indicate real love. The love which one evinces towards external objects and forms is not the real love. Real love has always its abode in one's own self. Question. There are beautiful colors in meditation. It is a pleasure to watch them. We can see God in them. Answer. They are all mental conceptions. The objects or feelings or thoughts, that is, all experiences in meditation, are all only mental conceptions. As regards those who have so called nirvanic visions, it means there is a subject and objects. How can they exist in true nirvana, complete extinction, perfection, great peace? When Sundarsa A. Iyer, a local teacher, described yogic experiences, including visions of light, ringing of bells, etc., which he was having, Maharshi replied, They come, and they would pass away. Be only the witness. I myself had thousands of such experiences, but I had no one to go to and consult about them. Question Can we not see God in concrete visions? Answer Yes, God is seen in the mind. The concrete form may be seen. Still, it is in the devotee's own mind. The form and appearance of the God manifestation are determined by the mentality of the devotee, but the finality is not that, for it still has the sense of duality. It is like a dream vision. After God is perceived, the chara inquiry commences. That ends in the realization of the self. The chara is the final method. Question, did not Paul Brendan see you in London? Was it only a dream? Answer, yes, he had the vision. Nevertheless, he saw me in his own mind. Question, but did he not see this concrete form? Answer, yes, but still it was in his mind. Keeping God in your mind as everything around you becomes Diana. This is the stage before realization which is only in the self. Diana must precede it. Whether you do Diana of God or self, it is immaterial, the goal is the same. Question. Through poetry, music, etc. one sometimes experiences a sense of deep bliss. Will practice of this lead to a deeper samadhi and ultimately to a full vision of the real? Answer. There is happiness at agreeable sights. It is the happiness inherent in the self. That happiness is not alien and afar. You are diving into the pure self on occasions which you consider pleasurable. That diving results in self-existent bliss, but the association of ideas is responsible for foisting this bliss on other things or happenings. In fact, it is within you. On these occasions, you are plunging into the self, though unconsciously. If you do so consciously, you call it realization. I want you to dive consciously into the self, in other words, into the heart. The current does not agree with me. He asked how to realize self, and when I told him he was not satisfied, because I gave him the simple truth. He wants something unusual and unnecessary. So the best thing for me is to keep silence. Let him try his own methods. Question. St. Teresa and others saw the image of Madonna animated. It was external. Others see the images of their devotion floating in their mental sight. This is internal. Is there any difference in degree in these two cases? Answer. Both indicate that the person has strongly developed meditation. Both are good and progressive. There is no difference in degree. The one had a conception of divinity and draws forth mental images and feels them. The other has the conception of divinity in the image and feels it in the image. The feeling is within in both instances. Question. In the spiritual experience of St. Teresa, she was devoted to a figure of Madonna which became animated to her sight, and she was in bliss. Answer. 
the animated figure prepared the mind for introversion. There is a process of concentration of mind on one's own shadow, which in due course becomes animated and answers questions put to it. That is due to Manabala power of mind or Dhyanabala power of meditation. Whatever is external is also transitory. Such phenomena may produce joy for the time being, but abiding peace, in other words, shanti does not result. This is attained only by the removal of avidya, ignorance. Chapter 2 Fallacies of Religion When we worship images and forms, we are really worshipping ourselves in the images. Question Do Vishnu, Shiva, etc. exist? Answer Individual human souls are not the only beings known, but instead of pursuing inquiry in this direction, why not inquire into yourself? To whom do these ideas arise? Scriptures say God created you, but do you see God or anything else in your sleep? If God be real, why does he not shine in your sleep also? You are always, now you are the same as you were in sleep. You are not different now from that one in sleep. Soul and God are only mental conceptions. Do you think of God in sleep? If God be real, he must remain always. You in sleep and wakefulness are just the same. If God be as true as yourself, God must exist in sleep as well as the self. This thought of God must exist in sleep as well as the self. This thought of God arises only in waking state. Who thinks? Is it the body? The body does not speak. If so, did it speak in sleep? Who is this I? Are you aware of being in the body in sleep? The fact is that you are neither within nor without the body. Chapter 3 The Meaning of Religion Question As for God's help in my effort, is not that to be acquired by worship etc.? Will not that be helpful? Answer Is Pharaoh's grace and worship for it etc.? are intermediate steps adopted and necessary to be adopted so long as the goal is not reached. When it is reached God is the self. A visitor asks Sri Bhagavan for prasad, gift, offering, from his lunch in Maher she said, eat without thinking of the ego. Then what you eat becomes Bhagavan's prasad. If I give you one morsel for my plate, each one will ask for a morsel. What will be left for me if I distribute the whole plate to others? So you see that is not devotion. There is no significance in eating a morsel from my plate. Be a true devotee. Question. Should I continue idol worship? Answer. So long as you think you are the body, there is no harm. It may lead to concentration of mind. Get one pointed. Question. Is there a separate being, Isfara, who is the rewarder of virtue and punisher of sins? Is there a God? Answer, yes. Question, does Isfara have an end? Does Isfara get dissolved in pralia period of repose or dissolution? Answer, pralia is the soul held by Maya. If you can, with all your defects and limitations, rise by jhana into the realization of self, and above all, pralya and samsara. Or is it not reasonable to expect that Isfara, who is infinitely more intelligent than you, is above and beyond pralya? Enlighten yourself by realizing yourself. Question, should I practice sandhya morning and evening religious rites? Answer, if you think it necessary, by all means practice it. Everything in the Bhagavad Gita and other scriptures is said to suit the particular temperaments of the hearers. Question. Young men who are taught scriptures in their early age are found to detest the same later in life. Answer. The revulsion of feeling is not due to age but due to misunderstanding. If rightly guided they will appreciate the scriptures all the more in their mature age. All creeds are but preliminaries for the masses, leading up to the real truth of the self. The religions are not necessarily the highest expression or the highest wisdom of their founders, 
who had to consider the times in which they lived and the mental capacities of the people. The highest wisdom is too subtle for most minds, and so a whole scheme of worlds, gods, bodies, evolution etc. had to be given out because people seem to find it easier to believe all these things rather than believe the simple truth of the one reality, self. Thus reincarnation, astral planes, survival after death, etc. are true but only from a lower standpoint. It is all a matter of standpoint. From the highest, that of the real self, all else disappears as illusory and only the reality remains. It is true that subtle astral bodies exist, because in order to function in the dream world a body is necessary for that world, but it too is real only on its own plane whereas the one self is always real, always and eternally existent, whether we are aware of it or not. Hence it is better to seek that because the other self-bodies are only conditionally real. An ordinary Christian is only satisfied when told God is in some far-off heaven, not to be reached by us unaided, that Christ alone has known him, and he alone can save us. Hence when told the simple truth that the kingdom of heaven is within you, he is not satisfied and will read far-fetched meanings in the statement. Mature minds alone can grasp the simple truth in all its nakedness. Question, what of idols? Answer, they have a deep significance. Their worship is a method for concentration of mind. The mind is wont to move externally. It must be checked and turned within. Its habit is to dwell on names and forms, for all external objects possess names and forms. Such names and forms are made symbolic of mental conceptions in order to divert within itself the mind from external objects and make it dwell within itself. The idols, mantras, sacred syllables, rites, etc., are all meant to give food to mind in its inward course so that it may become capable of being concentrated, after which alone the supreme state can be reached. Isfera has individuality in mind and body, which are perishable, but at the same time he has also the transcendental consciousness and liberation inwardly. Isfera, a personal god or supreme creator of the universe, does exist. This is true only from the relative standpoint for those who have not realized ultimate truth and who believe in reality of individual souls. From the absolute standpoint the sage cannot accept any other existence, other than the impersonal self, one and formless. Isfera has a physical body, a form and name, but it is not so gross as this material body. It can be seen in visions in the form created by the devotee. The form and name of God are many and various, changing with the religions. His essence is same as ours the real self being only one and without form. Hence the forms he assumes are only creations or appearances. Isfara is immanent in every person and every material object throughout the universe. The totality of all things and beings constitutes God. There is a power out of which a small fraction has become all this universe, and the remainder is in reserve. Both this reserve power plus the manifested power as material world together constitute as Pharaoh. To worship this creator man must understand God's nature and man's relation to it. All moral conduct, all rational thought, is the right worship of this God. Even the Western skeptic who does his limited best to understand God is performing right worship. The real source is not this relative God, but it can be reached through this type of worship. Chapter 4 The Meaning of Mysticism Is it harmless to keep on with smoking? Answer, no, for tobacco is a poison. Better to do without it. Question, what are the passions? Answer, they are the same force as is used in meditation, only diverted into other channels. Question, do you recommend that meat and alcoholic drinks be given up? Answer, yes. It is advisable to give them up because this abstention is a useful aid for beginners. 
The difficulty in surrendering them is not that they are really necessary, but merely because we have become inured to them by custom and habit to them. Till the mind is firm in realization, it must have some picture or idea to think of, else the meditation will quickly give place to sleep or wandering thoughts. Yes, meditation in early morning upon arising is the best time because mind is then free of thoughts, cares, etc. Regarding meditation in a group or alone, the latter is advisable for beginners, but we must learn to advance to the point where we create our mental solitude, then it does not matter where we are. We must learn to find solitude mentally in the midst of society. We should not give up our meditation because we are among people, but carry it on even then, but do not do it ostentatiously. Do it secretly, inwardly. Do not make a physical exhibition of the fact that you are meditating. When attention is directed towards objects and intellect, mind is aware only of these things. That is our present state. But when we attend to the self within, we become conscious of it alone. It is therefore all a matter of attention. Our mind has for so long been attending to external things that the latter have enslaved it and drag it hither and thither. Question. It is said that the yogi should sit on a deerskin for meditation as this prevents loss of magnetism during meditation. Answer. It is not necessary to use one. The earth will not rob you of the effects of your meditation because you do not happen to use a deerskin. It is good that you have given up smoking. Men are enslaved by tobacco and cannot give it up, but tobacco only gives a temporary stimulation to which there must be a reaction with craving for more. It is also not good for meditation practice. If the mind wanders we must at once realize we are not the body and inquire who am I and the mind must be brought back to realize the self. Thus all evils are destroyed and happiness is realized. You can meditate with eyes open or shut whichever suits you best. It differs with different people. The real sight is when the mind looks through the eyes. If it is not looking through them because it is occupied with some interior things, it does not see, though the eyes are open. Similarly noises. If you pay attention to them, you hear them, but if you persistently pay attention only to the self within, you will not hear them. Question. The mind is fickle and wandering. How to control it? Answer. If you at once direct your attention to the question who is the individual to whom this fickleness occurs, the tossing of the mind to and fro ceases. There is a subtle essence in all food. It is this which affects the mind. Hence for those who are endeavoring to practice meditation to find the self, there have been dietetic rules laid down which it is advisable to follow. Sattvic pure foods promote meditation whereas rajasic active, meat and tamasic dull, food hinder it. Question, how are lust, anger, etc. overcome? Answer, by dayana, that is, by the holding on to a single thought and putting off all other thoughts. Question, what is to be meditated on? Answer, anything you prefer but you should stick to one thing. Contemplation means fight. As soon as you begin meditation other thoughts will crowd in, gather force and try to sink this single thought. The latter must gain strength by repeated practice. This battle always takes place in meditation. Peace of mind is brought about by contemplation through the absence of varying thoughts. When Diana is well established it cannot be given up. It will go on automatically even when you are engaged in work, play or even sleep. It must become so deep-rooted that it is natural. Question. Is heart the same as the physiological heart? Answer. No. It is all meant to help the aspirant. It is only the source of the I thought. That is the ultimate truth. Seek your source. The search takes you automatically to the heart. By yogic practice one starts with the lowest chakra, wheel or center. 
goes down and then rises up, wanders all through until the brain center or the thousand-petaled lotus is gained. By jhana practice one settles down in the heart center directly. The heart chakra of yogis, called anahata, traditionally the fourth chakra on the susama or central subtle channel, centered in the middle of the chest, is not the same as this heart. If so, why should they progress further on to Sahasrara, the seventh and topmost subtle center located in the crown of the head? Moreover, the question arises because of the sense of separateness persisting in us. We are never away from that center. Before reaching Anahata or after passing it, one is only in the center, whether one understands it or not, one is not away from the center. Practice of yoga or vichar remains in the center only. Question, what is pranayama? Answer, prana is equivalent to self, soul, atma, etc., as it is the life current or whatever name you give it. Pranayama is the control of the body, the senses and the intellect through the breath. Mind is thus controlled and thus dies down with this practice. Mind and prana originate from the same source. By control of breath the mind subsides and then an unconscious blank state is produced, a swoon or trance like death. Although that state is the natural state, the man who has not controlled the mind is dazed and is merged in it. It is a state of great peace, true, but it is temporary and when it ends the yogi wants to get it back again and so he does his breath control again. It is necessary for him to go beyond pranayama and to gain direct control of the mind and thus practice a permanent peace, sahaja samadhi, not merely temporary samadhi. The thing is to get the capacity to bring mind to peace, to make it still and not allow it to wander. For that pranayama is given out as instruction. Retention of breath leads to contemplation, but that is for the advanced man. Paraka inhalation is the beginning, then comes kampaka retention, and last is richaka exhalation. Pranayama is useful only in so far as it helps to get mind control. For those who seek mental peace this is enough, but there is a highly detailed, complicated pranayama for those who seek siddhis, occult powers. Pranayama is for one not endowed with the strength to control the mind. There is no way so sure as the sage's company for this purpose. Pranayama need not be exactly as described in Hatha Yoga. If engaged in devotion or meditation, just a little control of breath will suffice to control mind. Mind is the rider and breath is the horse. Pranayama is a check on the horse. By that check the rider is checked. It may be done just a little. Watching the breath is one way to do it. The mind is abstracted from other activities and engaged in watching the breath. That controls breath and in its turn the mind. If you are unable to do richaka and puraka, it does not matter. Breath may be retained for a short while during meditation. Then two good results will accrue. Regulation of breath is gained by watching its movements. Similarly, if the mind is watched, the thoughts will cease too. That is what the mind quest really is. Some meditation brings about suspension of the breath, while vice versa, the mind ceases to be restless after some breath control. Control of mind spontaneously affects control of breath or kampaka. The persons who use breath control especially are those who are practicing by themselves without a guru's presence. Then mind becomes controlled as a result, but mind control spontaneously begins to arise in the presence of a superior power like a guru. When life is in peril, the whole interest begins to center round saving it. Similarly, when the breath is held in pranayama, the mind cannot afford to jump at its accustomed external objects. Thus there is rest for it, so long as the breath is held. 
Since all attention is being turned on the breath and its regulation, other interests are lost. Thought and respiration are both different aspects of the same individual life current upon which both depend. If respiration is forcibly repressed, thought follows suit and is fixed to the usual dominant thought. If thought is forcibly slowed down and pinned to a point, the vital activity of respiration is slowed down, made even and confined to the lowest level compatible with the continuance of life. Thus the mind grasps the subtle and merges into it. Control of breath calms the mind, then see who is aware of the calmness. Mechanical pranayama will not lead one to the goal. It is only an aid. While doing it mechanically, take care to be alert in mind and remember the I thought and seek its source. Then you will find that where prana sinks there the I thought arises. They sink and arise together. The I thought also will sink along with prana. Simultaneously, another luminous and infinite I I will manifest and it will be continuous and unbroken. That is the goal. It goes by different names, God, Bhakti, John, etc. When the attempt is made, it will of itself take you to the goal. Question What is the difference and effect of the three methods, namely inquiry, bhakti, and control of breath? Answer. Kamhaka is an aid to control of mind, in other words suppression or annihilation of thoughts. One may practice pranayama, richaka, piraka and kamhaka or practice only kamhaka. Still another, ajani, on controlling the mind, control of the prana and kamhaka automatically results. Watching the inhalation and expiration is also pranayama. These methods are threefold apparently. They are in fact only one because they lead to the same goal. They are however adopted differently according to the stage of the aspirant and his antecedent vasanas, latent tendencies, or samskaras predispositions. Breath control is meant for one who cannot directly control his thoughts. It serves as a brake serves a car, but one should not stop with it but proceed to concentration and contemplation. The postures help breath control, which helps contemplation, hence hatha yoga, which is also a cleansing process. Question. I hear the psychic sounds of nada, divine sound, bell, echoes. Answer. If you look upon it objectively, you are likely to lose yourself in it. One sound after another would come and then there would be blank, but remember to look who it is that hears these sounds. If you hold your inner self firmly, it will be immaterial whether you hear them or not. Keep the subject in view. Not a yoga is certainly one of the methods to concentration, but after you have obtained the concentration, fix it in the self, but if the subject is lost sight of, then you go to laya or blankness. To one who fixed his attention or sight between eyebrows but felt no progress, the Maharshi said that the sight is fixed but the seer was not kept in view. If the seer is remembered always then it will be all right. Question. What is the difference between meditation and self-inquiry? Answer. Meditation can only occur if the ego is maintained. There is the ego and the object meditated upon. This method is indirect. On the contrary, by seeking the ego source, the ego disappears. What is left over is self. This method is the direct one. One of the obstacles of meditation to overcome is laya, temporary stillness, a lull. Hence the teacher who composed the Bhagavad Gita said, practice moderation in sleep. This means four to five hours sleep. Fakirs who tried to cut out sleep altogether went to ascetic extremes which are unnecessary. Excessive sleep may be caused by overeating or overexertion, so moderate these things too. Deep sleep is not possible in daytime as the sun's rays have a peculiar effect preventing it. Hence, if you doze in daytime, it is very easy to turn that into meditation, as it is close to that condition. 
As regards sleep, the moment you wake up, be alert and begin to think of God's self. Keep alert throughout the day. In other words, practice the presence of God. The second obstacle is the mind turning to external objects. When that is overcome, then the third obstacle is the meditator forgets that he is there to practice meditation. Then the fourth obstacle arises the mind working internally. If it is difficult to control the mind, there is control by breath, which comes from practice alone. Otherwise, by association with the wise, the mind comes under control spontaneously. Such is the greatness of Satsanga association with the wise. It must clearly be understood that for meditation, it is not prohibited to practice without postures, fixed times, or other accessories. Question. Any posture for Europeans? Answer. It is according to the mental equipment of the individual. No fixed rule. Question. What about those not accustomed to vegetarian diet? Answer. Habit is only adjustment to the environments. It is the mind that matters. The fact is that the mind has been trained to think certain foods are tasty. Nourishment may be obtained from vegetarian food no less than from flesh, but the realized man's mind is not influenced by the food he takes. But do it gradually, that is, getting accustomed to vegetarianism. Question. But if it is a matter of non-killing, then even plants have life. Answer. So too have the tiles upon which you are seated. Question. Why do you take milk and not eggs? Answer. Domesticated cows yield more milk than their calves require and they find it a pleasure to be relieved. Eggs contain potential lives. Question. I have practiced Diana on a ham brahmasmi. In a few moments a blank prevails, my brain gets heated and I get afraid of death. I want your guidance. Answer. Who sees the blank? The consciousness overlooking the blank is the self. The fright of death is only after the thought arises. Whose death do you fear? For whom is that fear? There is the identification of the self with the body. So long as there is this, there will be fear. The spiritual heart is different from the physical heart. Beating is the phenomenon only of the latter. The former is the seat of experience. Just as a dynamo supplies the motive power to whole systems of lights, fans, etc., so the original Shakti supplies energy to the beating of the heart, respiration, etc. Question. What of chakras? Answer. Atma alone is to be realized. Its realization holds all else in its compass. Shakti, Siddhis, etc., are all included in it. Those who speak of these have not realized the Atman. Atma is in the heart and is the heart itself. The manifestation is in the brain. The passage from heart to brain might be considered to be through Sushama. Yogis say the current rising up to Sahasra ends there. That experience is not complete. For jhana they must come to the heart. Hridaya heart center or core is the Alpha and Omega. Explanation of the experience of blazing light in the last chapter of A Search in Secret India. It is said that yogis experience during the course of their yogic exercises several lights and colors before they actually realize the self. Once upon a time Parvati the consort of Siva did penance to attain the eternal. She saw certain lights. As they were all felt and seen by her senses, she concluded that those lights did not constitute the eternal. After a long penance, she beheld a very powerful light. She came to the same conclusion that this light also did not constitute the eternal. Then after severe penance, she attained peace and then concluded that the self is the eternal. The existence of things is seen only through light. Then how can it be wrong to say that it is that light by which one realizes one's self? The knowledge of realizing one's self is that light. 
During Nirvikalpa Samadhi it exists as the knowledge by which one is enabled both to see the light seen in Samadhi and also that which is beyond that light. It is not ignorance, then can it be said that it is not light? Concentration is not thinking on more than one thing. It is putting off all other thoughts which obstruct the vision of our true nature. Now it appears difficult to quell the thoughts, whereas in the regenerate state it will be found more difficult to call it thoughts. Were there then things to think of when there is the self alone? Thoughts can function only if there are objects. How can thoughts arise at all? Thought makes us believe that it is difficult to cease thinking. If the error is found, one would not be fool enough to exert oneself unnecessarily by way of thinking. Question, what path do you advise? We need your grace. Answer, be still, do not think and know that I am. When the news of a devotee's marriage was conveyed to the Maharshi, someone asked, why has he done this? Surely he will now fall back. The Maharshi laughed and said, Why should marriage interfere with his spiritual progress? Unless satisfaction of bodily wants, such as hunger, thirst, and evacuation of excreta, etc., is done, meditation cannot progress. The results of achara meditation are willpower, developed concentration, control of passions, indifference to the worldly objects, virtue and equality to all. Hypnotic methods are not advisable to induce yogic samadhi because light gazing stupefies the mind and produces catalepsy of will temporarily, and it secures no permanent benefit. A deity may be used to meditate upon as a mental image until the meditator merges into the self then the image will fall away of its own accord and the deity will vanish as part of the world illusion. Only the Supreme Self is to be the object of meditation. Truly speaking, meditation is remaining fixed in self, but when thoughts cross the mind and the effort is made to eliminate them, the effort is termed meditation. Remain as you are. That is the aim. The technique of meditation is negative only inasmuch as thoughts are kept away. Question, I have no peace of mind. Answer, peace is our real nature. It need not be attained. Our thoughts must be obliterated. The get a method is the one to do it. Whenever mind strays away, bring it back to bear on meditation. Question, I cannot bring my mind to meditate. Answer, an elephant when free puts its trunk here and there and looks restless. If a chain is given to it the trunk holds it without being turned this way and that as before. In just the same way, the mind is restless if it has no aim. If an aim is fixed, the mind is restful. Concentration is impossible so long as there are samskaras. They obstruct bhakti also. Practice and dispassion are necessary. Dispassion is the absence of diffuse thoughts. Practice is concentration on one thought only. Firm perseverance is also necessary. The one is positive and other is a negative aspect of meditation. Yes, our minds are weak. The help called grace is necessary. Service to the guru is only to obtain that. In the presence of a strong-minded soul, a guru, the weak mind comes under control more easily. That which is is grace, there is nothing else. Question, what is the best way to get rid of thoughts? Answer, is it the mind that tries to kill itself? How can the thief catch himself? It can't be. So the best way is to try to realize your real nature, what you really are. When we see ourselves, then, there are no thoughts to be got rid of. Question, how may the mind be controlled? Answer, there are two methods. One is to see what the mind is, then it subsides. The second is to hold something else and control of the mind comes therewith. Yoga serves to concentrate the mind. The predominant idea keeps off all others. The object is according to the individual. 
Question, my mind is not steady in meditation. Answer, whenever it wanders, turn it inward again and again. The mind is too weak. Strengthen it by practice by reducing the thoughts to a single one. Question, how to meditate? With eyes open or closed? Answer, it may be done either way. The point is that the mind must be introverted and kept active in its pursuit. Sometimes when the eyes are closed, the latent thoughts rush forth with great vigor. It may also be difficult to introvert the mind with eyes open, as that requires strength of mind. When the mind takes in objects it is contaminated. The main factor is to keep off other thoughts and to keep the mind in its own pursuit without taking in external impressions or thinking of other matters. Question, how to control thoughts? Answer, the wavering of mind is because of its weakness due to dissipation of its energy in the shape of thoughts. When one makes the mind stick to one thought, the energy is conserved and the mind becomes stronger. Strength of mind is gained by practice, as the Gita points out. In the earlier stages, mind reverts to the search only at long intervals, but with continued practice, it reverts at shorter intervals until finally it does not wander at all. It is then that the dormant Shakti manifests and the mind resolves itself into the life current. Question How to get rid of the mind? Answer Is it the mind that wants to kill itself? The mind cannot kill itself. So your business is to find the real nature of the mind. Then you find there is no mind. When the self is sought, the mind is not. Abiding in the self, one need not worry about the mind. The illumination is experienced in the right side of the chest, in the heart, when self is realized. Kundalini and chakras exist for beginners who practice that path of yoga. But for the one who is practicing self inquiry, they do not exist. Aham Brahmasmi is only a thought. Who says it? Brahman does not say so. What need is there for him to say it? Nor can the real Aham say so. For Aham only abides as Brahman. Saying it is only a thought. Whose thought is it? All thoughts are from the unreal, in other words, the ego. Remain without thinking. So long as there is thought, there will be fear. So long there is thought even of Aham Brahmasmi, there will be forgetfulness. Aham Brahmasmi is only an aid to concentration. It keeps off other thoughts. That one thought alone persists. See whose is that thought. It will be found to be from I. Where from is the I thought? Probe into it. I thought will vanish. The Supreme Self will shine by itself. No effort is there. When the one real I remains alone, it will not be saying I am Brahman. Does a man say I am a man? Unless he is challenged, why should he declare himself a man? Does anyone mistake him for a brute that he should say, No, I am not a brute, I am a man? Similarly, Brahman or I being alone, there is no one there to challenge it and so there is no need to be saying I am Brahman. Question, why should I meditate on heart? Answer, because you seek consciousness. Where else can you find it? Can you reach it externally? You have to find it internally. Therefore you are directed inward. Again, heart is only the seat of consciousness. Question, on what should we meditate? Answer, who is the meditator? Ask that question first. Remain as the meditator. There is then no need to meditate. It is the sense of doership that is the impediment to Diana. Question, why does not the mind sink into the heart, even while meditating? Answer, a floating body does not readily sink unless some means are adopted for doing so. Pranayama makes the mind quiescent. The mind must be alive in meditation pursued unremittingly, even when it is at peace. It sinks into the heart. Or the floating body might be loaded with weights and made to sink. 
So also Satsanga will make the mind sink into the heart. Satsanga is both out and in. The externally visible Guru pushes the mind inward. He is also in the hearts of the seekers, and so he draws the inward bent mind into the heart. This question is asked only when the man begins to meditate and finds the difficulty. Let him practice pranayama just a little, the mind will be purified. It does not now sink into the heart because the samskaras stand as obstacles. They are removed by pranayama or satsanga. In fact, the mind is always in the heart, but it is restive and moves about due to samskaras. When the samskaras are made ineffective, it will be restful and at peace. By pranayama, the mind will be quiescent only temporarily because the samskaras are still there. If the mind is made at makara, one who abides in atma, it will no longer give trouble. That is done by meditation. It is necessary to be aware while controlling thoughts. Otherwise, it will lead to sleep. Awareness is the chief factor and is indicated by the fact of emphasizing pratyahara, withdrawal of the senses, dharana, single mindedness, dhyana, meditation, total concentration, samadhi, absorption, union, even after pranayama. Pranayama makes the mind steady and suppresses thoughts. Why is this not enough? Because awareness is the one necessary factor. Such states are imitated by taking morphia, chloroform, etc., but they do not lead to liberation. Meditation is one form of approach that will drive away other thoughts. The one thought of God will dominate over others. That is concentration. The object of meditation is thus the same as that of achara. Question, what is the heart? Answer, it is the seat if such may be said of the self. It is not the physical heart. Question, how to overcome discomforts of the body when sitting for meditation, such as mosquito nuisance? Answer, you wish to gain concentration? Then whatever happens to the body, never mind. Keep up the same strain of thought effort. The bodily discomfort will pass away, so do not think of the discomfort but keep mind firm on your meditation. If you are not strong enough to resist the attacks of mosquitoes, then how can you hope to gain realization? It is like waiting for the waves of the ocean to subside before you enter to bathe. Be strong and keep up the constant effort. A devotee who asked for Maharshi's grace and was told, you have it, felt a throb in the center of his chest like a slight pressure. He felt happy and extraordinarily peaceful. He asked Maharshi about it later and Maharshi said, Hold that sensation firmly whenever the mind is distracted. Your mantra saying is no more necessary. It is called Sphurana. It is felt on several occasions such as fear, excitement, etc. It is really always there, felt at the heart center. It is associated with antecedent causes and usually confounded with the body. Really it is alone and pure, it is the self. If the mind be fixed on it and the man senses it continuously and automatically, it is realization. For now, it is a foretaste of realization. Question, how does a householder fare on the path? Answer, why do you think you are a householder? If you go out as a sannyasi, similar thoughts will haunt you that you are a sannyasi. Whether you continue in the house or go into the forest, your mind haunts you. The ego is the source of thoughts. It creates the body and world and makes you think you are a householder. If you renounce, it will only substitute the thought sannyasi for householder in the environments of the forest for the home, but the mental obstacles are always there. The change of environment is not a help, for the mind must be overcome in both places. If you can do it in the forest, why not in the home? Why change environment? Your efforts can be made even now wherever you are. The environments never abandon you. Look at me. I left home. What do you find here now? Is it different from your home? 
That is the reason to emphasize Sahaja Samadhi. One should be in spontaneous Samadhi, in other words in his primal state, even in the midst of different environments. Yoga is but a means to concentrate. Question, I find concentration difficult. Answer, go on practicing. Your concentration must come as easy as breathing. Fix yourself to some one thing and try to hold on to it. All will come right. Question, the six chakras are mentioned. The jeva is said to reside in the heart. Is that so? Answer, the heart need not be taken to be fleshy one. It does not matter. We are not concerned with anything less than the self. About that we have certainty within ourselves, no doubts or discussions. The centers are for purposes of concentration. They are interpreted symbolically. The current of Kundalini is ourselves. Question, worldly life is so distracting to aspirants. Answer, do not allow yourself to be distracted. Inquire for whom there is distraction. It will not afflict you after a little practice. Question, but even the attempt is impossible. Answer, make it and it will be found not so difficult. Question, the Kundalini is said to rise from spinal base. Answer, that current is ourselves. Meditation is sticking to one thought. That single thought keeps away other thoughts. The dissipated mind is a sign of its weakness. By constant meditation it gains strength, in other words gives up its weakness of fugitive thoughts. Question. A form object for meditation is duality. Can it be God? Answer. One who questions like that had better adopt the Vicharamarga path of inquiry. Form is not for him. Question. In my meditation a blank interposes, I see no figure. Answer. Of course not. Who sees blank? You must be there. There is consciousness witnessing the blank. Question, does it mean that I must go deeper and deeper? Answer, yes, there is no moment when you are not. When a devotee had been taking only one very light meal a day, Maharshi sharply remarked at breakfast, why don't you leave off taking coffee also? His implication was to rebuke the over-importance placed on diet regulation by the devotee. Question, what is renunciation? Answer, giving up the ego. Question, is it not giving up possessions? Answer, the possessor too. Question, how to root out the sex idea? Answer, by rooting out the false idea of the body being the self. There is no sex in self. Be the real self. Then no sex troubles. Question. Can fasting cure sex? Answer. Yes, but it is temporary. Mental fast is the real aid. Fasting is not an end in itself. There must be spiritual development side by side. Complete fasting makes the mind too weak. You cannot derive sufficient strength for this spiritual quest. That the spiritual quest must be kept up right through a fast if it is to benefit spiritually. Question, which posture is best? Answer, any one, possibly sukha sana, an agreeable position, but posture is immaterial for the jhana path. Posture really means steadfast location in the self. It is internal. Question, what time is most suitable for meditation? Answer, what is time? It is only an idea. Whatever you think of it, it looks like that. Time is immaterial for jhana path, but sometimes are good for beginners. It is the attachments which are injurious. The actions are not bad in themselves. There is no harm in eating three, four times. But only do not say, I want this kind of food and not that kind. Moreover, you take these meals in twelve hours of wakeful state whereas you are not eating in twelve hours of sleep. Does sleep lead you to mukti? 
It is wrong to suppose that simple inactivity leads one to mukti. So long as one thinks that he is a sannyasi, he is not one. So long as one does not think of world illusion, he is not worldly, but is a real sannyasi. The patient must himself take the medicine prescribed by the doctor in order that he might be cured of his illness. The guru thus prescribes the path too, but the aspirant must himself follow it. Question. Is it better for reaching salvation to be married or to be a celibate? Answer. Whatever you think better. There is no difference. Thoughts must cease and the reasoning faculty manas disappear. Feeling is the prime factor in meditation, not reason. It ought to come in the right side of chest, not in the head, because the heart is there. It must be held tight. Your present experience of thought ceasing is due to the influence of the atmosphere you are now in. Can you find the same experience away from this atmosphere? It is spasmodic. Until it becomes permanent, practice is necessary. After one gets established in truth, practice drops away naturally. Question. Is meditation analytical or synthetical? Answer. Analysis and synthesis are in the region of intellect. The self transcends the intellect. What is meditation? It is to think about one thing. Therefore in meditation try to hold on to one thought, and all the other thoughts will gradually go away. They may be present for some time, but if you resolutely hold to your single thought, they will not trouble you. Our minds are weak through habit, unable to concentrate. We must make the mind strong so as to keep to one thought. Absence of mental operations is solitude. There are different postures according to the different grades. The best posture is to be in the self. All these questions of posture and hatha yoga arise only to those who have the body consciousness. In other words, think I am the body. However, the yogis say adopt that posture in which by experience you find meditation easiest. But you may not necessarily have to adopt a yoga posture. If you find sitting in a chair or walking easiest for you to meditate, these are the right postures for you. Hatha yoga is for beginners. Find the self and remain in it, and you will not be concerned about postures. Question, why is it so difficult to practice meditation and to conquer the mind? Answer, because of the past vasanas which prevent us. But we must go on trying tendencies etc. from former births are called vasanas. Those who take opium or alcoholic liquor are unconsciously seeking the blissful thoughtlessness of the real self. They get an intimation of that bliss by drugs, but afterwards they must resume their normal state, and the craving comes back stronger till they become chronic addicts and slaves. To all such artificial rises there must be a fall back. If the mind is subdued, everything is conquered. Where is renunciation? It is not outside of us, it is here pointing to the heart. Where is solitude? In the mind. Alexander Selkirk Noah's alone on an island, but he wanted to get away. So that was not solitude for him. We must achieve these things within ourselves. The kingdom of heaven is to be found within us. Question. If the efforts at meditation are hindered through past karma, what remedy can there be? Answer. It is self-stultifying to drown oneself in such fanciful fears. Fate and past karma relate to the external world. Dive boldly within you. These will not hinder you. It is the thinking of hindrances that forms a serious hindrance. We have all to return to our source. Every human being is seeking its source and must one day come to it. We came from the within, we have gone outward, now we must turn inward. What is meditation? It is our natural self. We have covered ourself over with thoughts and passions. To throw them off we must concentrate on one thought, the self. When is mauna silence necessary? It is but one of the aids used to attain realization. 
Once realization is complete, it can be cast aside for it will be of no further use. Realization is itself mauna. Speech is regarded by maunis as a waste of energy, which they are directing inwards towards the self. One method of securing the temporary cessation of mental activities, manalaya, is association with sages. They are adepts in samadhi and it has become easy, natural and perpetual with them. Those moving with them closely and in sympathetic contact gradually absorb the samadhi habit from them. What is mental concentration except that it be meditation? Vocal japa becomes mental which is the same as meditation. Maharshi remarked caustically to a yogi who sat with eyes closed as steady as a rock for a couple of hours at a time, do you really want to learn meditation? Mere posture is not enough, it is where your mind is. So learn from that young man over there and pointed out to a young graduate who had left Animalai University with a degree but had been unemployed for nearly a year. He was now haunting the ashram constantly. Maharshi continued, he sits there with eyes closed too but his whole mind is centered on obtaining employment. He prays continually in silence to me to give him a job, but where can I give people jobs? Maharshi's point was that the mind's own posture was all important. Question, how can you say that the heart is on the right when anatomists find it on the left? Answer, it is not denied that the physical organ is on the left, quite correct. But the heart of which I speak is on the right only. It is my experience. No authority is required. Still you can find confirmation in the Sita Upanishad. There is a mantra in the latter saying so. The whole cosmos is combined in one pinhole in the heart. A tiny hole in the heart remains always closed and is opened by vichara investigation into the self. The result is I, I consciousness, the same as samadhi. Question, how can the all immanent God reside in the heart? Answer, do we not reside in one place? Do you not say you are in your body? Similarly, God is said to reside in the heart. The heart is not a place. Some name is mentioned for the place of God because we think we are in the body. This kind of instruction is meant for those who can appreciate only relative knowledge. Being immanent everywhere, there is no place for God. Because we think we are in the body, we also believe that we are born. However, we do not think of the body of God or of method of realization in our deep slumber. Yet in our waking state, we hold on to the body and think we are in it. Paramatma is that from which the body is born, in which it lives and into which it resolves. We however think that we reside within the body. Hence such instruction is given. The instruction means, look within. The heart is not physical. Meditation should not be on the right or the left. Meditation should be on the self. Everyone knows I am. Who is the I? It will be neither within nor without, neither on the right nor the left. I am, that is all. Heart is the center from which everything springs. Because you now see the world, the body, etc., it is said that there was a center for them called the heart. But when we are actually in it, then heart is neither center nor circumference for there is nothing else. One day a group of musicians came to play to the Maharshi. The instruments included flute, violin and harmonium. Afterwards there was a discussion as to the merits of the various instruments, which was most pleasing etc. And the Maharshi said that he himself listened to nothing but the harmonium as its steady, monotonous, one-pointed rhythm helped to keep one centered in the self. What are you? Are you the body? No. You are pure consciousness. Retirement means abedans in the self, nothing more. It is not leaving one set of surroundings to become entangled in another nor even leaving the concrete world and wallowing in mental world. The birth of the sun, his death etc. are also in the self. 
the question of compatibility does not arise. That squirrel was awaiting an opportunity to run out. Meher, she said, all wish to rush out. There is no limit to going out. Happiness lies within and not without. Question, what is the significance of the spot between the eyebrows? Answer, that is mentioned as if to say, do not see with your eyes. The mind functions both as light and as objects. If divested of things the light alone will remain over. Question, but must you know there is such light? Answer, sight or cognition pertains to the present state because there is light. Light is the essential requisite for sight. It is plain in our daily life. Among the lights the sunlight is the most important. Hence they speak of the glory of millions of suns. Question, how does it affect the subject whether the objects are seen or not? Answer, if the light, in other words the cognizer or the consciousness, is seen, there will be no object to be seen. Pure light, in other words consciousness, will alone remain over. It is not enough that light is seen. It is also necessary to have the mind engaged in a single activity, for example, the elephant trunk and the chain. Question, why is regulation of breath necessary? Answer. Concentration of breath or its regulation is only for controlling the mind so that the mind may not wander about. Question, is there difference between internal and external samadhi? Answer, yes there is. External samadhi is stillness while witnessing the world without reacting to it from within. The external samadhi is like a still sea and the internal samadhi like a steady flame. Sehaja Samadhi is the identity of the flame with the ocean. Question, does not one lose his body consciousness in Samadhi? If so, how can there be difference? Answer, what is body consciousness? Analyze it. There must be a body and consciousness limited to it which together make up the body consciousness. These must lie in another consciousness which is absolute and unaffected. Hold to it. That is samadhi. It exists when there is no body consciousness because it transcends the latter. It also exists when there is the body consciousness. So it is always there. What does it matter whether the body is lost or retained? When lost, it is internal samadhi. When retained, it is external samadhi. That is all. Question, but the mind does not sink into samadhi even for a second. Answer, a strong conviction is necessary that I am the self, transcending the mind and the phenomena. Question, nevertheless the mind proves to be like a cork at my attempts to sink it. Answer, what does it matter if the mind is active? It is so after all on the substratum of the self. Hold to the self even during the mental activities. Question, I cannot go within sufficiently deep. Answer, it is wrong to say so. Where are you now, if not in the self? Where should you go? All that is necessary is the stern belief that you are the self. Say rather that the other activities throw a veil on you. Question, is there any harm in my continuing japa in this manner? Or is it essential that I should only do the bare who am I inquiry? Answer, no, you can trace the root of any thought or japa or mantra and continue to do so until you have an answer to your query. That is in itself meditation in the right direction leading you to the same goal as the who am I inquiry. Man only requires one solid meal daily at midday with light liquid refreshment morning and evening. The best posture is to plant the guru firmly in your heart. Question, how is the mind to be stilled? Answer, vichara alone will do. You see the body in the heart, you see the world in it, there is nothing separate from it, so all kinds of efforts are located there only. There are different routes to Turavanamalai, but Turavanamalai is the same by whatever route it is reached. 
Similarly, the approach to the self varies according to the personality. Yet the self is the same. Question. Why did you run away from home as a youth when you do not yourself tell people to renounce? Answer. Some power took me away. It won't do to give up work. It is only when a man has realized the self that the world ceases to exist for him. It does not mean that we ought to give up our work. Question. Why is it that the mind cannot be turned inward in spite of repeated attempts? Answer. It is done by Abiyaz practice and Varajya dispassion, and that succeeds only slowly. The mind having been so long used to go outwards, is not easily turned inwards. A cow accustomed to graze thievishly on others' estates is not easily confined to its shed. However, its keeper tempts it with luscious grass and fine fodder. It refuses the first time. Then it takes a bit, but its innate tendency to stray asserts itself and it slips away. On being repeatedly tempted by the owner, it accustoms itself to the stall. Finally, even if let loose, it would not stray. Similarly with the mind. If once it finds its happiness within, it will not dwell outward. Question. How do all thoughts cease when the mind is in the heart? Answer. By force of will with strong faith in the master's teaching to that effect. Thought life is centered round the brain, whither we may trace it and hence the ego. There it is fed by blood from the heart, hence thoughts ultimately issue from the heart. In self-inquiry meditation there is a neutral ground of sleep, coma, faint, etc., in which the mental operations do not exist while consciousness of self does not prevail. The mind is to be liberated from its restlessness first. It must be pacified and freed from distractions, trained to look inward habitually. The first step is hence indifference to external world, next a habit of introspection. Realization of the ephemeral nature of external phenomena leads to this indifference. Contempt is thus bred for wealth, fame, pleasure, etc. Then the eye thought must be inspected by inquiry and its source in the heart traced. Question. Is there thought in samadhi? Answer. There is only the feeling that I am in no other thoughts. Question. Is not I am a thought? Answer. The egoless I am is not thought, it is realization. A man who can remain still for a number of years in one place, mastering the outgoing impulses of nature, can become a true adept sage, for it is a Herculean feat and brings the rewards of nature's conquering. Question. Should I get away from wife and family? Answer. What harm do they do? First find out what you are. Question. Should not one give up home, wife, wealth, etc., all being samsara? Answer. First learn what samsara is. Is all that samsara? Are then people who live in their midst not to get realization? Question. Is not brahmacharya celibacy necessary? Answer. Brahmacharya means living in Brahman. It has no connection with celibacy as commonly understood. A real brahmachari finds bliss in Brahman the same as self. Question, but celibacy is a sign quanon for yoga. Answer, so it is. It is an aid to realization among so many other aids. Question, is not brahmacharya indispensable? Can a married man realize the self? Answer, certainly, married or unmarried, a man can realize the self because it is here and now. It is a matter of the fitness of the mind. Have there not been men living among wife and family and yet getting realization? Be still and know that I am God. As soon as you try to obey this counsel, there will start a regular war with your tendencies, with the ingrained natural habits. Question. Do you approve of continence? Answer. A brahmachari is he who dwells in Brahman. Then there is no question of desires anymore. Question. Is marriage a bar to spiritual progress? Answer. 
The householder's life is not a bar, but the householder must do his utmost to practice self-control. If a man has a strong desire for higher life, then the sex tendency will fall off. When the mind is destroyed, the other desires are destroyed also. Abedans in God is the only true asana. When we make tapas, our mind is fixed on what we utter. What is tapas for? It is for self-realization. One requires a form to contemplate, but it is not enough. For can anyone keep looking at an image always? So the image must be implemented by japa, repetition of a name of God. Japa helps fix the mind on the image when added to the gazing on it. The results of these efforts is the concentration of mind finally reaching the goal. Some are satisfied with the name of the image. Every form must have a name. That name denotes all the qualities of God. Constant japa puts off all other thoughts and fixes the mind. That is the tapas wanted. The question what tapas is was asked in order to know what purpose it served. It will take the form required for the purpose. Are not physical austerities also tapas? They are due to varagia, dispassion. I have seen a man with his arm lifted all of the time in his life. Question: Why should one afflict his body in such a way? Answer: You think it is affliction, whereas it is a vow for the other man to whom it is an achievement and a pleasure. Dhyana may be external or internal or both. Japa must be done until it becomes natural. It starts with effort and is continued until it proceeds of itself. When natural, it is realization. Japa may be done even while engaged in other work. Bhakti vichara japa, all of them finally resolve themselves into that one single reality. They are only different shapes of an effort to keep out the unreality. Unreality is an obsession at present. Reality is our true nature. We are wrongly persisting in the unreality, namely. Thought and worldly activities. Cessation of these will reveal the truth. Our attempts are directed towards keeping them out. Although it looks as if we are thinking of the reality, what we do really amounts to the removal of obstacles for the revelation of our true being. Meditation is thus a path to our true nature. Question: How can the rebellious mind be brought under control? Answer. Either seek its source so that it may disappear, or surrender that it may be struck down. Question: It is said that one remaining in Nirvikalpa Samadhi twenty-one days must necessarily give up the physical body. Answer: Samadhi means passing beyond, and non-identification of the body with the self is a foregone conclusion. There are said to be persons who have been immersed in Nirvikalpa Samadhi for a thousand years or more. One holding on to reality is samadhi. Two holding on to reality with effort is savikalpa samadhi. Three merging on to reality and remaining unaware of the world is nirvikalpa samadhi. Four merging in ignorance and remaining unaware of the world is sleep. Head bends but not in samadhi. Five remaining in the primal, pure, natural state without effort is sahaja nirvikalpa samadhi. Question: People practicing meditation, etc., are said to get new diseases. At any rate, I feel some pain. This is stated to be the tests of God. Is this true? Answer: There is no bag of an outside of you, and no test is therefore instituted. What you believe is a test, or as a new disease, as a result of spiritual practices, is really the strain that is now put upon your nerves, etc., by the five senses. The mind, which was hitherto operating through the nadis to sense external objects, and had thus maintained a link between itself and the organs of perception, etc., is now required to withdraw from the link, and this action of withdrawal may naturally cause strain. Like a sprain attended with pain, if you will continue your meditation, bestowing your soul thought on understanding yourself or self-realization, all these will go. 
There is no greater remedy than thy's continuous yoga or union with God or Atman. Question. Is solitude necessary for a jhani? Answer. One might be in the midst of the world and maintain serenity. Such a one is in solitude. Another may stay in lonely forests and be unable to control his mind. He can't be said to be in solitude. A man attached to desire cannot get solitude, wherever he may be. A detached man is always in solitude. Even one who is working with detachment is working in solitude, and his work does not affect him. When work is performed with attachment, it is a shackle. Solitude is not in forests only. It can be had in the midst of worldly occupations. Once Maharshi noticed Mr. G sitting in his rocking chair and remarked, What cause for anxiety in such luxuries? If another will take that seat, the owner would not relish it. Is rocking really so pleasant? It is simply a wasteful thought of pleasure. Seva made over all his own possessions to Vishnu and wandered in the forests and wilderness and cemeteries and lived on food begged by him. In his view, non-possession is higher in the scale of happiness than possession of things. The higher happiness is to be free from anxieties. Possessions create anxieties, such as their safeguarding, their utilization. Non-possession does not bring any anxieties in its train. Therefore Siva resigned everything to Vishnu and he himself went away happy. Divestment of possessions is the highest happiness. Bhagavan explained during my trance related in self-realization, I had a very clear experience. All of a sudden a light came from one side erasing the world vision in its course until it spread all round, then the vision of the world was completely gone. I felt the muscular organ of the heart had stopped work. I could understand that the body was like a corpse, that the circulation of blood had stopped and the body became blue and motionless. Vasudeva Sastri embraced me wept over my death, but I could not speak. All the time I was feeling that the heart center on the right was working as well as ever. This state continued twenty minutes. Then suddenly something shot out from the right to the left resembling a rocket bursting in the air. The blood circulation recommenced and normal condition was restored. The heart is thus the center of the body. It can be felt in the absence of the body, but it is said to be a center because we have been accustomed to think that we remain in the body. In real fact, the body and all else are in that center only. In this experience I was not, as stated in the book, unconscious but was all along aware. I could feel the action of the physical heart stop and equally the action of the heart center unimpaired. Question. The heart is said to be on the right, on the left, or in the center. With such differences of opinion, how are we to meditate on Hridaya? Answer. You know that you are. And it is a fact Diana is by you of you and in you. It must go on where you are. It cannot be outside of you. So you are the center of Diana and that is the heart. A location is however given to it only with reference to the body. Where are you? You are in the body and not out of it, yet not the whole body. Though you pervade the whole body, still you admit of a center where from all your thoughts start and wherein they subside. Even when the limbs are amputated, you are still there, and with defective senses, you are still there. So a center of consciousness must be admitted. That is called the heart. Heart is only another name for the self. The doubts arise only when you identify it with something tangible and physical. Heart is no conception, no object for meditation, but it is as the seat of meditation, the self and is alone. Question. Is concentration a sadhana spiritual practice? Answer. Concentration is not thinking on more than one thing. It is the putting off all other thoughts which obstruct the vision of our true nature. All our efforts are only directed to lifting the veil of ignorance. 
Now it appears difficult to quell the thoughts, whereas in the regenerate, refined state it will be found that it is more difficult to call in thoughts. Why should we then think of things when there is the self alone? Thoughts can function only if there are objects. How can thoughts arise at all? Habit makes us believe that it is difficult to cease thinking. If the error is found, one would not be fool enough to exert oneself unnecessarily by way of thinking. Question, but the mind slips away from our control. Answer, be it so. Do not think of it. When you recollect, bring it back and turn it inward. That is enough. No one succeeds without efforts. Mind control is not one's birthright. The successful few owe their success to their perseverance. Maharshi said to a bookworm, That which you seek is inside yourself. The books themselves are outside. Then why look in the wrong direction by studying them? Be that. Question, what union does yoga mean? Answer, you are the seeker. Is this something with which union is sought apart from you? You are already aware of self. Seek it out and it will expand to infinity. Be that. Question. Is there any drug to promote meditation? Answer. No, because afterwards, the taker of it would be unable to meditate without using it habitually. Question. How to meditate? Answer. All you need learn is to just close your eyes and turn inwards. Chapter 5. The Meaning of Philosophy. Do not tell this path to all. Only the few who manifest an anxiety to know the truth and an eagerness to find it should be told. With all others be silent and keep it secret. Question, why are there so many methods mentioned? For instance, Sri Ramakrishna says that bhakti is the best means for mukti. Answer, it is according to the standpoint of the aspirant. Krishna begins by saying in the Bhagavad Gita, Never was there a time when I did not exist or thou nor these kings of men. Never will there be a time hereafter when any of us shall cease to be. Because that which is unreal never exists. The unreal never is, the real never is not. All that ever was even now is and will ever be. Later on Krishna continued, I taught this truth to Vivasvat, he taught it to Manu, etc. Arjuna asked, How can it be? Your birth was later than theirs. Then Krishna answered, Many a birth have I passed through, O Arjuna, and so hast thou. I know them all, but thou knowest not thine. I tell you what happened in those past births. Look, that Krishna, who began by saying, There was not I, nor wert thou, nor these kings, says now that he had several births before. Krishna does not contradict himself, though it looks so. He conforms to the outlook of Arjuna and speaks to him from his level. There is a parallel passage in the Bible where Jesus says that he had taught the truth to Abraham and Abraham to Moses and so on. The teachings of the sages are suited to the time, place and other surroundings. When a man surrenders himself as a slave to the Divine Lord, he realizes at the end that all his actions are the actions of God. He loses his mindness. This is what is meant by doing the will of God. This is Siddhanta, the final view. When a man realizes that he has lost his Ahamkara, Ines, and that he is not different from his Farah, he is a Jani. This is Vedanta, but see. The goal is the same. There are two ways open to one, bhakti and jhana. A bhakta surrenders to God and rests secure in his protection. A jhani knows that there is nothing beside the self and so remains happy. One must adhere firmly to either of these courses. This path is the highest of all and suited only for advanced aspirants. Those who follow the other paths are not ripe for this until they become advanced on their own paths. Thus it is really by the grace, whether guru, self, etc., that they are brought to this highest path. Of course, they might have practiced the other paths in former existences and thus were born ripe for this one. 
Others try the other ways and after progressing finally turn to self-inquiry. But the last laps of all paths are the same. Surrender of the ego. This is the only direct method. The other methods will also ultimately lead everyone to this method of the investigation of the self. The other methods are meant for those who cannot take to the investigation of the self. Question, what kind of teaching is suitable to young men? Will they understand the naked truth? Answer, their attention might be drawn to the truth from time to time in an appropriate manner. Question, what does Maharshi say about Hatha Yoga? or tantric practices? Answer, Maharshi does not criticize any of the extant methods. All are good for the purification of the mind, because the purified mind alone is capable of grasping this method and sticking to its practice. Question, which is the best of the different yogas? Answer, see verse 10 of the Upaitsa Sarum. The other yogas are inferior paths. This is the superior and direct path. All other paths are for those who are incapable of self-inquiry. They also lead you ultimately to vichara. Question, why is atmavichara necessary? Answer, if you do not make atmavichara, then lakavichara, inquiry into the world creeps in. That which is not seen is sought but not that which is obvious. When once you have found what you seek for, inquiry also ceases and you rest in it. Question, what meditation will help me? Answer, no meditation on an object is helpful for this reason. You must learn to realize the subject and object as one, and in the meditating on an object, whether concrete or abstract, you are destroying that sense of oneness and creating duality. Meditate only on the self. Try to realize that the body is not you, the emotions are not you, the intellect is not you. When all these are stilled, you will find, something else is there, hold it that it will reveal itself. Question, but when I have stilled all I almost fall asleep. Answer, that does not matter. Put yourself into the condition as deep as sleep and then watch, be asleep consciously. Then there is only the one consciousness. Question, is yoga a good method of approach? Answer, in the end there is only one approach to the goal, and that is through the realization of the self, so why waste time on other roads, which at the best, will only lead on to the final path? Better to be on the final path itself all the time than on an auxiliary road. Meditate on what the self is, that is all, there is nothing else but to find the answer to that. See the self in all, act spontaneously, so to speak, and let it be present and it always will be available. Do not look to results, do what is right and leave it. Chapter 6 The Intellect Doubt or uncertainty is for the mind or intellect, and has no place in that perfection of realization. Pride of learning and desire for appreciation are condemned, not the learning itself. Education and learning lead to the search for truth, and humility is good. Question, then, is all our intellectual progress worth nothing? Answer, whose intellect is progressing? Find out. Question, what are the hindrances to the realization of reality? Answer, memory chiefly, habits of thought and accumulated tendencies. Question, how to get rid of these hindrances? Answer, find out the self through meditation in this manner. Trace every thought back to its origin which is the mind. Never allow thought to go on, if it does, it will be unending. Take it back to its source which is mind, and they thoughts and mind will die of inaction, for the mind only exists by thought, take away thought and there is no mind. As each doubt and depression arises ask yourself, who is it that doubts? Who is it that is depressed? Tear everything away until there is nothing but the source left. Live only in the present. Question, how can I progress? Answer, why go on pruning the ego? 
that is just what it wants, to be this center of attraction. Chapter 7 The Characteristics of Philosophic Discipline Question, why is it sometimes I find concentration on the self so easy and at other times hopelessly difficult? Answer, because of asanas. But really it is easy since we are the self. All we have to do is to remember that. We keep on forgetting it and thus think we are this body or this ego. If the will and desire to remember self are strong enough they will eventually overcome vasanas. There must be a great battle going on inwardly all the time until self is realized. This battle is symbolically spoken of in scriptural writings as the fight between God and Satan. In our Sruti Vedic revelation, it is a Mahabharata war where the Asuras represent our bad thoughts and the Devas are elevating ones. Question, how can one quicken this coming of realization? Answer, as one strives to know the true I, the attachment to objects, the bad and degrading thoughts gradually drop off. The more one does not forget the self, the more do elevating qualities become ours. Realization will come eventually. Question, why does an Upanishad say, he whom the Atman chooses, to him alone does it reveal itself, not to others? Does not this seem arbitrary? Answer, no. It is correct. It chooses those only who devote themselves to it, who become its devotees. It draws such devotees inwards to itself. One must turn inward to find the Atman. He who thinks of it, it will draw to itself. All such thoughts as attainment is hard or self-realization is far from me or I have got many difficulties to overcome to know the reality, should be given up, as they are obstacles, they are created by this false self-ego. They are untrue. Do not doubt that you are the reality, live in that understanding. Never question it by referring a realization of it to some future time. It is because people are victimized and hypnotized by such false thoughts that the Gita says that few out of millions realize the self. The order of asramas, four stages of life, was established as a general principle, in other words to regulate the gradual development of the ordinary run of humanity, but in the case of one highly mature and fully ripe for Atmavichara, there is no graduated development. In this case Janavachara, in other words, the self-inquiry and the blooming of jhana are immediate and quick. Question, am I worthy to be a devotee? Answer, everyone can be a devotee. Spiritual food is common to all and never denied to anyone. To a despondent devotee, the quest must be made, who is despondent? It is the phantom of the ego which falls a prey to such thoughts. In sleep the person is not afflicted. Sleep state is the normal one. Quest and find out. Does one not find some kind of peace in meditation? That is the sign of progress that peace will be deeper and more prolonged with continued practice. It will also lead to the goal. Inasmuch as you say that you are ignorant, you are wise and it makes your way easier for the removal of ignorance. Is he a mad man who says that he is mad? Control of desire and meditation are interdependent. They must go on side by side. Abhyas practice and Varajya dispassion bring about the result. Varajya dispassion is to check the mind being projected out. Abhyas practice is to keep it turned inward. There is the struggle between control and meditation. It is going on constantly within. Meditation will in due course be successful. If you seek God with your whole heart, then you may be assured that grace of God is also seeking you. Question, when we fall from the path what is to be done? Answer, it will come all right in the end. There is the steady determination that gets you on your feet again after a downfall or break. Gradually the obstacles get weaker and your current stronger. Everything comes right in the end. Steady determination is the thing required. 
question, the tendencies distract me. Can they be cast off? Answer, yes. Others have done so. Therefore believe it. They did so because they believe they could. It can be done by concentration on that which is free from predispositions and yet is their core. If the longing is there, realization will be forced even if you do not want it. Question. Is it necessary to develop qualities? Answer. It is only for beginners that they are told to develop different qualities. For the advanced, it is enough to look into their nature. This is the direct method. In the other paths there is the ego involved. This alone answers the question of what the ego is. Yoga Vasistha says that the quest to am I is the axe which laid to the roots of the ego destroys it. Question, I fear that it is no easy thing to reach that ultimate goal. Answer, why stultify yourself by fear or concern for the success or failure of your course? Push on. Give yourself up to deep meditation. Throw away all other considerations of life. Calculative life will not be crowned with spiritual success. Yes, complete surrender is impossible in the beginning. Partial surrender is certainly possible for all, in course of time that will lead to complete surrender. Well, if partial surrender be impossible, what can be done? There is then no peace of mind. You are helpless to bring it about. It can be done only by surrender. In fact, there may not be found any single individual in the world possessing all the qualities and perfection necessary for Mamakshu, mature soul, as mentioned in the Yoga Sutras, etc. Still, pursuit of Atmajana should not be abandoned. Everyone is the self by Apariksha, immediate or direct knowledge, although he is not aware but identifies the self with the body and feels miserable. Whenever you get that thought of difficulty, Dispose of it altogether by trying to find out whence it arises. Question. Can I realize the self? It looks so difficult. Answer. You are already the self. Therefore realization is for everyone. Realization knows no difference in the aspirants. This very doubt if I can realize or the feeling I have not realized are the obstacles. Be free from these also. Question, nevertheless unless I have the experience, how can I be free from these conflicting thoughts? Answer, these are also in the mind. They are there because you have identified yourself with the body. If this false identity drops away, ignorance will vanish and truth be revealed. Question, do you accept the parable of Jesus where the woman seeks for the lost coin till it is found? Answer, why not? In that parable we know God seeks after souls. His grace is always available for human soul. Only man must accept it. You know the sun shines. If you shut your eyes and say there is no sun, that is your fault, not the sun's. If grace of God is not realized by you, it does not mean that God is unwilling but that you have not surrendered yourself completely to him. God is grace. According to your Pakivam rightness, you will realize grace. Chapter 8 The Philosophy of Sensation and Perception the Maharshi said to me, What is it that sees? The physical eyes? No. It is the mind. When the mind looks through the eyes, then it sees. When it withdraws, it sees nothing. Question. Has the body any value to self? Answer, yes, it is through the body's help that self is realized. Question, what about diet? Answer, food affects the mind, makes it more savic, alive, vibrant, rhythmic for the practice of any kind of yoga. Vegetarianism is absolutely necessary. Question, could one receive spiritual illumination whilst eating flesh foods? Answer, yes, but abandon them gradually and accustom yourself to sapphic foods. 
However, once you have attained illumination, it will make less difference what you eat, as on a great fire it is immaterial what fuel is added. Chapter 9 The Illusions of Space Time An externality on being presented with some new calendars, the Maharshi said. You bring a new calendar to help me remember the days when I often have serious doubts as to what year it is. Time is all one to me. I said to the Maharshi that a certain appointment I had was a waste of time. He smiled. There is no time. How can you waste it? Question. Does distance have any effect on Guru's grace? Answer. Time and space are within us. Time is only an idea. There is only the reality. Whatever you think of it, it looks like that. If you call it time, it is time. If you call it existence, it is existence, and some after calling it time divided into days, months, and years. The reality cannot be new. It must exist even now, and it does exist. There is in that state no present, nor past, nor future. It is beyond time. It is ever there. Sri Krishna says, I am time. Can time have a shape? Even the universal vision shown by Krishna to Arjuna on the physical plane is absurd. The seer is also in this scene. Even a mesmerist can make one see strange scenes. You call this a trick but the other one divine. Why this difference? Anything seen cannot be real. That is the truth. Question, I am going to stay in the east three or four years this time. Answer, don't think of the morrow was Jesus saying. Chapter 10, The Doctrine of Mentalism The universe is only an idea. It is the heart that takes all these forms. That is called the witness wherein no ego or sense of personality remains. Apar a great Tamil saint was old and decrepit, yet he began to travel to Mount Kailas. Another old man appeared on the way and tried to dissuade him from the attempt saying that it was difficult to reach there. Apar was obstinate. The stranger then asked him to take a dip in a tank close by. Apar did so and found Kailas then and there. Where did this happen? In Turuvayar, a place nine miles from Tanjore. If Turuvayar be truly Kailas, it must appear so to others also, but Apar alone found it so. Similarly, other places of pilgrimage in the south are said to be abodes of Seva. Devotees found them so. It is true from their standpoints. Everything is within. There is nothing without. The spirit is wrongly identifying itself with the gross body. Body has been projected by the mind. The mind itself has originated from the spirit. If the wrong identification ceases, there will be peace and permanent unbroken bliss. Life is existence which is yourself. That is life eternal. Otherwise, can you imagine a time when you are not? That life is not conditioned by the body, and you wrongly identify your existence with that of the body. You are life unconditioned. These bodies attach themselves to you as mental projections, and you are afflicted by I am the body idea. If this idea ceases, you are yourself. You exist in sleep even without the body. Then the ego arises, and then the mind which projects the body exists. You say that it was born and that it will die and thus transfer it to the self saying that you are born and that you will die. In fact you exist without the body in sleep as you exist now along with the body also. The self can exist apart from the body. The I am the body thought is ignorance. That the body is not apart from the self is therefore knowledge. The body is a mental projection. The body thought is a distraction from the self. For whom is the body or birth? It is not for the self the spirit. It is for the non-self which imagines itself separate. Just as a miser keeps his treasures always with himself and never parts with them, so the self safeguards the vasanas and that which is closest to itself, in other words within the heart. 
the heart radiates vitality to the brain and thus causes its function. The vasanas are enclosed in the heart in their subtlest form and later projected on the brain, which reflects them with high magnification. This is how the world is made to go on and this is why the world is nothing more than a cinema show. The world is not external. Since impressions cannot have an outer origin, because the world can be cognized only by consciousness. The world does not say it exists, it is you who say it exists, it is your impression. Yet this impression is not unbroken. In sleep the world is not cognized, it exists not for a sleeping man. Therefore the world is the result of the ego. Find out the ego. Its source is the final goal. The world is a result of your mind. Know your mind. The world is only a phenomenon appearing on that pure consciousness. Pure consciousness is itself unaffected. The universe is like a painting on a screen. That which rises and sinks is made up of what it rises from. The finality of the universe is the self. Question, does the realized sage see the world? Answer, yes, but his outlook differs. Cinema pictures move, but go and try to hold them. What do you hold? Only the screen. Let the pictures disappear. What remains over? The screen again. So also here. Even when world appears, the Johnny sees it only as a manifestation of the self. There is only one mind functioning through the five senses. There is a power working through the senses. The work of the senses begins and ends. There must be a substratum on which their activities depend, a single substratum. The gross body is only the concrete form of the subtle stuff, the mind. Question, I may not be able to return here and request Bhagavan's grace. Answer, where are you going? You are not going anywhere. Even supposing you are the body, has your body come from Lucknow to Turuvanamalai? You had simply sat in the car or one conveyance or another, and it had moved and finally you say that you have come here. The fact is that you are not the body. The self does not move but the world moves in it. You are only what you are. There is no change in you. So even after what looks like departure from here, you are here and there and everywhere. The scenes alone change. All scriptures are only for the purpose of investigating if there are two consciousnesses. Everyone's experience proves the existence of only one consciousness. There is only one consciousness, but we speak of several kinds of consciousness as body consciousness, self-consciousness, etc. Without consciousness, time and space do not exist. They appear in consciousness. It is like a screen on which these are cast as pictures and move as in a cinema show. The absolute consciousness is our real nature. Question, from where do these objects arise? Answer, just from where you rise. The subject comprehends the object also. That one aspect is an all-comprehensive aspect. See yourself first, and then see the objects. What is not in you cannot appear outside. The cinema illustration, you are the screen, the self has created the ego, the ego has its thoughts which are displayed to the world like cinema pictures. Those thoughts are the world, but in reality there is nothing but self. These are all projections of the ego. What is real can never become unreal and vice versa. The world becomes unreal in sleep, hence it never did possess reality. But being, the I, always exists, hence it is always real. Kamsvara Sarma's query to Sri Ramana Maharshi. You endorse the Maya teaching, but I can't reconcile my feeling of this chair's reality with your assertion of its unreality. Maharshi answered, The root of your difficulty lies in the confused commingling of two separate ideas into one, the I and the body. When you are aware of the chair, it is the thought subsequent to the primal one I am the body. 
The latter is the substratum of all your thoughts of world experience. It arises first, then only can they come. Hence when it fails to arise, as in deep sleep, the world experience also fails to enter your consciousness. Now of these two ideas, the I thought is the enduring one whereas the body thought is a transient one. This is shown by dreams, where you still have the sense of I but not awareness of physical body. Thus all your bodily experiences and the world experiences which are linked up with them are nothing else than what enters your mind. This is what I mean when I say that the mind is nothing but thoughts. The I is the only real being because it is the only durable one. Find it after stopping the thoughts. Chapter 11 The Illusion of World Experience Question are the stones etc. destined to be as they are always? Answer, who sees stones? They are perceived by your mind. So they are in your mind. Whose mind is it? The questioner must find himself. If the self is found, this question will not arise. The self is more intimate than objects. Find the subject and the objects will take care of themselves. The objects are seen by different persons, according to their outlook and theories are evolved, but who is the seer, the recognizer of these theories? It is you. Find yourself. Then there is an end of these vagaries of the mind. When news of the death of King George V was brought to the ashram, Chadwick's eyes filled with tears, and the other disciples commiserated half-weepingly with him in sympathy. Maharishi at last broke in after having remained silent throughout. You unwise persons! He exclaimed. You may even die to find out your real self, and then may live without death. Why then do you care for the death of a third person? The self does not perish, only the body anyway. Be rid of your materialistic outlooks. When Paul Brunton Pet Rabbit was killed by a wild cat, the Maharshi said in response to someone's expression of regret, the rabbit's spirit is still near Brunton. It has not gone away. Do not worry about it any more. It is dead, so be quiet. We read a newspaper and all the articles therein, but do not care to know anything about the paper itself. We take the chaff but not the substance. The substratum on which all this is printed is the paper, and if we know the substratum, all else will be known. The one only is the sat, the existence, it is the paper, whereas the world, the things that we see and we ourselves are the printed words. There is an end for what you observe, that which is created has a destruction or end. That which is not created has no end. That which exists cannot be observed. It is unobservable. We must find out what it is that appears. The destruction of that which appears is the end. That which exists exists forever. That which appears is lost when we realize it has no independent existence. What is it that had birth? Whom do you call a man? If instead of seeking explanations for birth, death and after death, if the question is raised as to who and how you are now, these questions will not arise. You are the same while deeply asleep in dream and in waking state. Is the I thought jiva or the body jiva? Is this thought our nature? It is the body that feels pain. There is no pain in the self. This external universe is a cinema show to the realized man. It is free and the performance goes on day and night. He lives and works in it knowing that its objects and bodies persons are illusionary appearances, just as an ordinary man knows the scenes and characters on the cinema, screen at a theater are illusions, and do not exist in real life. But the ordinary man takes the external objects of daily life as real, whereas the realized one sees them only as illusionary cinema pictures. The universe does not exist apart from self. All evolution, all external objects are spun out from the self and disappear into it. Where does the world disappear when we enter in deep sleep? 
then we exist but the world no longer exists. Self is hence the substratum which gives reality to the universe. If our self did not exist, there would be no universe for us. The reality is in the self therefore, not in the universe. Realization of this comes to the realized man. This self is the screen, the universe and its events are the cinema pictures shown thereon. The screen does not change, but the pictures are transient and are changing. The sage experiences that he is the body as does the ignorant man but whereas the latter believes that the self is confined to body, the wise man believes that the body cannot remain apart from the self. The self is infinite for him and includes the body also. Question. What are the first steps to spiritual practice? Answer. In the beginning one has to be told that he is not the body because he thinks that he is the body only whereas he is the body in all else. The body is only a part. Let him know it firmly. He must first discern chit consciousness from jada inert and be the chit consciousness only. He must discern the sentient from the insentient. Later let him realize that jada is none else than chit. This is discrimination. The initial viveka discernment must persist to the end. Its fructification is moksha liberation. Question, do heavenly worlds really exist? Answer, so long as you consider this world real, those also are real. Why should they not exist? Question, but are those worlds mere ideas? Answer, everything is really an idea to you. Nothing appears to you except through the mind and as its idea. Question, then where are these worlds? Answer, they are in you. Humans can be reborn as animals, dependent on the last train of thought or mood prior to death. This again is produced by predominant thoughts during life. Question. There is a religion called Christian Science which has a similar doctrine. Is it correct? Answer. Yes, but don't think of the results. Question. What of toothache? Answer. The pain is in the mind. What happens to the toothache during sleep? Do you feel the pain then? No. Well, in the self you are in happiness always. Question. The Christian science healings are on the same principle. Answer, yes, and also similar results are obtained by willpower. Will and the self are the same. Think of the self despite the mosquitoes or toothache. It needs strength but one must be a hero to gain realization. Question, what is death? Answer, it is in the mind that birth and death pleasure and pain, in short, the world and ego exist. If the mind is destroyed, all these are destroyed too. Note that it should be annihilated and not made quiescent. For the mind is quiescent in sleep. It does not know anything. Still, on waking up, you are as you were before. There is no end of grief. But if the mind be destroyed, the grief will have no background and will disappear along with the mind. Question. Is there rebirth of man as a lower animal? Answer. Yes, it is possible as illustrated by the Jada Bharatha anecdote. This is a reference to the story of a saint who became so attached to a deer that he was reborn as one. Question. Is the jiva capable of spiritual progress in the animal body? Answer, not unlikely. It is exceedingly rare though. Question, what is death? Answer, death is intervening sleep between two successive births while sleep intervenes between two waking states and both are transient. According to the Sanskrit saying, a wife is half the body of the husband no doubt it is a very sad thing for the husband if his wife dies. If one begins to think in terms of his atma, there is no sorrow at all. According to the scriptures, a wife is dear because she pleases her husband by acting up to his wishes. And if all this is for the pleasure of the atman, where is the sorrow? 
In spite of this, even persons who have got a glimpse of the real knowledge lose their mental equipoise when such calamities occur. During sleep one is happy. The self was happy in sleep and did not see the wife, but now in the waking state, the same self which was happy in sleep enjoys happiness or misery owing to the presence of worldly things. Why should not the happiness enjoyed in sleep by the self be enjoyed in the waking state also? The false knowledge of the identity of body with Atman is the obstruction for enjoying Ananda bliss. That which existed is always present, and that which never existed cannot exist. What is born? What is it that dies? Waking is birth and sleeping is death. Did your wife accompany you whenever you attended to your duties and during your sleep? She was staying separately somewhere, but you were then thinking that she was living. Now after her death you think that she does not exist. Therefore the difference about your wife is in the kind of thoughts that constitutes your sorrow that she does not exist. The whole thing is a creation of your mind. It is that which is known as sorrow owing to the thought of non-existence of the wife. The whole is mental imagination. His own self which is by nature full of happiness also creates sorrow. Why should there be grief for the sake of those who are dead since they have been freed from bondage? The self creates grief by entering into the thought about the dead person. Why should there be any concern if a person is dead or exists? You must destroy your personal ego. There is no sorrow at all if one's ego is dead. Leaving off the feeling of I while the body lasts is what is called the annihilation of the ego. If the ego is not annihilated, the person will certainly feel sorry for death. One cries for persons who are dead, but if the I had been annihilated before they died, then there is no necessity for his crying for them. Our experience of happiness is only during profound sleep when we have ceased to think of our bodies. Even a wise man, a jhani, speaks of disembodied liberation. Therefore a wise man looks for when he shall cast off his body. Just as a cook who carries a load on his head feels relief soon after he reaches his destination and places it on the ground from off his head, so a jhani abides his time to cast off this load of his embodiment in flesh and blood. Therefore the death of the wife who is termed half the body of the husband should relieve the husband of half his load and therefore should make him feel happy. But it is not so considered, since we perceive these things through our physical senses. Even jhanis, wise men though they be, are perfectly aware of the need of being disembodied for final liberation, yet talk of liberation in the body. Question, what is the state just before death? Answer, when a person gasps for breath, it indicates that the person is unconscious of this body, while gasping the person is in something like a dream and not aware of present environment. Question, does the new body involved in that state represent the next reincarnation of the person? Answer, Yes, in this case, but there is also in other cases a period between births. Some are born immediately after, others only after the lapse of some time. A few are not reborn on this earth, but get salvation from the higher regions and a very few get absorbed here and now. To a Buddhist, the idea of diversity comes with the body consciousness which arose at some moment. It has an origin and an end. What originates must be something. What is that something? It is I consciousness. On finding its source you realize absolute consciousness. Can the world exist without one to cognize it? Which is prior, the being consciousness or the rising consciousness? The former is always there and eternal. The latter rises and disappears. It is transient. Question, what is illusion? Answer, find out to whom is the illusion and it will vanish. It is foolish to talk about it, for it is outside us and unknown whereas the seeker is inside and to be known. Find out the immediate and intimate instead of what is distant and unknown. 
Question. Brahman is real, world is illusion is same Kara stock phrase. Others say the world is real. Which is true? Answer. Both. They refer to different stages of development. The aspirant starts with the definition that the real exists always, then he eliminates the world as unreal because it is changing, and hence cannot be real. Ultimately he reaches the self and there finds unity. Then that which was originally rejected as being unreal is found to be part of the unity. Being absorbed in the reality, the world is also real. There is only existence and realization and nothing but that. Vedantin Samaya's manifestation is the display of cosmos on pure consciousness like images in a mirror. The images cannot remain in the absence of a mirror. So also the world cannot have an independent existence. Sri Sankara says that the absolute is attributeless. What is the difference? Both agree that the display is unreal. The unreality of world is implied by Samkhya whereas it is explicit in Vedanta. There is no difference between matter and spirit. Modern science admits that all matter is energy. Energy is Sakti. Therefore all are resolved into Siva and Sakti, in other words self and mind. The bodies are mere appearances. There is no reality in them as such. Question, why does Maya become active? Answer, how can this question arise? You are yourself within its fold. Are you standing apart from that universal activity in order to ask this question? The same power is raising this doubt in order that all doubts may finally cease. Maya is only as far as Sakti or the activity of reality. Question, what is existence? Answer, it is subject to birth and decay in order to remind us that it is not our true state. Chapter 12, The Illusion of Ego Experience Question, how to control the mind? Answer, mind is intangible. In fact, it does not exist. The surest way of control is to seek it. Then, its activities cease. Seek the mind. On being sought, it will disappear. The mind is only a bundle of thoughts. The thoughts arise because there is the thinker. The thinker is the ego. The ego, if sought, will vanish automatically. The ego and the mind are the same. The ego is the root thought from which all other thoughts arise. Dive within. You are now aware that the mind rises from within. So sink within and seek. You need not eliminate the wrong eye. How can I eliminate itself? All that you need do is to find out its origin and abide there. Your efforts can extend only thus far. Then the beyond will take care of itself. You are helpless there. No effort can reach it. The individual cannot exist without the self, but the self can exist without the individual. Our analyses are ended, that is, so far as the intellect goes, but they are not enough. Eliminating the not-I is not enough. The process is only intellectual. The truth cannot be directly pointed out. Hence the process. Now begins the real inner quest. The I-thought is the root now to be sought at its source. Find out who it is and abide there. Question. Is the analytic process merely intellectual or does it exhibit feeling predominantly? Answer, the latter. Personal I is a reflection of the real self in the mind. Ask yourself the question, who am I? The body and its functions are not I. Inquire further. The senses and their functions are not I. Going deeper, the mind and its functions are not I. The next step is the question whence do these thoughts arise? Thoughts are spontaneous, superficial, or analytical. Who is aware of them? Their existence and operations become evident to the individual. Analysis leads to the conclusion that individuality is operative as the awareness of existence of the thoughts. 
This is ego. Inquire further, who is this I and whence? Do sleep analysis. I am under lies the three states, sleep, waking, and dream. After discarding all not self, we find the residue, the self absolute. Both the world and ego are objective and must be eliminated in the analysis. Eliminating the unreal, the real survives. To accomplish this, eliminate the mind, which is the creator of the dualistic idea and of ego. Mind is one form of life manifestation. Question. Is this method quicker than developing qualities thought to be necessary for salvation? Answer. All bad qualities are tied round the ego. When the ego is gone, realization is self-evident. There are neither good nor bad qualities in the self. Self is free from all qualities. Qualities pertain to the mind only. The inquiry should be where the I is. After the rise of the I thought, there is false identification of the I with the body, the senses, mind, etc. Self is wrongly associated with them. The true self is lost sight of. In order to sift the pure I from the contaminated I, this discarding of the sheaths mentioned in the Sastra's scriptures is mentioned. But it means not exactly discarding of the non-self, but the finding of the real self. The real self is the infinite I, I in perfection. It is eternal. It has no origin and no end. The other I is born and dies. It is impermanent. See to whom the changing thoughts occur. They will be found to arise after the I thought. Hold the I thought, they subside. Trace the source of the I thought. The self alone remains. The root of thoughts is ego. To say I am not the body but I am the self is still not correct. There is no thought of I in true being. Let us discover if all thoughts can be traced to someone thought as their base of operations. Do you not see that the thought or idea I, the idea of personality, is such a root thought? The personality and Takarana is a medium. It is what we call Sukshma Sarira subtle body which acts as a medium between the body and the self. It can turn to the body or to the self merging itself in either. The I thought is not pure, it is contaminated with association with the body and senses. See to whom the trouble is. It is the I thought. Hold it then the other thoughts will cease. Question. Yes, but how to do it, that is the whole trouble. Answer, think I, 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 and hold to that one thought to the exclusion of all others. Question, what is self-surrender? Answer, it is the same as self-control. Control is effected by the removal of samskaras. The ego submits only when it recognizes the higher power. Such recognition is surrender. Submission to it is self-control. Otherwise the ego remains stuck up like the image carved on a tower making it appear by its strained look that it is supporting the tower on its shoulders. The ego cannot exist without the higher power but thinks that it acts of its own accord. A passenger in a railway train keeps his load on the head by his own folly. Let him drop it down he will find the load reaching his destination all the same. Similarly let us not pose as the doers, but resign ourselves to the guiding power. Desire of sleep or fear of death exists when the mind is active and not in the respective states themselves. The mind knows that the body entity persists and reappears after sleep. Therefore sleep is not attended with fear but with the pleasure of a non-body. No existence is sought. On the other hand, the mind is not sure of reappearance after so-called death and therefore dreads it. The ego has its source from the self and is not separate from it. Hence, the ego must only be retraced in order that it might merge in its source. The core of the ego is called the heart. Question, what is death? Is it not the fall of body? Answer, do you not desire it in sleep? 
What goes wrong then? Question, but I know I shall wake up. Answer, yes, a thought again. There is the preceding thought, I shall wake up. Thoughts rule the life. Freedom from thoughts is one's true nature, bliss. Death is a thought and nothing else. He who thinks raises troubles. Let the thinker say what happens to him in death. The real I is silent. One should not think I am this, I am not that. To say this or that is wrong. They are also limitations. I am alone is true. Silence is I. Question. If a person whom we love dies, grief results. Shall we avoid such grief by either loving all alike or by not loving at all? Answer. If one dies, there is grief for the other who lives. The way to get rid of grief is not to live. Kill the one who grieves. Who will then remain to suffer? The ego must die. That is the only way. The two alternatives amount to the same state. When all is the self, who is there to be loved or hated? There is a class of people who want to know all about their future and past births. They ignore the present. The load from the past is the present misery. Why recall the past? It is a waste of time. The self is the electricity dynamo. The mind is the contact switchboard while the body is the lamp. When the karma hour comes to give death, the mind switches off the current and withdraws the light life from the body. Both mind and vitality are manifestations of the supreme life force, the self. Question. Can the yogis show the dead to us? Answer. They may but do not ask me to show them for I cannot. Did we know our relatives before their births that we should know them after their deaths? Question. What happens to a man after death? Answer. Engage yourself in the living present. The future will take care of itself. Do not worry about the future. The state before creation and the process of creation are dealt with in the scriptures in order that you may know the present. Because you say you are born, therefore they say it. What is birth? Is it of the I thought or of the body? Is I separate from the body or identical? How did this I thought arise? Is the I thought your nature? Or is anything else your nature? The Johnny's I includes but does not identify himself with the body. For there cannot be anything apart from I for him. If the body falls, there is no loss for the I. I remains the same. If the body feels dead, let it raise the question. Being inert, it cannot. I never dies and does not ask. Who then dies? Who asks? Question, do you see the dead? Answer, yes in dreams. Question, where from does the ego rise? Answer, soul mind, ego are mere words. There are no true entities of the kind. Consciousness is the only truth. Forgetfulness of your real nature is the real death. Remembrance of it is the true birth. It puts an end to successive births. Yours is then eternal life. How does the desire for eternal life arise? Because the present state is unbearable. Why? Because it is not your true nature. Had it been your real nature, there would be no desire to agitate you. How does the present state differ from your real nature? Your spirit in truth. Man considers himself limited. There arises the trouble. The idea is wrong. In sleep there was no world, no ego and no trouble. Something wakes up from that happy state and says I. To that ego the world appears. It is the rise of the ego that is the cause of the trouble. Let him trace the ego to its source, and he will reach that undifferentiated happy source, a state which is sleepless sleep. The self is ever there. Wisdom only appears to dawn, though it is natural. Question. Are ego and the self the same? Answer. Self can be without the ego, but the ego cannot be without the self. 
Egos are like bubbles in the ocean. Impurities and worldly attachments affect only the ego, the self remains pure and unaffected. All these are only mental concepts. You are now identifying yourself with a wrong eye, which is the I thought. This I thought rises and sinks, whereas the true significance of I cannot do so. There cannot be a break in your being. The father of your personal I is the real I God. Try to find out the source of the individual I and then you will reach the other I. When the individual goes, the desires also go. Question, once I was very self-reliant. I now fear an old age. People laugh at me. Answer, even when you said you were self-reliant it was not so, you were ego-reliant. In place of that if you let ego go, you will get real self-reliance. Your pride was merely pride of ego. So long as you identify yourself with the ego, then you will recognize others as individuals too, then there is room for pride. Let that drop and you drop others' ego too, and so there is no more room for pride. So long as there is the sense of separation, there will be afflicting thoughts. If the original source is regained and the sense of separation is ended, there is peace. Consider what happens when a stone is thrown up. It leaves its source, is propelled up, tries to come down, and is always in motion until it regains its source where it is at rest. So also the waters of the ocean evaporate, form clouds which are moved by winds, condense into water, and fall as rain, and the waters roll down the hill tops and streams and rivers until they reach their original source, the ocean, reaching which they are at peace. Thus you see where there is a sense of separateness from the source, there is agitation and movement until the sense of separateness is lost. So it is with yourself. Now that you identify yourself with the body, you think that you are separate. You must regain your source before this false identity ceases and you are happy. Gold is not an ornament but the ornament is nothing but gold. Whatever shapes the ornament may assume and however different the shapes of the ornaments are, there is only one reality, in other words gold. So also with the bodies and the self. The reality is the self. To identify oneself with the body, and yet to seek happiness, is like attempting to ford a lake on the back of an alligator. The body identity is due to extroversion and the wandering of the mind. To continue in that state will only keep one in an endless tangle, and there will be no peace. Seek your source, merge in the self and remain all one. Rebirth really means discontent with the present state and desire to be born where there will be no discontent. Birth being of the body cannot affect the self. The self remains ever, even after the body perishes. The discontent is due to the wrong identity of the eternal self with the perishable body. The body is a necessary adjunct of the ego. If the ego is killed, the eternal self is revealed in all its glory. The body is the cross, Jesus, the Son of Man, is the ego or I am the body idea. When he is crucified he is resurrected, a glorious self, Jesus, the Son of God. Give up this life if thou wouldst live. A Johnny crushes the ego at its source. It rises up again and again, for him too as for the ignorant, impelled by nature in other words prerabda. Both in the ignorant and the Johnny, ego sprouts up but with this difference. The former's ego when it rises up is quite ignorant of its source or is not aware of it in deep sleep in the dream and wakeful states, whereas a Johnny, when his ego rises up, enjoys his transcendental experience with this ego, keeping his laxia vision, always on its source. His ego is not dangerous, it is only the ash skeleton of a burnt rope, although it possesses a form it is ineffective. By constantly keeping our laxia vision, on our source our ego is dissolved. Question, how is realization made possible? Answer, 
there is the absolute self from which a spark proceeds as from fire. The spark is called ego. In the case of the ignorant, it identifies itself with some object simultaneously with its rise. It cannot remain independent of such association. This association is ignorance whose destruction is the object of our efforts. If ego's objectifying tendency is killed it remains pure and also merges in its source. We can separate ourselves from that which is external, but not from that which is one with us. Hence ego is not one with body. This must be realized in the waking state. The quest who am I is the axe to cut off the ego. The intellect always seeks to have external knowledge, leaving knowledge of its own origin. The mind is only identity of the self with the body. It is a false ego that is created. It creates false phenomena in its turn and appears to move in them. If the false identity vanishes, the reality becomes apparent. This does not mean that reality is not now. It is always there and eternally the same. The mind rises after the rise of I thought or the ego. Question how to get rid of egoism. Answer, if you see what the ego really is that is enough to get rid of it. It is the ego itself which makes efforts to get rid of itself so how can it die? If ego is to go, then something else must slay it. Will it ever consent to commit suicide? So first realize what is the true nature of the ego and it will go of its own accord. Examine the nature of the ego, that is the process of realization. If one sees what one's real nature is, then one will get rid of ego. Until then our efforts are just like chasing one's own shadow. The more one advances the more distant is the shadow. If we leave our own self, then the ego will manifest itself. If we seek our true nature, then ego dies. If we are in our own reality, then we need not trouble about the ego. Seek your source. Find out whence the thought I springs. What object can we be sure of and no more certainly than ourself? This is direct experience and cannot further be described. If the present I goes, yet the mind is known for what it is, a myth. What remains over is the pure self. In deep sleep the self exists without perception of body and world, then happiness reigns. Question, you say that we shall find the divine center inside us. If each individual has a center, are there then millions of divine centers? Answer, there is only one center to which there is no circumference. Dive deep within and find it. Meditating on him or on the seer, the self, there is a mental vibration I to which all are reduced. Tracing the source of I, the primal I, I alone remains over, and it is inexpressible. Question, is there not an unchanging self and a changing self? Answer, the changefulness is mere thought. All thoughts arise after the arising of the I thought. See to whom these thoughts arise. Then you transcend them and they subside. That is to say, tracing the source of the I thought, you realize the perfect I, I. I is the name of the self. Question, do memory, sleep and death affect the I? Answer, it is confusion due to non-differentiation between false and real I. These three attributes and modes pertain to the false ego. Vivekachitamani makes it clear that the artificial eye of the Vijnamaya Kosha, wisdom body, is a projection and through it one must look to the true principle of I. Question, what is the ego self? Answer, the ego appears and disappears, it is transitory whereas the real self abides permanently. Question, what is prostrating? Answer, it means subsidence of ego. What is subsidence? To merge into the source. God cannot be deceived by outward genuflections and bowings. He sees if the ego is there or not. I am is the ocean and the individual egos are bubbles in it. 
Bubbles pass away. Question. What of evil conditions, birth and death, for instance? Answer. First, the ego comes in. It's sprouting as our birth, but really we do not die. It is wrong to say we see, for if you try to find out who sees, that seer disappears. I is the subject, and all other thoughts comprise the object mind. Were you aware when you were fast asleep last night? No. What is it that now exists and troubles you? It is the I. Get rid of it and be happy. The ego-ridden mind has its strength sapped, and is too weak to resist the torturing thoughts. The egoless mind is happy in deep, dreamless sleep. Clearly, therefore, bliss and misery are only modes of mind, but the weak mode is not easily interchangeable with the strong mode. Activity is weakness and consequently miserable. Passivity is strength and therefore blissful. The dormant strength is not apparent and therefore not availed of. Creation is to be considered in two aspects: creator and individual soul. It is the latter which causes pain and pleasure, irrespective of former. Pain and pleasure has no reference to fact but to mental conceptions. Kill the personality, and there is no pain or pleasure but the natural bliss which persists eternally. Conscious death is the purpose of evolution, and conscious immortality while still in the flesh. Question: How to know the self? Answer: See what the self is. What you consider as the self is really either the mind, intellect, or the I thought. So hold on to it. The others will vanish, leaving the self. Are there two eyes? How do you know your existence? Do you see yourself with these eyes? Question yourself. How does this question arise? Do I remain to ask it or not? Can I find myself as in a mirror? Because your outlook has been outward bent, it has lost sight of the self, and your vision is external. The self is not found in the external objects. Turn your look within and plunge down. You will be the self. Question: What is to be done to kill the ego? Answer: See for whom the doubts are. Who is the doubter? Who is the thinker? That is the ego. Hold it. The other thoughts will die away. The ego is pure. See where from the ego arises. That is pure consciousness. Question: I begin to ask myself, Who am I? Eliminate the body as not I, the prana as not I, the mind as not I, and I am not able to proceed further. Answer: Well, that is so far as the intellect goes. Your process is only intellectual. Indeed, all the scriptures mention the process only to guide the seeker to know the truth. The truth cannot be directly pointed out. Hence, this intellectual process. You see, the one who eliminates all the not I cannot eliminate the I. To say I am not this or I am that, there must be the I. This I is only the ego or the I thought. After the rising up of this I thought, all other thoughts arise. The I thought is therefore the root thought. If the root is eliminated, all others are uprooted. Therefore, seek the root I. Question yourself: Who am I? Find out its source. Then all these will vanish, and the pure self will remain over. The I is always there in such a deep, deep sleep, in dream, and in wakefulness. The one in sleep is the same as the one who now speaks. There is always the feeling of I. Do you deny your existence? Do not say I am, as if to convince yourself of your existence. Find out who is. The reality of yourself cannot be questioned. The self is the primal reality. The ordinary man takes as reality, unconsciously, his true inner reality plus all things which have come into his consciousness as pertaining to himself, body, etc. He has to unlearn. Question. Is it possible to know the after-death state of a person? Answer: It is possible, but why try to know it? Question: 
because I consider my own son's death to be real for my level of understanding. Answer, the birth of the I thought is one son's birth, its death is the person's death. After the I thought has arisen the wrong identity with the body arises. Thinking yourself as the body, you give false values to others and identify them with bodies. Did you think of your son before his birth? Only as you are thinking of him, he is your son. Where has he gone? He has gone to the source from which he sprang. He is one with you. So long as you are, he is there too. See the real self and this confusion with body will vanish. You are eternal. The others will be found to be eternal. Until this truth is realized there will be always this grief due to wrong identity. Birth and death and rebirth should only make you investigate the question and find out that there are no births or rebirths. They relate to the body and not to the self. Question, what happens to the created ego after body dies? Answer, ego is I thought. In its subtle form, it remains a thought whereas in its gross aspect it embraces mind, senses and body. They disappear in deep slumber along with the ego. Still the self is there. Similarly it will be in death. Ego is not an entity independent of the self in order that it might be created or destroyed by itself. It functions as an instrument of the self and periodically ceases to function. In other words, it appears and disappears as birth and death. Question. I want to find the real I and always be effortlessly in touch. Answer. It is enough that you give up the individual I and no effort will be needed to gain the real I. Do not think that there is any such difference between you and the self. Then surrender yourself to him merge yourself in him. There should be no reservations, as you cannot cheat God. Question, what about after death? Answer, inquire first who or what is it that is born. It is the body, not you. Why trouble about things beyond you like death when yourself is here and present? Question, how long does one stay in other worlds between births and deaths? Answer, the sense of time is relative. In a dream you may live a whole day's events in a couple of hours. In the subtle body of the death world, you may do the same and live what seems a thousand years, although by our time it may be only one hundred years. When news of someone's death was reported to Maharshi he replied, Good. The dead ones are indeed happy. They have got rid of the troublesome overgrowth the body. Do men fear sleep? Sleep is temporary death. Death is longer sleep. Why should one desire continuance of the bodily shackles? Let the man find out his undying self and be immortal. So long as one identifies himself with his gross body, the thoughts materialized as gross manifestations must be real to him. Having existed here it certainly survives death. Hence under these circumstances the other world exists. On the other hand, consider that the one reality is the self from whom has sprung the ego. The ego loses sight of the self and identifies itself with body, with the result of ignorance and misery. The life current has passed through innumerable incarnations, births and deaths, but is still unaffected. There is no reason to mourn. The mind is of the ego, and the ego rises from the self. Nandi, the sacred bull of Saiva, represents the ego jiva. It is always shown in our temples facing the god, and with a flat circular stone in front of it. This stone altar is where sacrifices are offered, and it all symbolizes that the ego must be sacrificed and must always be turned towards the inner god. Know what the jiva is. What is the difference between jiva and atma? Is jiva itself atma, or is there any separate thing as atma? Question, what is the object of one's life? Answer, the object is to understand who is that I contained in your my. Question, I realize that intellectually I am part of the great I, the universe. Answer, 
then are there two eyes. Realize that you are not part but the whole. Question, what is the reason for this apparent duality of selves which exists? Answer, in your sound sleep do you think of duality part or whole? Duality is only when you awake. What became of the world when you were asleep? That I existed in all three states, and it is that which you want to know. The thoughts of life's purpose or purposelessness do not arise to trouble you during sleep. In the yoga of Asistha Chudala, the wife of Sikhidwaja teaches her husband the principles of Advaita Vedanta. Hear for me another story which will be of great help to you in the improvement of your knowledge. In the ancient forest, there lived an elephant, the hugest and loftiest of his kind. Certain mahouts of the forest associated with, and entrapped, this elephant whose tusks were exceedingly long, sharp and strong, and fettered it with strong iron chains. The elephant was made to go through all kinds of torture and hardships by the mahout. Becoming infuriated with its painful fetters, it shook itself free by the aid of powerful tusks. The mahout in the howdah above seeing this became giddy and fell to the ground. The tusker, finding him upon the ground, passed by without hurting him. But the driver, picking himself up with unappeased passion, went again in quest of the elephant which he found in the midst of the forest. There he dug a trench, covering it up with dry leaves and grass. The elephant, after roaming through the forest, came at length to the place where the trench was and fell into it. Instantly the mahout made it fast. Thus again was the elephant subjected to torture. Had this creature killed his enemy at the time when the mahout lay before it, it would not again have fallen into the trap, nor have been thus again agitated. Likewise, those who make no inquiry concerning the good and evil of the future will come to grief. Judala illustrated Sikhidwaja's error by this story. He had Varajya dispassion, even while ruling his kingdom and could have realized the self if only he had pushed his Varajya dispassion to the point of the sacrifice of the ego. He did not do so, but went to the forest, had a timetable of tapas and yet did not improve even after eighteen years of effort. He had made himself a victim of his own creation. Judala now advised him to give up the ego and realize the self, which he did and was emancipated. It is clear from Judala's story that Varajya still accompanied by the ego is of no value, whereas having possessions but free from the tangle of the ego is liberation. Chapter 13 Avashtatriya In sleep, in trance, in absent-mindedness there is no differentiation. What is that which was then but is absent now? The difference is due to mind. The mind is sometimes present and at other times absent. There is no change in the reality. The same person who was in sleep is now too in waking. The self is the same all through. Limitation is only in the mind. The same self is here and now in the wakeful state as in deep sleep when no limitation is felt. There was no mind in sleep whereas it is now active. The self exists in the absence of mind also. Question, why is there no meditation during dream? Is it possible? Answer, ask it in dream. You are told to meditate now and ask who you are. Instead of doing it you ask such questions. Dream and sleep are the same for the person as waking. You are the witness of both, they pass before you. Because you are out of meditation now, such questions arise. What happens to the consciousness of a realized one in sleep? Such a question arises only in the minds of unrealized beholders. He has but one state which is unbroken throughout the twenty-four hours, whether in what you call sleeping or waking. As a matter of fact, the majority of people are all asleep because they are not awake to the self. In the deep sleep state we lay down our ego, our thoughts and our desires. If we could only do all this while we are conscious, we would realize the self. 
The best form of dhyana or meditation is when it continues not merely in waking but extends to the dream and deep sleep states. The meditation must be so intense as not even to give room for the consciousness of the idea I am meditating. As waking and dreaming are fully occupied by the dhyana of such a person deep sleep may be considered to be part of the dhyana. Sannyasa is the giving up of the ego, even though a person may be living as a householder in the family circle, the various occurrences of the world will not affect him if his ego is surrendered. Thus dream experiences do not really affect us. A dreamer as he quietly lies in his bed, dreams he is in water, but his bed is not really wet. On the other hand, a person though remaining in a sannyasa ashrama who has still attachment to the body, is a karmi man of action, not a renunciate. Question. In the West people cannot see how sages in solitude can be helpful. Answer. Never mind Europe and America. Where they accept in your mind. If you wake up from a dream, do you try to ascertain if the persons of your dream creation are also awake? Question. If sleep be such a good state, why does not one like to be always in it? Answer. One is always in sleep only. The present waking state is no more than a dream. Dream can take place only in sleep. Sleep is underlying these three states. The display of those three states is again a dream which is, in its turn, in another sleep. In this way, these states of dream and sleep are endless. Similar to these states, birth and death are also dreams in a sleep. There are really speaking no birth and death. After sleep the ego rises up and there is wakefulness. Simultaneously thoughts arise. From where? They must spring from the conscious self. Apprehending it even vaguely helps the extinction of ego after which is realization of the one infinite existence. In that state there are no individuals other than the eternal existence. Abide in the ever inherent self and be free from the idea of birth or fear of death. Question. We do not know we are dreaming whereas in waking we do. Answer. The dream is a combination of waking with deep sleep. It is due to the samskaras of the waking state. Hence we remember dreams. Samskaras are not formed otherwise. Hence we are not aware of the dream world simultaneously. Still, everyone recollects strange perplexities in dream when one wonders if he is awake or dreaming. When really awake he finds all was only a dream. Question. How to remove the ignorance? Answer. You dream of finding yourself in another town. Can another town enter your room? Could you have left and gone there? Both are impossible. Both are unreal. They appear real to the mind. The eye of the dream has vanished, but the substratum of the mind continues all along. Find that and you will be happy. Question. I consider sleep a worse state than waking. Answer. If it were so, why do all desire sleep? There are different methods of approach to prove the unreality of the universe. The example of the dream is one among them. Jagrat, Swapna, and Sushupti are all treated elaborately in the scriptures in order that the reality underlying them might be revealed. It is not meant to accentuate the differences among the three states. Their purpose must be kept clearly in view. They say that the world is unreal. Of what degree of unreality? Is it like that of a son of a barren woman or a flower in the sky? These are mere words without any reference to facts, whereas the world is a fact and not a mere word. The answer is that it is a superimposition on the one reality like the appearance of a snake on a coiled rope in dim light. Here too the wrong identity ceases as soon as a friend points out that it is a rope, whereas in the matter of the world, it persists even after I have heard it said to be unreal. How is that? The appearance of water in a mirage persists after the knowledge of mirage has dawned. So it is with the world. 
Though knowing it to be unreal, it continues to manifest, but now the water of the mirage is not sought to satisfy one's thirst. As soon as one knows that it is a mirage, one gives it up as useless and does not run after it for procuring water. Question, is it not so with the appearance of the world also? Even after it is repeatedly declared to be false, one cannot avoid satisfying his wants from the world. How can the world be false? Answer, it is like one satisfying one's dream wants by dream creations. There are objects, there are wants, and there are mutual satisfactions. The dream creations are as purposeful as the jagrat waking world and yet is not considered real. Thus we see that all these illustrations serve a purpose in establishing the stages of unreality. To the realized sage the Jagra waking world is real. Each illustration is understood in the proper context. It should not be studied as an isolated statement. It is a link in a chain. The purpose of all these illustrations is to direct the seeker's mind towards the one reality underlying them all. Question. The dream world is not purposeful as the waking world because in it we do not feel wants to be satisfied. Answer. You are not right. There are thirst and hunger in dream also. You might have had your fill and kept over the remaining food. Nevertheless, you feel hungry in your dream. This food does not help you and your dream hunger can be satisfied only by eating the dream creations. Question. We recollect our dreams in our Jagrat waking state but not vice versa. Answer. You are yourself in the dream and identify yourself as the same one as the one now speaking. Question. But we do not know that we are dreaming as apart from waking as we do now. Answer. The dream is the combination of Jagrat waking with Sushupti deep sleep. It is due to the samskaras of the Jagrat waking state. Hence we remember dreams. Samskaras are not found contrary wise, that is, in the deep sleep state. We can however be aware of the dream and waking simultaneously. Everyone recollects the strange perplexities that occur in dreams. The person wonders if he is dreaming or is awake. He argues and determines that he is only awake. When really awake, he finds it was all only a dream. Question, is there any real distinction between dream and waking? Answer, only apparent, not real. The dream is for one who says that he is awake. Both are unreal from absolute viewpoint. Realization is possible in faint, half awake, half asleep, and impossible in sleep. The ego arises when you wake up from sleep. In sleep you do not say that you are sleeping. You say that only when you wake up, but still you are there. You are not concerned with the body when asleep, so why not always remain unconcerned? In waking state, ego identifies itself with physical body and dream with the subtle mind. Then the perceptions are subtle also. Question. Is it possible to be conscious without thought? Answer. Yes. There is only one consciousness. In sleep there is no I. The I thought arises on waking and then the world appears. Where was this I in sleep? Was it there or not? It must have been there yet not in the way you feel now. Present is only the I thought, whereas the sleeping I is the real I. That I subsists all through the various states. That is consciousness. If that is known, you will see that it is beyond thoughts. Thoughts may be considered like all other activities, in other words, not disturbing the supreme consciousness. Question. I do not understand your reference to dream and mental illusion. Answer, our experience of the world is evoked and dissolved by the mind. When you travel from India to London does your body really move? No. It is the conveyance which moves and your body remains inside it without itself traveling. It is the ship and the train which travels. Just as these movements are superimposed upon your body, 
sore visions, dream states, and even reincarnations superimposed upon your real self. The latter does not move and is not affected by all these outward changes, remaining still in its own place even as the body remains still in the ship's cabin. You are always the same and hence beyond time and beyond space. In deep sleep you have no sense of time. The concept of time and space arises only when there is the limitation of I. Even now the I thought is both limitless and limited. So long as you think it to be the body, it is limited. At the time of waking up and before one actually becomes fully aware of the external world, that interval, timeless, spaceless, is the state of the true I. Why do not your questions arise in deep sleep? The fact is you have no limitations in sleep and no question arises. Whereas now, you put on identification with the body and questions of this kind arise. Deep sleep is always present even in the waking state. What we have to do is to bring deep sleep into the waking state to get conscious sleep. Realization can only take place in the waking state. Deep sleep is relative to the waking state. Can that one consciousness divide itself into two? Is the division of the self felt? Awaking from sleep, one finds oneself the same in the wakeful as well as in the sleep states. That is the experience of each one. The difference lies in seeing in the outlook. Imagining that you are the seer as separate from experience, this difference appears. Experience says that your real is the same all through. Do you feel the difference of external and internal in your sleep? This difference is only with reference to the body and arises with body consciousness, I thought. The so-called jagrat waking is itself an illusion. Turn your vision inward and then the whole jagrat waking is maya, but then maya is really satya. Even the material sciences trace the origin of the universe to someone primordial matter that is very subtle. God is the same both to those who say the Jagrat waking is real and their opponents. Their outlooks are different. You need not enmesh yourself in such disputations. The goal is one and the same for all. Look to it. The states of deep sleep waking and dream are crescents on the ego. The self is the witness of all. The self transcends them all. This witness consciousness should be found. In the self there are not the three states, no waking, sleeping or deep sleep, it is ever there. Question, on inquiry into the origin of thoughts, there is a perception of I. But it does not satisfy one. Answer, quite right. The perception of I is associated with a form, maybe the body. There should be nothing associated with the pure self. The self is the unassociated, pure reality in whose light the body, the ego, etc. shine. On stilling all thoughts, the pure consciousness remains over. Just awaking from sleep and before becoming aware of the world, there is that pure I. I. Hold to it without sleeping or without allowing thoughts to possess you. If that is held firm, it does not matter even though the world is seen. The seer remains unaffected by the phenomena. If there were no such activities as waking thoughts and dream thoughts, there would not be the corresponding worlds, in other words no perception of them. In deep sleep there are no such activities, and the world does not then exist for us. In dreamless sleep there is no world, no ego and no unhappiness, but the self remains. In the wakeful state there are all these, yet there is the self. One has only to remove the transitory happenings in order to realize the ever-present beatitude of the self. Your nature is bliss. Find that on which all the rest are superimposed, and you then remain as the pure self. The Maharshi asked his attendant for a small notebook. The latter could not find a suitable one. After a couple of days, Mr. K. K. Nambire, the local PWD engineer, 
visited the ashram and produced a fine notebook saying the Maharshi appeared to me in a dream and asked for a notebook of that size. So I have brought it. The Maharshi took it with a smile. Question, is there any genuine difference between dream experience and waking state? Answer, because you find the dream creations transitory in relation to the waking state, there is said to be a difference. The difference is only apparent and not real. Question, why can we not always remain in and enter deep slumber at will? Answer, deep sleep exists also in the wakeful state. We are ever in deep sleep. That should consciously be understood and realized. There is really no going or coming from it. Becoming aware of the deep sleep state whilst in the world state is samadhi. It is nature in other words prarabdha which forces you to emerge from it. Your ego is not dead and will rise again and again. Question. Why is it that we remember dreams when awake but not the reverse? Answer. You are wrong. You are yourself in the dream and identify yourself as the one now speaking. Question. Is waking state independent of existing objects? Answer. Were it so the objects must exist without the seer, that is the object must tell you that it exists. Does it do so? For example, does a cow moving in front of you tell you that she is moving, or do you say of your own accord there is a cow moving? The objects exist because the seer is cognizing them. Recall the state of sleep. Were you aware of anything happening? If the sun or the world be real, should they not be present with you in sleep? You cannot deny your existence in sleep nor can you deny that you are happy there. Yet, you are the same person now speaking and raising doubts. You now say you are not happy but you are happy in sleep. What has transpired in the meantime that the happiness of sleep has broken down? It is the ego. That is the new arrival in Jagra waking state. There was no ego in sleep. The birth of the ego is called the birth of the person. There is no other birth. Whatever is born is bound to die. Kill the ego. There is no fear of death for that is dead. The self remains after the death of the ego. That is bliss, that is immortality. Because you desire to learn, discussion is unavoidable. Leave all this aside. Consider your sleep. Are you aware of bondage or do you seek means for release? Are you aware of the body itself? The sense of bondage is associated with the body. Otherwise there is no bondage, no material to bind with and no one to be bound. These appear however in your wakeful state. Consider to whom they appear. Meharshi, was the world present in your sleep? Was there attachment to it? There was not. Were you there or not? Inquirer, I was. Meharshi, you are therefore the same one who was in sleep. What is it then that now raises the question of Maya? Mind was not in sleep. The world then is only for the mind. That is so. The pure self is simple being. It does not associate itself with objects and become conscious as it is in wakeful state. What you now call consciousness in the present is associated consciousness requiring the brain, mind, body etc. to depend upon, but in sleep the consciousness perishes without these. Question. I do not know the sleep consciousness. Answer. Who is not aware of it? You admit I am. You admit I was in sleep. The state of being is yourself. Question. Does that not mean to say that sleep is self-realization? Answer. It is self. Why do you talk of realization? Is there a moment when the self is not realized? Why pick out sleep for it? Even now you are self-realized. Question. But I do not understand it. Answer because you are identifying the self with body. Question, then how to get rid of Maya? Answer, this attachment to world is not found in sleep. 
It is perceived and felt now. It is not your real nature. To whom is this secretion? If the real nature is known, it is not. If you realize self the possessions are not perceived. Mayor is not separate and objective that it can be got rid of in any other way. Question. How do we sleep and awaken? Answer. Just at nightfall the hen crows and the chicks hide in its wings. The hen then roosts in the nest with the chicks under her protection. At the dawn the chicks come out and so does the hen. Just so the mother symbolizes the ego which collects all the thoughts and goes to sleep. At sunrise they emerge again. Thus when the ego displays itself it does so with all its components when it sinks, everything disappears with it. Question, what is deep sleep? Answer, just as on a dark cloudy night no individual identification is possible and there is only darkness although the seer has high size wide open, similarly in deep slumber the seer is only aware of simple nescience. Question, why should there be difference in the feelings or experiences of the two states? Answer. Did you ask while asleep any question regarding your birth or where you go after death? Why think all these now in the wakeful state? Let what is born think of its birth and remedy its cause and ultimate fate. Why these questions relating to after death? Raise the questions now and answer them. Was I born? Am I reaping the fruits of my past karma? And so on. They will not be raised when you fall to sleep. Why? Are you different from the one in sleep? You are in sleep in the dream and in the wakeful state just the same. Sleep is a natural state of happiness. There is no misery. The sense of want of pain, etc. arises only in the wakeful state. What is the change that has taken place? You are the same in both, but there is a difference in happiness. Why? Because the mind has arisen now. This mind arises after the I thought. The I thought arises from the consciousness. If one abides in it, the person is always happy. Question, is it the body when tired that goes to sleep? Answer, but does the body sleep or wake up? You yourself said before that the mind is quiet in sleep. The three states are to the mind. The self is always uncontaminated. It is the substance running through all these three states. The wakeful state passes off I am. The dream state passes off I am. They repeat, still I am. They are like pictures moving on the screen in a cinema show. They do not affect the screen. Similarly also here. I am unaffected though these states pass off. If it is for the body, are you aware of the body in sleep? Without knowing the body to be there, how can that body be said to be in sleep? The sense of the body is a thought. The thought is of the mind. The mind rises after the I thought. The I thought is the root thought. If that is held, the other thoughts will disappear. There will then be no body, no mind, not even the ego, only the self in its purity. After the mind rises, the body thought rises and the body is seen. Then the thought of birth, the state before birth, death, the state after death, all these are only of the mind. You who slept are also now awake. There was no unhappiness in your sleep, whereas it is present now. What is it that has happened now, so that this difference is experienced? There was no I thought in your sleep whereas it is present now. The true I is not apparent and the false I is parading. This false I is the obstacle to your right knowledge. Find out where from this false I arises. That will disappear. You will be only what you are, in other words, absolute being. Search for the source of I thought. That is all that one has to do. The universe is on account of the I thought. If that ends, there ends misery also. The false I will end only when its source is sought. Question, can the soul remain without a body? Answer, it will be so in a short time hence during deep slumber. 
The self is then bodiless, but even now it is so. In deep sleep you exist without ego, then you are free of doubts. Only now in waking state ego rises and you have doubts. In deep sleep you are happy, in waking state you are unhappy. Find out that state of deep sleep whence you have come. Question, what is Turiya? Answer, Turiya is the mind in quiescence and aware of self. There is the awareness that the mind has merged in its source. Whether the senses are active or inactive is immaterial. In Nirvikalpa Samadhi the senses are inactive. To know implies the subject and object. To be aware means to be thought free. The Maharshi used that book to write a Malayalam translation of Ramana Gita, which was printed by K. K. Nambayar at his own cost. Chapter 14 The Ultimate as Truth The self is like a powerful hidden magnet within us. It draws us gradually to itself, though we imagine we are going to it of our own accord. When we are near enough, it puts an end to our other activities, makes us still, and then swallows up our own personal current, thus killing our personality. It overwhelms the intellect and overfloods the whole being. We think we are meditating upon it and developing towards it, whereas the truth is that we are as iron filings, and it is the Atman magnet that is pulling us towards itself. Thus the process of finding self is a form of divine magnetism. It is necessary to practice meditation frequently and regularly until the condition induced becomes habitual and permanent throughout the day. Therefore meditate. You lost sight of the bliss because your meditative attitude had not become natural and because of the recurrence of asanas. When you become habitually reflective, the enjoyment of spiritual beatitude becomes a matter of natural experience. It is not by a single realization that I am not the body but the Atman that the goal is reached. Do we become high in position by once seeing a king? One must constantly enter into samadhi and realize one's self, and completely blot out the old vasyanas and the mind, before it becomes the self. If you keep to the thought of the self, and be intently watching for it then even that one thought which is used as a focus in concentration will disappear and you will be the true self. Meditation on self is our natural state. Only because we find it hard do we imagine it to be an arbitrary and extraordinary state. We are all unnatural. The mind resting in the self is its natural condition, but instead of that our minds are resting in outward objects. After the expulsion of name and form Nama Rupa which compose the external world, and by dwelling on existence knowledge bliss sat chit ananda, take care to prevent the re-entry into the mind of the expelled name and form. Question, how to find self? Answer, there can be no real investigation into the Atma. The investigation can only be made into the non-self. Elimination of the non-self is alone possible. The self being always self-evident will shine of itself. Knowing means being. It is not relative knowledge. Progress can be spoken of in reference to things to be attained. Whereas here, it is the removal of ignorance and the not the acquisition of knowledge. Question, what is the jhana path? Answer, Yoga is similar because both help concentration of mind. Yoga aims at union of the individual with the universal reality. Yoga is itself an aid to self-realization, the goal of all. This reality cannot be new. It must exist even now. Therefore Jhana tries to find out how separation came about. Question, how did Avidya arise? Answer, avidya is like maya that which is not. Therefore, the question is what is avidya? Avidya is ignorance. It implies subject and object. Become the subject and there will be no object. The statements of scriptures that the self is perfect yet that removal of ignorance is necessary appear contradictory, but they are for the guidance of earnest seekers, 
who cannot yet understand the plain truth. Krishna plainly said that people confound him with the body whereas he was not born nor will die. The self is simple being. He. And there will be an end of ignorance. The I is always there. There is no knowing it. It is not a new knowledge to be acquired. There is an obstruction to its knowledge called ignorance. Remove it but ignorance or knowledge is not for the self. They are overgrossed to be cleared. Question, why do I not realize the self? Answer, the fact is that all the while you are knowing the self. How can the self not know the self? Only you, the self, have got into the habit of thinking that you are a third thing. What is to be done is to get rid of the wrong notion of the self. In the case of the ever-present, inescapable I, how can you be ignorant? You have constantly to fight out and get rid of your false notions of I one after another. Do that. That then leads to self-realization. Who is ignorant of which? Ask the question and pursue the inquiry as to who it is that is said to be ignorant. Once you put the question trying to probe into the I, the I disappears. Then what remains is true self-knowledge. Again, what is avidya? Ignorance of self. But who is ignorant of self? The self must be ignorant of self. Are there two selves? If you accept one philosophic system then you are forced to condemn the others. A child and Johnny are similar. Incidents interest the child only so long as they last. It ceases to think of them after they have passed away. So then it is apparent they don't leave any imprint or impressions on the child, and it is not affected by them mentally. So it is with the sage too. Question. I understand this but do not realize it. Answer. Because you are engaged with multiplicity, you say you have flashes of insight etc. You consider this variety to be real. But unity alone is real. This variety must go before unity reveals itself, its reality. It is always real. It does not send flashes of its being in the false variety. On the contrary, this variety obstructs the truth. Realization is ever present, not absent at one time and present at another. For example, the sun does not see darkness, but others speak of darkness fleeing at his approach. Similarly, ignorance is a phantom. When its unreal nature is found, it is said to be removed. Again, the sun is there and you are surrounded by sunlight. But to know this you must turn your eyes in his direction and look at him. So also the self is found by practice alone, although it is here and now. Question. Is the thought I am God helpful? Answer. I am is God, not thinking. Realize I am and do not think I am. No. Not think. I am that I am means that one must abide as I. He is always the I alone, nothing else. Question. How does the mistake of wrong identification come about? Answer. See if it has come about. The ego self does not exist. Question. What should I do to get into that state of self? Answer. No attempt is required to be in that state. What is required is to give up all the false ideas. Whenever the idea comes, trace out to whom it occurs. When a new thought comes, trace it out by analysis. In course of time, all thoughts are destroyed. Question. Suppose the idea is a desire for a certain object. Answer. Objects are many, but the subject is one. Practice the same line. Trace out to whom does the desire come. Concentration and all other practices are meant for recognizing the absence, in other words the non-existence of ignorance. No one can deny his existence. Existence is knowledge, in other words awareness. That implies absence of ignorance. And yet, why do they suffer? Because man thinks he is this or that. That is wrong. 
I am alone is and not I am so and so. When existence is absolute, it is all right. When it is particularized, it is wrong. That is the whole truth. Does a man look into a mirror to know he exists? His awareness makes him admit it, but he confuses it with the body, etc. In sleep, he still exists, even without the body. Hold that awareness. You cannot see your own eyes, yet do you deny their existence? Similarly, even though the self is not objectified, you are aware of it. Who is to know the self? Can the body know it? Your duty is to be, not to be this or that. The method is summed up in be still. It means destroy yourself because any form is the cause of the trouble. When the I is kept up as I only, not I am this or I in this, it is the self. When it flies off at a tangent, it is the ego. The real self will not and cannot ask these questions. All these discussions are a matter of competence of ripeness. Question: From where did ignorance issue? Answer: There is nothing like ignorance. It never arises. Everyone is jhana svarupi. Only jhana does not come easily. The dispelling of ignorance is jhana, which always exists. For example, the necklace round the neck was supposed to have been lost, or the ten fools failing to count one self and counting all others. To whom is knowledge or ignorance? Your nature is ananda. Ignorance is now hiding that ananda. Remove the ignorance for ananda to be freed. Question: How to get peace? Answer: That is the natural state. The mind obstructs the innate peace. Our vichara is only in the mind. Investigate the mind; it will disappear. It is eliminated, and you remain. So the question is one of outlook. You perceive all. To yourself, and all are understood. But you have now lost hold of yourself, and go about doubting other things. Question: If I am always here now, why do I not feel so? Answer: That is it. Who says that it is not felt? Does the real I say it or the false I? Examine it. You will find it is the wrong I. The wrong I is the obstruction. It has to be removed in order that the true I might not be hidden. The feeling that I have not realized is the obstruction to realization. In fact, it is already realized. There is nothing realizable. If the latter, the realization will be anew. It has not existed so far. It must take place hereafter. What has birth will also die. If realization be not eternal, it is not worth having. Therefore, what we seek is not that which must happen afresh. It is only that which is eternal and which is not known due to obstructions. It is that we seek. All that we need do is to remove the obstruction. That which is eternal is not known to be so because of ignorance. Ignorance is the obstruction. Get over that ignorance, and all will be well. The ignorance is identical with the I thought. Find its source, and it will vanish. The I thought is like a spirit which is not palpable, rises up simultaneously with the body, flourishes on it, and disappears with it. The body consciousness is the wrong I. Give up this body consciousness. It is done by seeking the source of the I. The body does not say I am. It is you who says I am the body. Find out who this I is. Seeking its source, it will vanish. Ego, in its purity from objective identification, is experienced in intervals between two states or two thoughts. Ego is like that caterpillar which leaves one hold only after catching another. Realize this interval with conviction gained by the study of the three states of consciousness. This study helps to gain this outlook. Question: Should one keep a goal before one's eyes? Answer: What goal is there? The thing you conceive as being the goal exists even prior to the ego's own existence. If we conceive ourselves as ego, 
or body or mind, then we are those things, but if we do not conceive ourselves as such then we are our real nature. It is the thinking which gives rise to such troubles. The very thought that there is such a thing as ego is wrong because ego is I thought and we are ourselves the real I. The thoughtless state is its self-realization. The Vita's declaration I am this or that is only an aid. If there be a goal to be reached it cannot be permanent. What is goal is already there. With what ego do we seek to reach the goal, the goal is existent before the ego. What is in the goal is even prior to our birth, in other words to the birth of the ego. Because we exist, the ego appears to exist too. We look on the self as the ego, then we are the ego, if as the mind we are the mind, if as the body we are the body. It is the thought that works up appearance in so many ways. Looking at the shadow on the water it is found to be shaking. Can anyone stop the shaking of the shadow? If it should cease to shake, you should not look on the water. Look at yourself. Therefore do not look to the ego. The ego is the I thought. The true I is the self. Question, how can we get into touch with the higher self? Answer, is it something far away that you have to touch it? The higher self exists as one, but it is only our thoughts which make us feel it is not. You can neither think about it nor forget it. The higher self is always so whether you follow the path to it or not. Divine existence is our very nature. Question, how can we get rid of these false thoughts? Answer, you have unnecessarily loaded yourself with so many thoughts, that is the trouble. Just exist as you really are, and those thoughts will die away of themselves. To whom do those thoughts and emotions arise? As you have the habit of forming extraneous thoughts, it is difficult to change the habit. Question, can I go on thinking I am God? Is that right practice? Answer, why think that? In fact you are God, but who goes on saying, I am a man, I am a male. If any contrary thought for instance that one was a beast had to be put down then of course, you might say I am a man. To the extent of crushing down the wrong notion that one is this or that according to one's erroneous fancies to that extent the idea that is not these but God or self may be indulged in as a matter of practice. But when practice is over, the result is not any thought at all, such as I am God but mere self-realization. There is no need or meaning in thought at that stage which is beyond conceptual thought. Question. If self be itself conscious, why am I not aware even now? Answer. Your present knowledge is due to ego and is only relative. Relative knowledge requires a subject and object, whereas the awareness of self is absolute and requires no object. Remembrance similarly is relative. It requires an object to be remembered and another to remember. When there are no two things, who is to remember whom? That which is beyond knowledge and ignorance is the Atman. Question, up to what point is the inquiry itself to be carried out? Answer, you must carry on this demolition of wrong ideas by inquiry till your last wrong notion is demolished till the self is realized. Question, how is the mind to dive into the heart? Answer, the mind now sees itself diversified into the universe. If the diversity is not manifest, it remains in its own essence. That is the heart. The heart is the only truth. Mind is only a transient phase. Because a man identifies himself with the body, he sees the world separate from himself. This wrong identification arises because he has lost his moorings and has swerved from his original state. He is now advised to give up all these false ideas, to trace his source and remain as the self. In that state there are no differences, no questions will arise. All the sastras are meant only to make man retrace his steps to the original source. He need not gain anything. 
He must only give up the false ideas and useless accretions. He, instead of doing it, tries to catch hold of something strange and mysterious because he believes that his happiness lies elsewhere. That is the mistake. If one remains as the self, there is bliss. Probably he thinks that being quiet does not bring about the state of bliss. That is due to his ignorance. The only practice is to find out to whom these questions arise. Question: What is to be our sadhana? Answer: The sahaja of sada. Sahaja is the original state, so that sadhana amounts to the removal of obstacles for the realization of this abiding truth. Chapter 15: Practical Philosophy. Question: What is selfishness? Answer: The world is not external. Because you identify yourself wrongly with the body, you see the world. Its pain becomes apparent to you, but this is not real. Seek the reality and get rid of this unreal feeling. A disciple was once excited because someone in the town spoke deprecatingly of Sri Bhagavan. Meher, she said, "I permit him to do so. Let him say even more. Let others follow suit." Only let them leave me alone. If anyone cares to believe all these scandalous words, I shall consider it a great service done to me. Because if he persuades people to think I am a false Swami, they will no longer come to visit me, and then I shall be able to have a quiet life. I want to be left alone. Therefore, I welcome the libelous pamphlet. Patience, more patience. Tolerance, more tolerance. Satisfaction can be only when you reach the source; otherwise, restlessness is there. While reading a book, while your eyes follow the lines, your heart should be in the one. Question: My friend has ardor for social service work, even at the sacrifice of his own interests. Answer: His selfless work is helpful; its utility cannot be denied. See how he works and remains there, and how you sent him the extract from the conversations. There is a link between the two. The work had further purified the man's mind. He gained an insight into the wisdom of sages rather readily. Social work has a place in the scheme of spiritual uplift. The work is social and not selfish. God is kept in view along. The public good is identical with one's own good. Such activities of the body and mind purify the mind. Thus, good social work is a way to render the mind pure. Question: But social work does not give us leisure for meditation. Answer: Of course, one's efforts cannot end with social work. The outlook is always on the highest truth. Everything will come right in time. Question. How is mana silence possible while engaged in worldly transactions? Answer: When women walk with water pots on their heads, they are able to talk with their companions, and all the while they are intent on the water above. Similarly, when a sage engages in activities, they do not disturb him because his mind abides in Brahman. The difficulty is that man thinks he is the doer. It is a mistake. It is the higher power which does everything, and man is only a tool. If he accepts that position, he is free from troubles; otherwise, he courts them. I watched a visitor who was a famous public speaker for the Arya Samaj, a vigorous debater and fighter, known for his intolerance and disputatiousness, enter the hall and begin to question the Maharshi. Scarcely waiting for an answer, he began to provide the answers himself. He laid down the law in a loud voice. For instance, he said, "I want to know the way to find truth." A minute later, he firmly said, "The service of humanity is the best way to find truth." The Maharshi replied, "You say so." The man began to argue with two others present, in an obnoxious manner. And thereafter, the Maharshi kept quiet and did not say a single word until the man left. After that, Maharshi said to us, "Silence is the greatest weapon wherewith to answer such persons."
Do your work without anticipating fruits thereof. That is all that you should do. I asked my Harshi why his books are in poem and song. He said it is easier for people to learn and remember this form. In the West, it will only be those disgusted with material life who will turn to the path. Joy and pain are the attributes of the Ahankara ego, when by Atmavachara you realize that you are not that sheath, where is the pleasure or pain for you? Your real nature transcends all such feelings as pleasure and pain. So your benefit in Atmavachara is tangible in the shape of escape from all the ills and sorrows of life. What more can one desire? He who is always stationed in the Atman may be in the midst of a crowd, and will yet continue undisturbed. He has no need or desire for solitude. What people call Satan, the devil, the black forces, etc. is simply ignorance of the true self. All aims, aspirations, desire to serve humanity, schemes to reform the world, cast them all upon the universal power God which sustains this universe. He is not a fool. He will do what is required. Do you lose the sense I am doing this? Get rid of the egoism. Do not think you are the person to effect any reform. Leave these aims latent. Let God attend to them. Then by getting rid of egoism, God may use you as an instrument to effect them, but the difference is that you will not be conscious of doing them, the infinite will be working through you and there will be no self-worship to spoil the work. Otherwise there is desire for name or fame and one serves the personal self rather than humanity. Nearly all mankind are more or less unhappy because nearly all do not know the true self. Real happiness abides in self-knowledge alone. All else is fleeting. To know oneself is to be blissful always. Question, is the world progressing now? Answer, there is one who governs the world, and it is his lookout to look after the world. He who has given life to the world knows how to look after it also. If we progress, the world progresses. As you are, so is the world. Without understanding the self, what is the use of understanding the world? Without self-knowledge, the knowledge of the world is of no use. See the world through the eyes of your Supreme Self. Question, it is harder for Westerners to withdraw inwards. Answer, yes, they are Rajasic, the energy going outwards. We must be inwardly quiet, not forgetting the self. Then externally we can go on with our action. Does a man who is acting on the stage in a female part forget that he is a man? Similarly, we too must play our parts on the stage of life, but we must not identify ourselves with those parts. You may carry on with your government work. You may continue to live the married life in the world as before. You may assume the stage which transcends all stages, only do not forget the one. Keep your mind on that all the time, whatever you happen to be doing. Question, what is the best way of living? Answer, it differs according to whether one is a jhani or not. A jhani does not find anything different or separate from the self. All are in the self. The universe and what is beyond are to be found in the self. Question, how to remove spiritual sloth of others? Answer, have you removed your own? Turn your inquiries towards self-search. The force set up within you will operate on others also. Question. What about Paul Brunton's idea of inspired action? Answer. Let activities go on. They do not affect the pure self. The difficulty is that man thinks he is the doer. It is a mistake. It is the higher power which does everything and man is only a tool. If he accepts that position he is free from troubles, otherwise he courts them. The sculptured figure on Temple Tower shows great strain but the tower rests on earth and really supports the figure. So is the man who takes on himself the sense of doing. Question, how is work to be done by an aspirant? 
answer without identification as the actor. For instance, while in Paris, you did not intend visiting this place. You see how you are acting without your own intention to do so. Chapter three, verse four of the Bhagavad Gita says that a man cannot remain without acting. The purpose of one's birth will be fulfilled by itself. Gradually, concentration will become pleasant and easy, and you will be in that state whether attending to business or whether you sit expressly for meditation. Business will be all the more easier for you when your mind is steadied and strengthened by concentration. Question: I have no interest in business, fearing my yoga practice will be marred. Answer: No, your viewpoint will change, as said in the Gita, chapter two. You will regard business in the light of a mere dream, but that will not affect it, for you will go on attending to it as it were serious. Question: The difficulty is to be in the thoughtless state and attend to duties. Answer: Let the thoughtless state be of itself. Do not think of it as pertaining to yourself. Just as when you walk, you take steps involuntarily, do so in your other actions. You now want to go elsewhere, and from there you will desire to go to some other place. At this rate, there could be no end to your travels. You do not realize that it is your mind that drives you in this manner. Control that first, and you will be happy wherever you are. It is my impression that Swami Vivekananda has somewhere narrated the story of a man trying to bury his shadow and finding that over every sod of earth he had put in the grave dug for burying his shadow, the latter still appeared over the new earth. The shadow could never be buried. Similar is the case of one trying to bury his thoughts. One must therefore attempt to get at the very bottom from which thought springs and root out thought. Mind and desires. Question: The quest for self is selfish in a world of misery. Selfless work is better. Answer: The sea is not aware of its wave. Similarly, the self is not aware of its ego. While the Maharshi was going down the hill, some sweepers were at their work. One of them stopped work and was about to prostrate before Maharshi. The latter said. To engage in your duty is the true namaskar. To perform one's duty carefully is the greatest service to God. There has been evil and sorrow since the beginning of creation. You ask why the rishis do not put matters right. The Vedas tell of the asuras demons who existed since earliest times. There is a force of opposition in the world which produces strife and suffering, but it works to make man grow and evolve. It is a force in nature which coexists along with the good. Question: How to correlate spiritual and worldly life? Answer: There is only one experience. What are worldly experiences but those built up on the false I? To one who said the Bhagavad Gita preached karma yoga, the Maharshi replied, "No, because it taught that one should act with selfless motive." This could only be achieved after knowing the illusoriness of self, in other words, jhana. Hence, it really taught jhana yoga, which Maharshi said is the highest. He said that Gita taught man should act by letting the universal act through him. Question: Why is the world in ignorance? Answer: Let the world care for itself. If you are the body, there is the gross world. If you are the spirit, all is spirit only. Look for it; the ego vanishes. If you inquire, the ignorance will be found non-existent. It is the mind which feels misery, darkness, etc. See the self. Question: What is the purpose of all suffering and evil in the world? Answer: Your question is itself the outcome of the suffering. Sorrow makes a man think of God. Had it not been for the suffering, would you have put the question? Except for the Johnnies, every man, from king to peasant, has a certain amount of sorrow. Even in cases where it seems absent, it is only a time factor that makes you think so. Sooner or later, it comes. Also, one man may not question sorrow or God at the first blow, but he is likely to do so at the fifth blow. We have taken this vehicle in order to know our real state. 
Question, but why should imperfection come from perfection? Answer, had it not been for the manifestation of universe we would not have thought about the real state. The purpose of the manifestation is for you to know the cause why it is being done. There is no maya when you know your real state. It is your fault if you do not know yourself. Question, what is the difference between West and East? Answer, all have come to the same goal. Question, I am a doctor, how to heal? Answer, the permanent cure is jhana the patient must realize for himself. According to his maturity he will realize it. Otherwise if one disease goes another comes in. To a young man who came and demanded to be given powers to stamp out the world's materialism. People who are unable themselves ask for divine powers to be utilized for human welfare. This is like the lame man who said he would overpower the enemy if only he were helped on his feet. The intention is good but there is no sense of proportion. Question. Is the world plan really good? Answer. It is indeed good. The error is on our part. When we correct that error the whole scheme becomes good. Question. How change world suffering? Answer, realize the self, that is all that is necessary. Question, the world is materialistic. What is the remedy for it? Answer, material or spiritual according to your outlook. Make your outlook right. The creator knows how to take care of his creation. Question, how can I help others? Answer, what other is there for you to help? Who is the I that is to help others? First clear that point and then everything settles itself. Question. There is widespread disasters in the world, for example famine, pestilence, etc. What is the cause of this state of affairs? Answer. To whom does all this appear? You are not aware of the world and its suffering in your sleep. You are conscious of them only in your wakeful state. Continue in the state in which you were not aware of the world and its sufferings did not affect you. When you remain as the self as in sleep, the world and its sufferings will not affect you. Therefore look within. Seek the self. There will then be an end of the world and its miseries. Question. There are great men, public workers who cannot solve the problem of the misery of world? Answer, they are ego-centered and hence the inability. If they remain in the self, they would be different. Question, how to reconcile work with meditation? Answer, who is the worker? Let him who works ask the question. You are always the self, not the mind. It is the mind which raises these questions. Work always proceeds in the presence of the self. It is no hindrance to realization. It is the mistaken identity of the worker that troubles one. Get rid of the false identity. Everyday activities go on automatically. Know that the mind prompting them is but a phantom proceeding from the self. Why do you think that you are active? The activities are not your own, they are God's. Question. They say that the efforts will lead to blankness of mind and work will not be possible. Answer, go first to that blankness and tell me afterwards. Question, if one holds such self in remembrance, will one's action be always right? Answer, they ought to be. However such a person is not concerned with the right or wrong of actions. His actions are God's and therefore right. Question, how can my mind be still if I have to use it more than other people? I want to go into solitude and renounce my headmaster's work. Answer, no. You may remain where you are and go on with work. What is the undercurrent which vivifies the mind and enables it to do all this work? Why, the self. So that is the real source of your activity. Simply become aware of it during your work and do not forget it. Contemplate in the background of your mind even whilst working. To do that do not hurry. Take your own time, keep the remembrance or real nature alive even whilst working, and avoid haste which causes you to forget. 
be deliberate. Practice meditation to still the mind and cause it to become aware of its true relationship to the self, which supports it. He gave a simile about the spokes of a wheel, whether thin or thick, which are all within the same circle. So all intellectual work is within the same circle of self. Do not imagine it is you who are doing the work. Think that it is the underlying current which is doing it. Identify yourself with this current. If you work unhurriedly, recollectedly, your work or service need not be a hindrance. Krishna and the Gita really told Arjuna to be fixed in self and act according to nature without the thought of doership. Then the results of actions would not affect him. Thus inherence in the self is the sum of Gita's teaching. Even if interpreted as a duty in action, it means to act as tool of a higher power. Question. Is it useful to bring East and West closer? Answer, such events will take place automatically. There is a power guiding the destinies of nations. These questions arise only when you have lost touch with reality. Question, how to reconcile realization with wage-earning activities? Answer, actions are no cause of bondage. Bondage is only the false notion that I am acting. Leave off such thoughts but let the body and senses play their roles unimpeded by your interference. Question, is work an obstruction? Answer, no. For the realized man, there is no sense of being an agent. Even for an aspirant he may practice self-inquiry. While engaged in work it may be difficult for a beginner, but after some practice it will be effective and the work will not be a hindrance to meditation. Question. How will transactions go on if one maintains mental silence? Answer. When women walk with water pots on their heads and keep chatting with their companions, they are very careful of the loads on their heads. Similarly, when a jhani engages in activities, they do not defile him because his mind abides in Brahman. Question. We are men living in the world and have one kind of grief or another. We pray for help and still are not satisfied. What to do? Answer. Trust God. If you surrender you must be able to abide by His will and not make grievance of what may not please you. Things may turn out different from what they are in appearance. Distress often leads men to faith in God. Question. I am a sinful man. Answer. Why think of yourself so? You have rightly thrown all responsibilities on God in whom you have faith and he will look after that. Have compassionate love for others but keep it secret. Don't show it or talk of it. If desires are fulfilled, don't be elated. If frustrated, don't be disappointed. The elation may be deceptive. It should be checked, for initial joy may end in final grief. After all, whatever happens you are unaffected still as you were. Question, but how can I help another with his problem, his troubles? Answer, what is the talk of another? There is only the one. Try to realize there is no I, no you, no he, only the one self which is all. If you believe in the problem of another, you are believing in something outside the self. You will help him best by realizing the oneness of everything rather than by outward activity. The ego pertains to all the waking activities, the consciousness, the intellect. In deep sleep where is the I? The intellect is still, the body is still and yet the self is there. It is the waking activities that veil the real self by making ego. The false self appears as the real self. Everything in this universe is run by one supreme power, but if a man will not keep to the destined path appointed for him, but strays beyond its limits then God punishes him and through that suffering he turns towards the self. But when the punishment goes he ceases to worship and again sins, thereby inviting an increased punishment. When he gets excited or anxious he may know that he is not on the destined path but is straying, for on the appointed path he will be peaceful and content. He should abide in the self and not seek to stray into desires, ambitions, etc. beyond what God gives him, 
but be egoless. Whose free will is it? You believe it is yours. You are beyond will and fate. Abide as that and you transcend them both. That is the meaning of conquering destiny by will. Fate can be conquered. Fate is the result of karma, but by Satsanga the bad Vasanas are conquered. His experiences are viewed in proper perspective. I am now enjoyer of karma's fruits. I was in the past and shall be in the future. Who is this I? Finding this I to be pure consciousness beyond karma and enjoyment, freedom and happiness are gained. There is then no effort, for the self is perfect and there is nothing to gain. So long as there is individuality, one is enjoyer and doer. But if it is lost, the divine will act and guide the course of events. Restrictions and discipline are for jiva and not for muktas. Free will is implied in the scriptural injunctions to be good. It implies overcoming fate. It is done by John C. chapter 4, verse 37 of the Gita. As the fire which is kindled reduces all fuel to ashes, O Arjuna, so does the fire of knowledge reduce all works to ashes. When anything happens, we are prone to attribute the same to something or someone else. However, the fact is that our experiences have already been created by ourselves and nothing happens which is more or less than what we deserve. What can others do to us? Others are not responsible for what happens to us. They are only instruments for what would happen to us some way or other. Let us be strong in faith and not succumb to fear. Whatever happens, happens according to our prarabdha. Let it exhaust itself. Evil intentions and evil actions will react themselves and not affect us simply because they desire it. One is required not to think of oneself, so why there be anxiety regarding others? Question. If a soul dies in babyhood or childhood, it does not seem fair because it has not had enough experience of life to win realization? Answer, you do not know the child's viewpoint. Yours is simply of the intellect. We and our children are all from God and in God. God takes care of us and our children. Animals can think like human beings. We must not imagine they are senseless creatures. Some who have associated in contact with people can understand words and conversations. He pointed to a cow and said she could think intelligently. Individual human beings have to suffer their karmas, but as far as manages to make the best of their karmas for his purpose. God manipulates the fruits of karma. He does not add or take away from it. The subconsciousness of man is a warehouse of good and bad karma. Isfera chooses from this warehouse what he sees will best suit the spiritual evolution at the time of each man, whether pleasant or painful. Thus there is nothing arbitrary. The realized man knows neither past, present, or future. He is above time for he lives in the timeless self. What is that is born? Not the true self. Once we are born into that it is final, that is the true and only birth the spiritual birth. The others are but fleeting incarnations of the Vasanas. If it were not for the body, we would not talk of the spirit being within us, we would be the true self. The illumined man will just watch and wait and see what happens. He lets things take their course. He resigns all to that absolute power, which you can call God karma, or what you like. There is no egoism in him. So be quiet. There is a sloka in Gita which says that he who acts without attachment to the senses and without egoism the sense I am doing this though he kills an enemy, does not make any karma. Similarly such an illuminated one is free from all past karma and from all past vasanas. How can there be karma or vasanas when the I, the ego, which caused or causes them has been destroyed? The illuminated man does not plan for the future and takes not forethought. Why should he? 
there is no sense of I in him any longer. The infinite power which is able to do things directs him. Question, I want to go to Mount Kailas. Answer, one can see these places only if destined, not otherwise, but after seeing all, there will still remain more places unvisited, if not in this hemisphere then in the other. Knowledge implies ignorance beyond what is known. Knowledge is always limited. Surrender and all will be well. Throw all the responsibility on God. Do not bear the burden. What can destiny do? If one surrenders to God, there will be no cause for anxiety. Nothing will affect you if protected by God. The sense of relief depends upon and proportionate to reliance on God or on self. Question, my work hinders me. Answer, if you have the right attitude, the kind of life you lead does not matter very much. Question, in this pure atmosphere the path is easy but in towns it is difficult. Answer, when you see the true self is it not a pure atmosphere? Let the body think what it wishes, but why should you think so? Only if you can keep quiet without engaging in any other pursuits also, it is very good. If that cannot be done, what is the use of being quiet? So long as one is obliged to be active, let him not give up attempts to realize the self. Even if a realized man were to destroy many lives, no sin can touch the pure soul. So too says the Gita. You are yourself the source of all your happiness whatsoever it be, and not external things. Even when you imagine that some external object has given you the happiness, you are mistaken. What happened really is that unconsciously the object brought you back for a flash to yourself, borrowed the happiness, and thus presented it to you. The happiness came as a shadow to you, why not look to the source, to the self, and realize it? Question, I am possessed by fears of disease and death. Answer, who gets disease? Do you get it? If you analyze what you are, you see that disease cannot affect you. What are you? Do you die? Can you die? Think of Atma, realize that. Question, I try but it does not remain in the mind long. Answer, practice makes perfect. Question, meanwhile. Answer, meanwhile there need not be suffering. Question, would the use of birth control appliances lead to immortality? Answer, you must go to root of things. Find out the true cause of birth and then stifle that. Let that which is born control itself. To whom is this birth? There is an ancient verse which says desires go on increasing and burning more fiercely as they are fed. So the only effective control is to check the causes within to check desires and thus become moral. Question, how to control lust, anger, etc. Answer, whose are these passions? Find out if you remain as the self, there will be found nothing apart from the self then there will be no need to control, etc. If a man's happiness is due to outer causes and external possessions, then a man devoid of possessions should have no happiness whatever. Does real experience show this? No. For in deep sleep man is then devoid of all possessions including his body, yet instead of being unhappy he enjoys blissful release. Does not everyone desire to sleep soundly? Hence happiness is not due to external causes, but to returning into the self. When the pure eye, the reality, is forgotten, all miseries crop up. When that is held fast, the miseries do not affect the person. Emergence from self has been the cause of all misery. Snake in Ashram Hall fell down from the roof at night when sleeping. Maharshi ordered the men to take a lantern to light its path to the door and not to harm its saying, regarding the snakes which infested the place, we have come to their abode as guests and so we have no business to molest them. Let us leave them in peace. Question. What is your opinion about social reform? 
Answer. Self-reform automatically brings about social reform. Confine yourself to self-reform. Social reform will take care of itself. In 1938 Maharshi said to Dr. Nambayar who spoke to him about his maladies Maharshi had bleeding piles then. I am tired of this body. Question. Is a teacher needed? Answer. As in all physical and mental training a competent teacher is sought, so in matters spiritual the same rule applies. Paul Brunton to himself, My writings often come unexpectedly to me and also disjointedly. Often a paragraph or sentence belonging to the end or middle of a writing would come to me before the earlier parts. Chapter 16. Sagehood as an Ideal the realized man finds himself in others, they are not different from himself. With wise men he is wise, but with ignorant men he becomes ignorant, with children he will play and with the learned he will be scholarly. The meditation on the Guru's face or form is only for beginners. The advanced disciples should concentrate inwards on the self, this is equal to meditating on the Guru, for he is one with the self. The self-realized one is not to be regarded as an idler or lazy drone. His powers develop incessantly and in course of time he may develop and manifest occult powers, if that is his karma. This will be merely a sort of sport for the jhani in the objective world, as he has no interest or particular purpose to serve. But if his prarabdha is otherwise the siddhis do not manifest, and the wise man, who habitually and by nature rests in the Atman, does not seek any other path. When one has realized, a universal life current takes possession of him and uses him henceforth. His own separate will is gone. He becomes but an instrument in its hands. This is the real self-surrender. This is the highest Kundalini. This is real Bhakti. This is Jhana. A realized one sends out waves of spiritual influence in his aura, which draw many people towards him. Yet he may sit in a cave and maintain complete silence. We may listen to lectures upon truth and come away with hardly any grasp of the subject, but to come into contact with a realized one, though he speaks nothing, will give much more grasp of the subject. He does not ever need to go out among the public. If necessary, he can use others as instruments. Is a guru needed for spiritual progress? Yes, but the guru is within you, he is one with your own self. All lectures and books do little good and are of use only for beginners to point out on the way. The real service is done in meditation. One sitting still and silent, as mentioned in the poem by the Tamil Saint Tamanavar can influence a whole country. The force of meditation is infinitely more powerful than speech or writings. One who sits in silence meditating on the self will draw a whole lot of people to him without his going out to anyone. Even books like the Bhagavad Gita, Light on the Path, must be given up to find the self by looking within. Even the Gita says meditate upon the self. It does not say meditate upon the book, the Gita. Question, Prajananda has written me to ask you if he can become your disciple. Answer, all these gurus and disciples exist only from the disciple's standpoint. To the self-realize there is neither guru nor disciple, only oneself. The guru is the disciple. Only because you have the body consciousness do you regard him as separate. Question, but a guru can give help? Answer, certainly, yes, he can help. Question, well, shall I say faith and love towards you are all he needs to show? Answer, yes. By repeated practice one can become accustomed to turning inward and finding the self. One must make incessant effort always until one has permanently realized. After that all effort ceases, the state becomes natural, the Supreme takes possession of the man with unbroken current. Until it has become permanently natural, your habitual state know that you have not realized the self, only glimpsed it. 
The soul that realizes the self may yet be connected with the working body, senses and mind without however identifying itself with that body. Question. Is there something to be transferred at initiation? Answer. Transfer means eradication of the sense of being the disciple. The master does it. Not that the man was something at one time and later metamorphosed into another. If the individual is sought he is nowhere to be found. Such is the guru. Such is Adakshnamurti. What did he do? He was silent. The disciples appeared before him. He maintained silence. The doubts of the disciples were dispelled which means that they lost their individual identities. Such is the Guru and such is true initiation. That is jhana and not the verbiage usually associated with it. Silence is the most potent form of work. However vast and emphatic the sastras may be, they fail in their effect. The Guru is quiet and peace prevails in all his silence and is more vast and emphatic than all the sastras put together. These questions arise because of the feeling that having been here so long, heard so much, exerted so hard, I have not gained anything. The work proceeding within is not apparent. In fact, the Guru is with one always. Tei Manavar says, O Lord, coming with me all along these births, never abandoning me and finally rescuing me, such is the experience of realization. The Srimad Bhagavad Gita says the same thing in a different way. We too are not only now but have ever been so. Question, is not grace the gift of the Guru? Answer, God, grace and Guru are all synonymous and also eternal and immanent. Is not the self already within? Is it for the Guru to bestow it by his look? If the Guru thinks so, he does not deserve the name. The books say that there are so many initiations such as haste, to diksha initiation by hand, sparsa diksha initiation by touch, mental dikshas etc. They say that the guru makes some rites with fire, water, japa, mantras etc. and call such fantastic performances, initiations as if the sishya becomes ripe only after such processes. Kiru's grace is worth more than study and meditation. It is primary, all others are secondary. The Kiru's grace is like a hand extended to help you out of water. Question. Is divine grace really necessary? Cannot a man's honest efforts bring him to the goal? Answer. Yes, it is so, but the gift of such grace is vouchsafed only to him who is a true devotee or to a yogin who has striven hard and ceaselessly on the path. The Guru's grace is the same as God's grace, because Guru is not different from him. Question. I pray for your grace because human efforts are unavailing without grace. Answer. Both are necessary. There is the sun shining but you must turn and look at it in order to get a glimpse of the sun. Similarly individual efforts are necessary as well as grace. Grace is within you, if it is external it is useless. Grace is the self, you are never out of its operation. If you remember the cure you are prompted to do so by the self. Is not grace already there? Is there a moment when grace is not operating in you? Your remembrance of the Kiru is the forerunner of grace. The latter is both the response and stimulus. That is the self and that is grace. There is no cause for anxiety. Question, but is not a Kiru's grace or God's grace necessary for one's progress in the Vichara? Answer, yes, but the inquiry that you are making is itself Kiru's grace or God's grace. Question, what is the path? Answer, the method may be anything. From whatever directions the pilgrims foregather, they must enter the Kaaba only by one passage. Question, people speak of different methods. Which method is easiest? Answer, the methods appear easy according to the nature of the individual. It depends upon what he has practiced before. Question, how long is a cure necessary? 
answer, as long as there is ignorance. The Guru, otherwise God is manifesting, guides the devotee saying that God is in you and he is the self. This leads to introversion of mind and finally to realization. Effort is necessary until the state of realization. Even then the self should spontaneously become evident. Till that state of spontaneity effort in some form is required. Question, how to meet appointed Guru? Answer, intense meditation brings about the consummation. The sage's glance has a purifying effect. If you understand your own reality, the rishis will be clear to you. There is only one master and that is the self. Sanat Kumara, the one initiator works through all the gurus in the world. There is thus no difference between them and him. He bestows his teaching and initiation, which is the highest in the silence. Question, does the guru give help deliberately? Answer, guru's grace works automatically, spontaneously. The disciple gets precisely the help he requires. Question, you say that association with the wise and service of them is required of the disciple. Answer, yes, the first really means association with the unmanifest sat or absolute existence, but as very few can do that, they have to take the second best which is association with the manifest sat, in other words the guru. Association with the sages should be made because the thoughts are so persistent. The sage has already overcome the mind and remains in peace. His proximity helps to bring about such condition in others. Otherwise there is no meaning in seeking his company. The guru provides the needed strength unseen by others. Service is primarily to abide in the self, but it also includes to make the guru's body comfortable and to look after his place of abode. Also contact with the Guru is necessary, but this means spiritual contact. If a disciple finds the Guru internally, then it does not matter where he goes. Staying here or elsewhere must be understood to be the same and to have the same effect. A Jani does not feel oppressed by his body. Are those Jani's who lived in bodies and wrote sacred books no longer Jani's? Guru is the self after all but manifests as the external guru at a lower stage of the mind's development. A spiritually minded man takes God for his guru believing that God is everywhere. Later God brings in contact with a personal guru whose grace enables him to feel that his self is the reality in guru. Question, cannot a guru give us realization as a gift? Answer, guru is a very powerful aid on the path, but your effort also is required. It is essential that it is you who should see the sun. Can spectacles see the sun for you? You have to see your true nature. Question. Will not a competent Kiru be a great help to me? Answer. Yes. Go on working with the light you have now available and you will meet your Kiru as he will be seeking you himself. Who wants physical immortality? We should want only one thing to realize and be in the self and to get off this body. Why then prolong life in it? His Highness the Maharaja of Mysore visited the Maharshi for fifteen minutes, remaining silent almost the whole time. At lunch that day when the devotees were talking about the incident Maharshi remarked, He is a highly advanced soul. He is a Dhyanaka. What need is there for talk when a knower meets another knower? It suffices for their eyes to meet in glance, when immediately they turn inwards in response and recognition. Vocal conversation is then unnecessary. What is this talk of Kuru's grace? Does the Kuru hold you by the hand and whisper something in your ear? You imagine him to be what you are yourself. Because you are with the body, you think that he is also a body to do something tangible to you, but his work lies within. How is a guru gained? If a devotee prays to God unselfishly, 
God who is immanent in his grace takes pity on the loving devotee and manifests himself as a being according to the devotee standard. The devotee thinks that he is a man and expects relationship as between bodies but the guru who is God or self-incarnate works from within, helps the man to see the error of his ways, guides him in the right path until he realizes the self within. After such a realization he feels, I was so worried before, I am after all the self, the same as before but not affected by anything. Where is he who was miserable? He is not to be found. What should we do now? Only act up to the words of the Master. Work within. The Guru is both within and without. So he creates conditions to drive you inward and prepares the interior to drag you to the center. Thus he gives you a push from without and exerts a pull from within, so that you may be fixed at the center. In sleep you are centered within, simultaneously with waking up your mind rushes out, thinking this, that and all else. This must be checked. It is possible only for the agent who can work both within and without. Can he be identified with a body? We think that the world can be conquered with our efforts. When frustrated externally and driven internally we feel that there is a power higher than man. The existence of the higher power must be admitted and recognized. The ego is a very powerful elephant and cannot be brought under control by anyone less than a lion, who is no other than the guru in this instance, whose very look makes the elephant tremble and die. We will know in due course that our glory lies where we cease to exist. In order to gain the state, one should surrender oneself, saying, Lord, thou art my refuge. The master then sees this man is in the fit state to receive guidance and so guides him. The best instruction is heart-to-heart -heart speech in silence. Question, when after long struggles one attains, is the attainment of his own act or action of the spirit current? Answer, it is the action of the current. Question, it is claimed that the grace of Isfera is necessary. Answer, we are a sphera. By seeing ourselves as him we are having his grace. His nature is grace. Personal example and personal instruction are the most helpful aids on the path while practice is better than books. Question, does Bhagavan make the way easy for aspirants by himself becoming a kind of vicarious tapas so that they need not go through actual hardships? Answer, if that were so, everyone will easily reach the goal. Each one must work for himself. A higher power is leading you, be led by the same. It knows what to do and how to do it. Trust to it. Question, have I your grace and benediction? Answer, why should you doubt it? Dana is acquired by Sat Sangha or rather its atmosphere. Leave it to him. Surrender unreservedly either because you admit your inability and require a higher power to help you or investigate. Go into the source and merge in self. God never forsakes one who has surrendered. Incident, question, what is it? Answer, I stepped unwittingly on the scorpion and hurt it, so it stung me and returned to remind me of its existence. Question, is grace necessary? Answer, certainly. But grace is all along there. It is the self and is not to be acquired. Swami Siddhaswarananda of the Ramakrishna Mission told me, one morning at 7 a.m., when I was sitting in the hall, I asked Maharshi about a certain verse of the Namal were embodying his cosmic consciousness vision. The Maharshi replied, I shall repeat some similar verses by another poet of the Tamil language. Attend to my way of repeating the words, and you will be able to understand, although you are a Malay Ali from the West Coast. The verse had reference to divine love. A shaft of sunlight fell through the window onto his face. Hardly had he read out two lines when I noticed beads of tears trickling down his face. 
Then he stopped repeating the words, as though he felt too keenly and emotionally the meaning of the words. There was an atmosphere of love around him. For two or three hours he remained silent, the rest of the poem unread, the book up on his knee, his eyes open in a trance of divine emotion. The Swami had formerly held the impression that the Maharshi was dry, cold and different type. This experience showed how deeply the Maharshi can feel. One who sees the self has the power to help others, to see their selves. He is the real Guru and that is the only initiation. Question. Can the Guru make disciple realize self by transmitting his own power to him? Answer. Yes. Guru does not bring about realization. He merely removes the obstacles to it, for the self is always realized. The Maharshi's evidence taken by the local court in respect to a lawsuit by Paramal Swami in December 1936. Question. To which of the four ashram stages do you belong? Answer. To one beyond the four commonly known. Question. Are there others beside yourself? Answer, there may be. Question, you renounced worldly life but here there is property in your name in the Raman Ashram. Why? Answer, I do not seek for it. Property is thrust on me. I do not love or hate it. Question, is it given to you? Answer, it is given to the Swami whoever he may be but the body is considered Swami in the world. That body is this. It reduces itself to myself. Question, do you give you paidish? Answer, visitors ask questions and I answer them as I know. It is for them to treat my words as they please. Question, is it you paidish? Answer, how can I say how others take it? Question, have you disciples? Answer, I do not give you paidish in the ceremonial manner. For instance, keeping a kumba, making puja worship to it and whispering mantra to the person. He may call himself my disciple or devotee. I do not consider anyone to be my disciple. I had never sought you paidish from anyone, nor do I give ceremonial you paidish. If people call themselves my disciples, I do not approve or disapprove. In my view all are alike. What can I say to them? I do not call myself a disciple or a guru. Question. Why did you approve the building of Skandasram on the hill, which was temple land without previously obtaining permission from authorities? Answer. Guided by the same power which made me come and reside on the hill. Question. You renounced money. How is it donations are accepted by the ashram? Answer, this practice grew up at a later stage because a few associates began to use my name to collect funds. I did not approve of their action nor check them. So it is going on. I do not desire that contributions should be accepted, but people do not heed that advice. I do not want to give ineffective advice. I do not therefore check them. Question, why do you not sign your name? Answer, by what name am I to be known? I myself do not know. People have given me several names from time to time, since my arrival here, but the author of Self-Realization has given his answer to this question. Question, you personally receive and touch one kind of offering, for example fruits, why should you not receive money also? Answer, I cannot eat money. What shall I do with it? Question. Have you no objection to the length of stay of any visitors? Answer. No. If I do not find it agreeable, I shall go away. That is all. Question. There are gurus for each ashram stage. Is there a guru for the stage which transcends the fourth? Answer. Yes. Question. But you do not admit one. Answer. There is guru for everyone. I admit Guru for me also. Question, who? Answer, the self. Question, for whom? Answer, for myself. 
The guru may be internal or external. He may reveal himself internally or communicate externally. Question: Can those in this transcendent stage own property? Answer: There is no restriction for them. They may do what they please. Sukha is said to have married and begotten children. Question: Then he is like a grihasta. Answer: I have already said he is above the four recognized ashrams. Question: But if they can marry, own property, etc., they are only grihasta's householders. Answer: That may be your view. Question: Can they convey their property to others? Answer: They may or may not. All depends on their prarabdha. Question: Is there any karma for them? Answer: Their conduct is not regulated according to any rules or codes. Question: When visitors want to stay here, do they take your permission? Answer: Permission from the management is permission from me. The visitors came here for me. The management is for me. Wherever there is mutual agreement, I do not interfere. When visitors come here and I admit them, will others dare to go against my wishes? My consent is implied. When Maharshi is engaged in giving trataka, I to I darshan. To a devotee, sometimes he actually becomes cross-eyed, with this curious difference that the right eye remains looking steadily ahead, whilst the left eye gazes at an oblique angle, and the effect is rather weird and mysterious. First, he lifts his gaze to the ceiling, and then slowly drops it to level before conveying trataka. The cosmic mind manifesting in some rare being is able to affect the linkage in others of the individual weak mind with the universal strong mind of the inner recesses. Such a rare being is called the guru or god in manifestation. Question. Is a man to engage in teaching his knowledge, however imperfect? Answer: If his prarabdha karma be that way, the jani says, "I am the body." The ajani says, "I am the body." What is the difference? I am is the truth. The body is the limitation. The ajani limits the I with the body. I in sleep is apart from body. The same I now too in the waking state. The thought to be within the body, I is without the body. The wrong notion is not I am the body. I says so. Body is insentient and cannot say so. The mistake lies in thinking that I is what I is not. I cannot be inert body. The body's movements are confounded with I's movements, and misery is the result. Whether the body works or not, I remains free and happy. The ajani's eye is identified with the body only. There is the whole error. The ajani's eye includes the body and what is all. Some intermediate entity arises and gives rise to confusion. Question: Is not grace more effective than abhyasa constant practice? Answer: The cure simply helps you in the eradication of ignorance. Question. I am unable to make as many visits to you as I want. Answer: You need not come. You need not feel disheartened about it. Wherever you are, do not stray from yourself. Question: Do you have thoughts? Answer: I usually have no thoughts. Question: But when you are reading. Answer: Then I have thoughts. Question: And when someone asks you a question. Answer. Then too, I have thoughts when replying, not otherwise. Krishna's statement that he is reborn from time to time whenever world needs is a sop to ignorance which mistakes him for the body. He is reality, hence unborn. Once after I prostrated the Maharshi, he said, "Why do this? It is only a formality. It is not necessary." I must answer any and every question unless I do so. I am not great. I am not endowed with television. God has not bestowed that gift on me. What shall I do? How can I answer all questions? People call me Maharshi and treat me like this, but I do not see myself as a Maharshi. 
In the Christian Trinity, the Son of God is the cure or God manifest who explains to a devotee that the Holy Spirit is immanent everywhere. Question, how can I keep the idea of that real state always before me? Answer, because you are not able to keep that single idea because you are not firm because you think you are a body. The idea that you must go to Turavana Malai and see Maharshi is only a function of the intellect. No help is required. You are already in your original state. How can anyone help you to arrive where you already are? The help given is really to clear out your wrong notions. The great men, the gurus can help only by removing the obstacles in your way. A child and Johnny are in some ways similar. The child ceases to think of incidents after they have passed off. Thus it shows that they do not leave deep impressions on the child's mind. So too with the Johnny. Question, are saints who live in remote forests and Tibetan mountains still helpful to the world? Answer, quite. Realization of self is the greatest help that can be rendered to humanity, no matter where the saints live. Question, is it not necessary for the saints to mix with the people in order to help them? Answer, the realized being does not see world as different from himself. The help given by him is imperceptible but it is still there. A saint helps the whole of humanity unknown to it. The silence of a sage gives permanent benefit and instruction to humanity, whereas lectures entertain individuals for a few hours without improving them. Silence is eloquence unceasing. Dakshinamrti is the ideal. He taught his rishi disciples by silence. Question but would it not be more effective if he mixed with them? Answer, there are no others to mix with. The self is the only reality. Question, but nowadays disciples must be created sought after. Answer, that is a sign of ignorance. The power which created you created the world and can take care of both also. Question, do I not need a guide to see God? Answer, who is your guide to see Ramana Bhagavan? With whose guidance do you see the world daily? Just as you are able to see the world yourself, so also you will be able to see yourself if you earnestly strive to do so, yourself alone being your guide in that quest also. Question, is the Kiru absolutely necessary? Answer, take Kiru to be real self and yourself to be the individual self. So long as duality persists in you, the Kiru is necessary. Because you identify yourself with body you think Kiru to be somebody, but you are not the body nor is the Kiru. This knowledge that you are self and so is the Kiru is gained by what you call realization. Question, how can one know a competent Kiru? Answer, by the peace of mind in his presence and by the sense of respect you feel for him. Question. What is the use of people like you who sit still doing nothing when the world is in great trouble? Answer, a self-realized being cannot help benefiting the world. His very existence bestows the highest good to the world. You imagine the Kiru to be what you are yourself. Because you are with the body, you imagine him to do something tangible to you. His work lies within. The devotee thinks the guru is a man and expects a relationship as between bodies, but the guru who is self-incarnate works from within. The guru creates conditions to drive you inward and prepares the interior to drag you to the center. Thus he gives a push and exerts a pull from within, so that you may be fixed at the center. In sleep you are centered within, but on awaking your mind rushes out, thinking this and that. This must be checked. Question, Swami Vivekananda speaks of the Guru transferring spirituality? Answer, is there a substance to be transferred? Transfer really means the eradication of the sense of being the disciple. Question, must the Guru have a human body? Answer, because you identify yourself with your body you raise the question. Find out if you are the body. 
The Gita says that those who cannot understand the transcendental nature of Sri Krishna are fools deluded by ignorance. The Master appears in order to dispel that ignorance. As Tayyamanavar puts it, he appears to dispel the ignorance of a man, just as a deer is used as a decoy to capture the lion in the jungle. He has to appear with a body in order to eradicate our ignorance, the I am the body idea. Question, what is all this talk of masters etc. guiding the destinies of the world? Answer, had it not been said, would these people have diverted their outgoing minds from the world and turned inward to meditate? That is the purpose of the mention of masters and their hierarchy by the theosophists. By a rishi sitting in one place, all things can be done by him if he wills. He can bring on wars or end them, but he knows there is a cosmic and karmic process going on, so he won't interfere unwisely. What does the guru do? Does he hand over realization to disciple? Is not the self always realized? By remaining in contact with realized sages, the man gradually loses the ignorance until its removal is complete. The eternal self is thus revealed. Realization is eternal and is not newly brought about by the Kiru. He merely helps in the removal of ignorance. The disciple surrenders himself to the Master. That means that there is no vestige in individuality retained by disciple and thus no cause of misery. Without understanding it a right people think the Guru teaches the disciple tact, Vam, see, thou art that, as something to make him more powerful than anything else. The man is already vain, what will be the case if the very same eye grows up enormously? He will be still more foolish and ignorant. This false I must perish. Its annihilation is the fruit of Guru's service. Question, how may I get near my master? Answer, are you the personality? Does the self say the master is far away? Question, does education make a sage more useful to the world? Answer, even a learned man must bow before an illiterate sage. Education is learned ignorance. Question, is contact between spiritual leaders of East and West possible? Is India the spiritual world center? Answer, spirit is unlimited and formless. The spiritual center is the same. There is only one such center. Whether in west or east, the center cannot differ. It has no locality. Being unlimited, it includes leaders, world, forces of destruction and construction. You speak of contact because you are thinking of embodied beings as leaders. The spiritual men are not bodies, they are not aware of their bodies. They are spirit limitless and formless. There is always unity among them. These questions cannot arise if self is realized. Question. Theosophists meditate to seek masters. Answer. The master is within. Meditation is for removing the ignorance that he is without. If he be a stranger who is coming you away, he is bound to disappear also. Where is the use of a transient being like that? However, so long as you think you are an individual or body, so long the master is necessary and will appear with a body. When this wrong identification ceases, the master will be found to be self. Question. Did you give your mother salvation at her death bed? Answer. Can anybody give liberation to another? No. One's own jhana alone can give one liberation. Silence is perpetual speaking. Ordinarily speech hinders the heart-to-heart -heart talk between the guru and disciple. So long as you think you are the individual, you also believe in God. On worshipping God, God appears to you as Guru. Surrender your own self to the one from whom grace is sought. On serving Guru, he manifests as the self. This is the rationale for obtaining grace. There are methods of initiation, diksha, or baptism whereby the Guru will help disciples. 
Yet the former does not consciously set about to do this as he is one with the disciple from his viewpoint. He does it unconsciously. It may be will power by sight, by the tejas fire, splendor of the guru, by a touch on the head. But whichever way it is done, there is a change in the disciple which is noticeable later. Question, Meher Baba says he is the avatar incarnation. Is that true? Answer, what have I to say? This is a question that seekers after truth need not consider. People that are in the lower rungs of the ladder waste their energies over all such questions. Everyone is an avatar of God. One who knows the truth sees everyone else as a manifestation of God. In every face he sees God. The Guru sees all people as the one self. To him there are none who are ignorant. He finds no difference between them and himself. The realized one does not think or plan for the future. He lets the future take care of itself. For him the future is in the present. Yes, the Guru is necessary. He shows the road to self and carries a light for you. A person of realization will be looking at things but does not see them. Men like Buddha and Jesus were not ordinary self-realized individuals. They come from higher planes, but such avatars come for the masses. The striving few do not need them. Question, how does Guru Kripa Guru's grace lead to self-realization? Answer, an aspirant begins with dissatisfaction. Not content with the world, he seeks the satisfaction of desires. Praise to God, his mind is purified. He longs to know God more than to satisfy his carnal desires. Then God's grace begins to manifest. He takes the form of a guru and appears to the devotees, teaches him the truth, purifies the mind by his teachings and with contact the devotee's mind gains strength and is able to turn inward. With meditation it is purified still further and remains still without the least ripple. That expands is the self. The Guru is both exterior and interior. From the exterior he gives a push to the mind to turn inward. From the interior he pulls the mind towards the self and helps the quietness of the mind. That is the creep of grace. There is no difference between God, Guru and self. A Guru's help is necessary and useful to start you on the inquiry, but you yourself must pursue the inquiry. Question, why do not the Mahatmas help? Answer, how do you know they do not help? Public speeches, physical activity, and material help are all outweighed by the silence of the Mahatmas. These accomplish more than others. Question, is there a spiritual higher, archy of all the original propounders of religions watching the spiritual welfare of the humans? Answer, let them be or let them be not. It is only a surmise at the best. No atman be done with speculations. One person might admit such a hierarchy, another may not. But no one can gainsay the atma. The hierarchy cannot exist apart from the self-realization of the self which is the one goal. Question, do you not feel a slap given to you? Is there not differentiation there? Where then is jhana? Answer. A man under chloroform or drink does not feel a slap. Is he a jhani? Jhana is not inconsistent with the feeling of a slap. Question, I am reluctant to leave your presence and return to my distant home. Answer, think that you are always in my presence. That will make you feel right. Chapter 17, The Doctrine of Non-Causality these questions as to fate and free will and which is stronger arise only to those who fail to look into the root of both. To know the cause is never to entertain thoughts of either fate or free will. Body is born again and again. We wrongly identify ourselves with the body and hence imagine we are reincarnated constantly. No. We must identify ourselves with the true self. The realized one enjoys unbroken consciousness, never broken by death, 
how can he die? Or by birth? Only those who think I am the body talk of reincarnation. To those who know I am the self there is no rebirth. Reincarnations exist only so long as there is ignorance. There is no incarnation either now before or hereafter. This is the truth. Question. The Vedas contain cosmogony. The absolute Brahman is said to have created a kasa which later became all the elements in the universe. How can something issue out of nothing? Again Swami Vivekananda was questioned about the beginning of time, he raised a counter-question as a bar. How can you fix a point at which eternally running time can begin? He declared the question illogical. His answer may be logical, but does not satisfy the mind. Answer. The cosmogony you mention is not the essence of reality of the one absolute and the unreality of all else. What is taught about the world's origin is but a supplemental reason. These passages are for people who desire to get a fuller idea of the world and who inquire about its creation and destruction. But if there is a conflict between the essential teaching and them in your view, reject them and accept the latter. Scriptures arise to suit varying conditions, but their spirit is the same. Questions are asked from a certain standpoint and the answers are given from the same. The scriptures are useful to indicate the existence of the higher power the self and the way to gain it. Their essence is that alone, and when it is realized, they are useless. They are voluminous because adapted to the development of the seeker. As one rises in the scale he finds the portions he has transcended to be steps to the higher stage, etc. Because people could not understand the truth of their eternal selves, they are eager to know what lies beyond, heaven, hell, reincarnation, etc. Yet after wandering everywhere else they must in the end return to the self alone. Then why not now? After all, the other worlds require the self as spectator. Their validity is only of the same degree as his. There is no creation or destruction in the Absolute. Only when the mind appears, does the world appear. Both creation and destruction are movements but not in the Absolute substratum. They are of Shakti and eternal. Question. Being always sat, Chit Ananda, why does God place us in difficulties? Why did he create? Answer, does God come and tell you that he has placed you in difficulties? It is you who say so. It is again wrong. If that disappears, there will be no one to say that God created. That which is does not even say I am nor does any doubt arise that I am not. Only in such a case should one be reminding himself I am. Otherwise not. For instance, does a man say always I am a man? He does not. On the other hand, if a doubt arises if he is a cow or a buffalo, he has to remind himself that he is not a cow etc., but I am a man. This would never happen. Similarly also with one's own existence and realization. Question, why did the self manifest as this miserable world? Answer, in order that you might seek it. Your eyes cannot see themselves. Place a mirror before them. Then only they see themselves. Similarly with creation. See yourself first and then see the whole world as the self. Chapter 18 The Mind There is no entity by the name of mind. Because of the emergence of thoughts, we surmise something from which they start. That we term mind. When we probe to see what it is, there is nothing like it. After it has vanished, peace will be found to remain eternal. The thinking manas or discriminating vijana faculty are mere names. Be it ego, mind or intellect, it is the same. Whose mind? Whose intellect? Egos. Is ego real? No. We can found the ego and call it intellect or mind. Utterance of words is not worship. Denudation of thoughts is jhana. It is absolute existence. 
People insist on asking me questions and so I must reply, but the truth is beyond words. Question, how to check the mine? Answer, will a thief hand over a thief? Will the mind find itself? The mind cannot seek the mind. You have ignored what is real and are holding on to the mind, which is unreal, and are also using it to try to find what it is. Was there mind in your sleep? It was not. It is now here. It is therefore impermanent. Can the mind be found by you? Mind is not you. You think you are the mind and therefore ask me how it is checked. If it is there it can be checked. But it is not. Understand this truth by search. The search of the unreality is useless. Therefore seek the reality, in other words the self. That is the way to rule over the mind. There is only one thing real. The others are only appearances. Diversity is not its nature. We are reading the printed characters on paper but ignore the paper which is the background. Similarly you are taken up by the manifestations of mind and do not hold the background. Whose fault is it? The essence of the mind is only awareness or consciousness. When the ego, however, dominates it, it functions as the reasoning, thinking or sensing faculty. The cosmic mind, being not limited by the ego, has nothing separate from itself and is therefore only aware. This is what the Bible means by I am that I am. Question, why do you not preach to set people on the right path? Answer, you have already decided that I do not preach. Do you know who I am and what preaching is? How do you know that I am not doing it? Does preaching consist in mounting a platform and haranguing people around? Preaching is simply communication of knowledge. It may be done in silence, too. What do you think of someone listening to a speech for an hour and going away unimpressed? Compare him with another who sits in the holy presence and goes away after some time with his outlook on life totally changed. Which is better? To preach loudly without effect or to sit silently sending forth intuitive forces to play on others? Again, how does speech arise? There is unmanifest abstract knowledge from whence the ego gives rise to thoughts and then words. In this order of descent words are therefore the great-grandchildren of the original source. If the word can produce effect, how much more powerful should preaching through silence be? Judge for yourself. The true state is consciousness without content. The Western psychologists who deny this and say consciousness must have an object are quite correct so far as the individual and mental consciousness is concerned. Without the mind, consciousness has no individuality as the body is something inert, but they are incorrect when they apply it to the universal being. When someone asked him, I suppose you have realized God, he remained silent, his eyes gazing into vacancy. When the baffled questioner departed, Maharshi explained to his disciples that the answering of such questions is useless and would lead to endless talk. The meaning or significance of I is God. The experience of I am is to be still. Mount of silence is not shutting up the mouth. It is eternal speech. That state which transcends speech and thought is Mauna. Question, how to achieve it? Answer, hold something firmly and trace it back to its source. By concentration, mount a silence results. When practice becomes natural, it will end in mauna. Meditation without mental activity is mauna. Subjugation of mind is meditation. Deep meditation is eternal speech. Question, how to do all this? Answer, the lack of the feeling that we are the self is the root cause of the trouble. Leave off thoughts and be just be. It is the thoughts alone that create the hindrance, they are the trouble. Find out to whom the thoughts occur, so long as you think that a wrong self exists, it will appear to do so, but find out where it arises and it will go. 
Those who have discovered great truths have done so in the still depth of the self. Question. The difficulty is to keep the thoughtless state and yet do the necessary thinking for duties. Answer. He that thinks is yourself. Let action take place of its own accord. Why associate yourself with the difficulty? When you have to go outdoors you just lift your feet and go without thinking about it. So gradually this state becomes automatic and thinking when necessary arises and disappears of its own accord. Intuition works when there is no thought and intuition will guide you. Those who have made big discoveries have made them not when they were anxious about them but in the stillness by intuition rather than thinking. Mental activity ceases with answering the self-inquiry. Even if you are thinking about God, it is still an activity and must be given up. The question of a char emerges in God and then ceases to think about Him. Self-realization is the cessation of thoughts and all mental activity. Thoughts are like bubbles upon the surface of the sea. The sea symbolizes the self. The false ego is associated with objects. The subject is alone the reality. The world is seen by the mind's reflected light. The moon shines by the reflected light of the sun. When the sun has set, the moon is useful for displaying objects. But when the sun rises no one needs the moon, even though it is visible in the sky. So it is with mind and heart. The mind is used for seeing objects. Intellect is a tool of the self which uses it for measuring variety. It is not without self. How could there be manifestations of intellect without its seat existing? Question, where are memory and forgetfulness located? Answer, in the chitta intellect. People like inventors searching for new material inventions make their discoveries in a state of self-forgetfulness. It is in a condition of deep intellectual concentration that this forgetfulness of the ego arises and the invention is revealed. This is also a way of developing intuition. Hence a sharp and concentrated intellect is useful and even essential in material matters but the revelation or intuition takes its own time to arise and one must await it. The most valuable thing in the ocean lies on its floor. The pearl is so small a thing yet so valuable and so difficult to procure. Similarly the self is like the pearl. To find it you must dive deep down into the silence deeper and ever deeper until it is reached. Question. Is the state of unconsciousness close to infinite being? Answer. Consciousness alone exists. He who knows the self has nothing more to do. Henceforth the infinite power will do all further actions that may be necessary through him. Nor has he any more thoughts. During meditation that is directed towards the self, the thoughts actually die down of their own accord. Meditation can be directed to different objects, but when directed to the true self, it is sent to the highest object, or rather the subject. Thoughts are our enemy. When we are free of thoughts, we are naturally blissful. The gap between two thoughts is our true state, it is the real self. Get rid of thoughts, be empty of them, be in a state of perpetual thoughtlessness. Then you are consciously self-existent. Thoughts, desires, and all qualities are alien to our true nature. The West may praise a man as a great thinker. But what is that? True greatness is to be free of thoughts. The true answer to the question, who am I, does not come in thoughts. All thoughts disappear, even the thinker himself disappears. Being is our nature. So what have we defined? When we know ourselves, we are not troubled by thoughts or desires any longer. These are not our true state. We have not to find ourselves, but simply to be ourselves, to be what we truly are, free from thoughts and egoism. To attain this self-realization, the means are a. The mind should be diverted from its objects. The objective vision of the world must cease. 
be, the mind's internal operation also must be put an end to. c. Thus the mind must be rendered and must continue characterless. Finally d. It must rest in pure vichara. Silence is never-ending speech. Vocal speech obstructs silent speech. More things are achieved by silence and more thoughts are conveyed by silence to a wider world. All disturbances by oral questions and answers while apparently benefiting the questioner and a few listeners in this hall actually obstructs, retards and interrupts silent communication of thought waves to the thousands of spiritual aspirants all over the world. Any sadhaka, therefore, who comes to me for inquiry and elucidation would amply benefit himself and others by sitting before me silently and absolutely speechless. Those forces are the greatest and most effective which are invisible, for instance the ether, the electric current, etc. Any inquiry you desire to make, give it to your mind or thought, you will readily find the answer in your own mind. The most effective help is with silence. Thoughts are predispositions accumulated in innumerable former births. Their annihilation must be the aim. To be free from them is purity. Man is deluded by the intermingling of conscious self within sentient body. This delusion must cease. The ever-present self needs no efforts for realization, but delusion alone is to be removed. Question. Thoughts are not real then. Answer. Quite so. When camphor burns, no residue is left. The mind is the camphor. When it has resolved itself into the self without leaving the slightest trace, it is realization. Mind is a bundle of thoughts having its origin in consciousness or self. Thoughts are not real. The only reality is the self. The enduring background free from thoughts, the expanse devoid of thoughts, is the self. Mind in its purity is the self. What you call mind is an illusion. It starts after the I thought. Mind is only a bundle of thoughts. Thoughts have their root in the I thought. You cannot without the gross or subtle senses be aware of the body or the mind. Still you can be without these senses. In that state you are either asleep or aware of the self only. That awareness of self is ever there. Remain what you are and your question will not arise. That which is beyond the ego is the consciousness, the self. In sleep the mind is neutral but not destroyed. That which is neutral Leia reappears. But the mind which is destroyed cannot reappear. The aim must be to destroy it and not sink into Leia. In the peace of meditation Leia happens but it is not enough. The true destruction is the non-recognition of the mind as being apart from self. Even now the mind is not. Recognize this. Question. There is nothing to be seen in the real. Answer. Because you are accustomed to identify yourself with the body and the sight with the eyes, therefore you say you do not see anything. What is there to be seen? Who is to see? How to see? There is only one consciousness which manifesting as I thought identifies itself with the body, projects itself through the eyes and sees the objects around. The individual is limited in the waking state and expects to see something different. The evidence of his senses will be the seal of authority. But he would not admit that the seer, the seen and the sight are all manifestations of the same consciousness in other words I I. Diana helps one to remove the illusion that the self must be visual. The feeling of I is always present in knowledge. Its nature is knowledge. Knowledge presupposes some result of impressions on one's consciousness. In truth there is nothing visual. How do you feel the I that you know? Do you hold a mirror before you to know your own being? The awareness is the I. Realize it and that is the truth. Question, should we think we are not the ego? Answer, in deep sleep we do not think whether we are, so in waking state we can live without thought, our reality, and our being in that state is the absolute happiness. 
It is the thinking that makes the ego. The ego is only a thought with us. We are without thoughts. The source of thoughts is within us. If we begin to examine ourselves, we discover our real nature. It is not by mere thought you get rid of ego, it is by experience. Do not conceive of the thoughtless state as being deep sleep, trance, swoon, etc. There is no such thing as realization, there is only the warding off of thoughts. Be the reality and do not waste time by keeping on repeating I am Brahman a thousand times vocally. Ego must go in trying to see the source of its own reality. Question, how can the mind be made to go? Answer, no attempt is made to destroy it. To think or wish is in itself a thought. If a thinker is sought, the thoughts will disappear. Question, will they disappear of themselves? It looks so difficult. Answer, they will disappear because they are unreal. The idea of difficulty is itself an obstacle to realization. It must be overcome. To remain as the self is not difficult. This thought of difficulty is the chief obstacle. A little practice to find out the source of I will make you think differently. Absolute freedom from thoughts is the state conducive to such recognition of the self. Mind is but an aggregate of thoughts. Some jhanis may get the power of invisibility and intangibility of body. They are known as siddhas. They are equal to siva and can even grant boons, but no powers can equal self-realization. People are not content with their idea of jhana and want siddhis with it. They look to the body only. They are likely to neglect the supreme happiness of jhana and go through bypass instead of the royal path and be lost on the way. Jhana comprises all and a jhani will not waste a thought on the occult powers. Language is only a medium for communication of one's thoughts to another. It is called an after thoughts arise, they do so after the I thought. The I thought is the root of all conversation. One understands another when one remains without thinking by the universal language. Silence is ever speaking. It is perennial. It is interrupted by speaking. These words obstruct that mute language. There is electricity flowing in a wire. When resistance occurs in its passage, it glows as a lamp or turns as a fan. In the wire it remains full of electric energy. Similarly also silence is eternal flow of language obstructed by words. What one fails to know by conversation extending to several years can be known in a trice in silence, or before silence, for example, Dakshinamurti and his four disciples. That is the highest language and most effective. Occult powers are in the realm of the mind only. Regarding telepathy, what is the difference between hearing from far or near? Telepathy cannot be without the receiver, nor clairvoyance without the seer. It is only those who matter. Without the receiver there cannot be telepathy without the seer vision. Telepathy and radio enable one to see and hear from afar. They are all the same hearing and seeing. It does not make any difference in the function. The fundamental factor is the hearer subject. Without him there can be no hearing and no seeing. The latter are functions of mind. The powers are in mind only. They are not natural to the self. That which is not natural but acquired cannot be eternal. They are not worth trying for. When one possessed of limited powers is miserable, he wants to expand his powers to be happy. But consider if it will be so. With limited perceptions he is miserable. The misery must increase proportionately with extended perceptions. Occult powers will not bring happiness. Moreover, what are they for? To make others praise one's ego. God's self is the highest power and most worth seeking. That which results in peace is the highest occult power. Question, how has the self forgotten its true nature? 
answer, both oblivion and memory are only thought forms. They will alternate so long as there are thoughts. Memory and oblivion depend on I which, when one looks for it is not found because it is unreal. These truths are not realized because the samskaras have not been destroyed. The roots of doubt and confusion are samskaras which must be cut. The latter is done by following the practice prescribed by the guru. The guru leaves it to the seeker to do this part so that he might by himself find out its truth. Practice renders the seeds of asanas ineffective. Your explanation in this secret path that intellect is something added to the self later, something superimposed by evolution, is not strictly correct from the highest standpoint. It must always have existed in the self in order to have manifested. Hence latently it was co-eternal with self and did not come later. The tree must have been contained within the seed or could not have sprung out of it. So too intellect must have been contained in this cell from the beginning. Question. Why should not Maharshi help the masses by lecturing to them? Answer. Is not God working? Is he making speeches? Can work be done only through speech? Do you know the amount of work that can be silently turned without any speech? See the mind. You stand aloof from it. You are not the mind and the self will remain over. Maharshi told Dandapani Swami, after the later had related a vivid clairvoyant dream wherein Maharshi appeared to him and answered certain questions for him. You were very anxious to know these answers, and it was your own self which supplied them to you. I have no knowledge of having visited you. Chapter 19 the ultimate as reality. This path Atmavachara is the direct path, all others are indirect ways. The first leads to the self, the others elsewhere. And even if the latter paths do arrive at the self, it is only because they lead at the end to the first path which ultimately carries them to the goal. So if in the end the aspirants must adopt the first, why not do so now? Why waste time? Question, so it amounts to this, that I should always look within. Answer, yes. Question, should I not see the world at all? Answer, you are not instructed to shut your eyes to the world. If you consider yourself as the body, the world appears as external. If you are the self, the world appears as Brahman. Question, the Gita says the worlds are like beads on a string. How? Answer, Krishna means that they are not apart from me. The differences are physically apparent and therefore the Gita emphasizes the unity. Question, but that unity is only after merging into the Lord. Answer, where are we now? The illusion and we are all in him. Regarding Maya, the idea that phenomena are unreal in all the senses is to be repudiated but that alone which is permanent and does not change is worth the name of reality. The world is not real apart from the hidden reality. Hence it is really the spiritual reality itself in another way. Ananda lives in every being. Question. The difficulty lies in reaching it. Answer. There is no reaching it because it is eternal. If the self were to be gained anew, it will not be permanent. Question, how shall I reach the self? Answer, there is no reaching the self. If self were to be reached, it would mean that self is not here and now, but that it should be got anew. What is got afresh will also be lost. So it will be impermanent. What is not permanent is not worth striving for. So I say self is not reached. You are the self. You are already that. The fact is that you are ignorant of your blissful state. Ignorance supervenes and draws a veil over the pure bliss. Attempts are directed only towards removing the ignorance. This ignorance is only wrong knowledge. The wrong lies in the false identification of the self with the body, the mind, etc. This false identity must go by inquiry into the self, and there is the self. It is beyond duality. 
If there is one there will be two also. Without one the other numbers are not. The truth is neither one nor the two. It is as it is. Be always reflecting and feeling the real being. Be that. Cling close to it. Let your quest be constant and sustained until you catch the self and thereby find eternal happiness. Question, how to get rid of Maya? Answer, do not trouble to conquer Maya. Be in your real state and Maya will go away of its own accord. If you attempt to conquer it, it will lead you through many difficulties. B. If you get any other extraneous thoughts, find out who gets them. But whether you think that you are the real self or not, you are always that. For such a simple patent thing as self-realization, there is so much worry, so many yogas. Why? You are the real self, how can you be different from it? Question, we are ignorant. Tell us the way to cross the ocean of illusion. Miharshi did not reply. One half hour later the inquirer repeated his question. Maharshi said, You say that you know you are ignorant. Indeed you are the knower of all. And yet you say that you do not know. By realizing the one we know all the many gods. The consciousness of the self is the normal state. Our present entanglement is the abnormal state. We imagine that we have to develop towards a perfect state when we are in it now but have covered it with accretions of external things and thoughts. People talk of attaining the superconsciousness. This is wrong. This self is our normal consciousness. We imagine we have to develop and attain it, but we are in it all the time. Only our attention is diverted away from it to intellect and objects. Anything which has to be attained is not the reality, not the truth. We are already the reality, the truth. I came here not knowing why. I was literally charmed here. But when one realizes the seer there is nothing else to be seen, no other place one wishes to go to visit. Seer, the object seen, and the act of seeing, all these now merge into one, the substratum of all. The state of realization is like a straight main road. The intellect and the senses are the jungle. We are all wandering about in the jungle. It is difficult to get to the main road, but once there the way is straight and easy. That is why I say this realization of the self is easy. Question, but as regards the sitting in silence and meditation on self being so influential on others, would you say that this force is able to overcome the passions and excited thoughts of most people? Answer, yes it is the highest power and overcomes all else. There is no time sequence in true spiritual development. You are spiritual here and now. Do not entrap yourself into mental cages of planes, degrees of growth, states of being, etc. Do not hug these false limitations. You are the spiritual self. Be that. This idea that you have to find yourself is a foolish one. What is there to find? According to that there are two persons, one is searching for the other. So you are the true self, but you wrongly identify yourself with the ego ahankara and the body. We talk of attaining the self, of reaching God with time. There is nothing to attain. We are already self-existent. Nor will there ever be a time when we shall be nearer to God than now. We are now ever blissful, self-existent, the infinite. Our consciousness is unbroken, continuous and eternal. It is all Maya self-hypnotism to imagine that now we are otherwise. To hypnotize yourself. It is ego ahankara which deludes itself that there are two selves, one of which we are conscious now the person and one the higher, the divine of which we shall one day become conscious. This is false. There is only one self and it is fully conscious now and ever. There is neither past, present nor future for it, since it is out of time. Without the infinite power, God, the true self, this incense would not burn, this world would not exist. 
This self is in all forms. It alone gives them reality. Hence the illumined one finds himself in all others, for he has found unity and no longer perceives multiplicity. The universe exists within the self. Therefore it is real but only because it obtains its reality from the self. We call it unreal however to indicate its changing appearances and transient forms, whereas we call the self real because it is changeless. After realization the body and all else will not appear different from the self. Knowledge presupposes some result of impressions on one's consciousness. Isfera, God, the Creator, the personal God is the last of unreal forms to go. Only the Absolute Being is real. Hence, not only the world, not only the ego, but also the personal God are of unreality. We must find the Absolute nothing less. While men regard themselves as bodies, ignoring their true nature as spirit without form, they naturally fall into the error of regarding the Supreme God as being with form. Realization is the cure of both. Question, does the Absolute know itself? Answer, it is ever conscious, it is beyond both knowledge and ignorance. Your question presupposes subject and object, but the Absolute is beyond both. It is knowledge itself. Maharshi told that when a youth, the actual process of obtaining his spiritual self-realization took no longer than twenty minutes. The next few years were spent merely in establishing this realization and in gradual adjustment. There is nothing to get really. It is here now. Question. I maintain that the physical body of the man immersed in samadhi as a result of unbroken contemplation of the self need not become motionless for that reason. It may be active or inactive. Another man asserts that physical movement certainly prevents nirvikalpa, samadhi or unbroken contemplation. What is your opinion? Answer, both of you are right, you refer to sahaja nirvikalpa and the other refers to kavala nirvikalpa. In the latter case, the mind lies immersed in the light of the self. The subject discriminates one from the other, samadhi, the stirring up from samadhi and activity thereafter. Unrest of the body, of the sight, of the vital force and of the mind, cognizance of objects and activity are obstructions for him. But in Sahaja, however, the mind has resolved into the self and has been lost. Differences and obstructions mentioned above do not therefore exist here. The activities of such a being are like the feeding of a somnolent boy, perceptible to the onlooker but not to the subject. The driver sleeping in his moving cart is not aware of the motion of the cart because his mind has sunk in darkness. Similarly, the Sahaja Jani remains unaware of his bodily activities because his mind is dead, having been resolved in the ecstasy of Chidananda eternal bliss. The two words contemplation and samadhi have been used loosely in the question. Contemplation is a forced mental process whereas samadhi lies beyond effort. Peace is the inner nature of man. If you find it within yourself, you will then find it everywhere. The peace that you discovered in your temporary spiritual experiences was found in yourself, it was not imposed upon you. A time will come when we shall have to laugh at our own efforts to realize for we shall find that what we were before and after to be the same. Question, how to get rid of fear? Answer, all fear is nothing more than thoughts. If there is only one, there cannot be a second to be afraid of. If we look to ourself, then as it is one there is no second to be afraid of. To think that there is something outside ourselves is the cause of fear, but if firmly rooted in our own reality, then there will be no fear, no doubt, no undesirable qualities, as all the latter are centered about the ego. The state of equanimity is the state of bliss. Realization is already here. The state free from thoughts is the one real state. There is no such action as realization. 
Is there any who is not realizing the self? Does anyone deny his existence? How is it that we do not know our self? It is the thoughts that stand between our happiness. How do we know that we exist? If you say because of the world around us, then how do you know that you existed in sleep? Question, what is liberation? Answer, it is to know you were not born. Be still and know that I am God. To be still is not to think. You have lost hold of yourself. Turn inward. If the mind's source is sought, it will vanish leaving the self behind. You become conscious of it later, but that does not mean that your nature is different from meditation even now. Stillness or peace is realization. There is no moment when the self is not. So long as there is doubt or the feeling of non-realization, the attempt must be made to rid oneself of these thoughts. The thoughts are due to identification of the self with the non-self. When non-self disappears, the self alone remains. To make room, it is enough that the constriction is removed that is, objects both physical and mental. Space is not brought in afresh. Nay more, space is there even in constriction. Absence of thought does not mean blank. There must be one to know the blank. Knowledge and ignorance are of the mind. They are born of duality. But the self is beyond knowledge and ignorance. It is self-luminous. There is no necessity to see the self with another self. There are no two selves. What is not self is non-self. The non-self cannot see the self. Sight or hearing there cannot be. Self lies beyond, all alone is pure consciousness. Just as a woman with her necklace round her neck who imagines it has been lost and goes about searching for it until she is reminded of it by a friend, has created her own anxiety of loss, and then her own pleasure of no loss, the self is there whether you search for it or not. Again, just as the woman feels fulfilled as if regaining the lost necklace were something new, so also the removal of ignorance and the cessation of false identification reveal the self which is eternally existing. This is called realization, but realization is not new. It amounts to elimination of ignorance and nothing more. The mind must be erased out of being. See who the thinker is, who the seeker is. Abide as the thinker, the seeker. All thoughts will then disappear. That ego is pure ego purged of thoughts. It is the same as the self. So long as false identification persists, doubts will persist too, questions will arise, there will be no end to them. Doubts will cease only when the non-self is put an end to. That will result in realization. There will be no one there to doubt or ask. All these doubts should be solved within. No amount of words will satisfy. Hold the thinker. When the thinker is not held, the objects appear or doubts arise. Question, how is God to be seen? Answer, within. If the mind is turned inward, God manifests as the inner consciousness. Question, but is not God in all the objects we see around us? Answer, God is in all and in the seer. Where can God be seen? He cannot be found outside. He should be felt within. To see the objects mind is necessary, and to conceive God in them is only a mental operation. But that is not real. The consciousness within, purged of the mind, is felt as God. Question. If I am infinite, how did I become finite? Answer. Analyze your words. You begin with I. Know the I first. If the question persists afterwards, it may be considered but not before. The self is here and now and alone. It is not new and something to be acquired. It is natural and permanent. The term self refers to the unlimited, the infinite self. Do not limit the meaning. Question, why this sorrow and evil in universe? Answer, 
God's will. Question, why? Answer, inscrutable. No motive can be attributed to that power. No desire, no goal to achieve can be asserted of that all-wise, all-powerful being. God like the sun is untouched by the activities which take place in his presence. If the mind is unsatisfied or restless on account of events, it is a good solution to accept God's will as the solution. Thus it is wise to drop the sense of responsibility and free will by regarding ourselves as the instruments of God, to do and suffer as he pleases. Seva, Ganapati and other deities like Brahma exist from a human standpoint. In other words, if you consider your personal self as real and existing then they also exist. Just as a government has its high executive officers to carry on the government, so has the Creator. But from the standpoint of Supreme Absolute Self all these gods are illusory and must themselves merge into the one reality. Paramatma and Atma are one and the same the Self. The Self is eternally realized. If it were not eternal it must have a beginning. What begins must have an end and is only transient. There is no use seeking temporary condition. The fact is that it is the state of effortless peace. Effortlessness while remaining aware is the bliss state. Question, you say that even the highest God is still only an idea. Does that mean there is no God? Answer, no, there is an isfera. The seat of realization is within because the seeker cannot find it as an object outside him. That seat is bliss and is the core of all. Hence it is called the heart. The only useful purpose of this birth is to turn within and realize. There is nothing else to do. Question, why does Krishna speak of evolution? Does Bhagavan believe in evolution? Answer, evolution must be from one state to another. When no differences are admitted, how can evolution arise? How does the Gita begin? So there is no birth, no death, no present as you look at it. Reality was, is and will be. It is changeless. Later Arjuna asked Krishna how could he have lived before Aditya. Then Krishna, seeing Arjuna had confounded him with the gross body, spoke to him accordingly. The instruction was then to one who sees diversity. There is however no bondage or liberation to himself or others from the Jani's standpoint. There is no liberation, it could only be if there was bondage. There was really no bondage and so it follows there is no liberation. There is no question of years. Prevent this thought at this moment. You are only in your natural state whether you practice yoga or not. Question, why do not all realize in that case? Answer, it is the same question in another form. Why do you raise this question? Inasmuch as you raise this question of effort in yoga, it shows you require it. Do it. But remain without questions and doubts and it is the natural state. Self is not attainable because you are the self. Forgetfulness never overtakes the self. It is your nature. Self is now confounded with the non-self, and that makes you speak of oblivion. If an inquiry is made whether mind exists, it will be found that it does not. That is control of mind. Otherwise, if the mind is taken to exist and one seeks to control it, it would amount to mind controlling the mind. In that way mind only persists but eludes itself. Question, why is there imperfection in perfection? Answer, for whom is relativity? For whom is imperfection? The Absolute is not imperfect. Does the Absolute tell you that it is covered up? It is the individual soul who says something covers the Absolute. Question, several terms are used in holy books, Atman, Paramatman, Para, etc. What is the distinction between them? Answer, they mean the same to the user of the words but are understood differently by persons according to their development. Question, but why use so many words to mean the same thing? 
Answer, it is according to circumstances. They all mean the self. Para means not relative, in other words, the absolute. Question, does not bhakti imply duality? Answer, bhakti and self-realization are the same. The self of the Advaitins is the god of the Bhaktas. Just as the individual body comprises the soul, the ego and the gross body, so also God comprises paramatma, world and individuals. Being the self, why does one continue to crave for happiness? To be rid of that craving is itself salvation. Scriptures say, you are that. The import of that knowledge is their proper purpose. The realization must be your finding out who you are and to abide as that I. To be saying I am that or not this is only waste of time. For the worthy disciple the work is within himself and not without. Being in Turavanamalite if one asks for the route it is ridiculous. So also being the self, if one asks how to realize it it is absurd. Remain in the self. That is all. The I is the fundamental basis, by knowing which all else is known. Question, why are so many gods mentioned? Answer, the body is only one. Still, how many functions are performed by it? The source of all the functions is only one. It is the same with the gods. Question, how can I remember my real self? What you say is for persons in the position of Maharshi himself. Answer, how can you forget it? How is the Maharshi different from you? He is not a person with two horns. Whatever happens to your body, the self continues throughout. Question, what is this self? Answer, know the self and God is known. Of all the definitions of God, none is so well put as the biblical, I am that I am. But none is so direct as the name Jehovah, I am. The absolute is. It is self, God. Question, convince me of the existence of God. Answer, realization of the self amounts to such conviction. To one seeking help, I am Atma. Atma is the Guru and Atma is grace also. No one remains without Atma. He is always in contact. Nothing is more intimate. The body is not I. The body could not exist without our own existence. Why should we see the body as different from the self? The self is not born nor does it die. There is nothing new. The sages see everything in and of the self. There is no diversity. Therefore, there is no birth or death. To give grace is not a special function of God, nor is there any special time or occasion when He is gracious or occasions when He is not gracious. Question, is God personal? Answer, yes, God is always the first person standing before you. We must give up everything and make God alone manally stand before one. Question, no answer comes to my search inward. Answer, the inquirer is the answer and no other answer can come. What comes cannot be true. What is is true. Man cannot help being in his own nature, he has but to know it. Question, how is I I consciousness felt? Answer, as an unbroken awareness of I. It is simply consciousness. You are that even now. There will be no mistaking it when pure. Question, can that consciousness give any pleasure? Answer, its nature is pleasure. Pleasure alone is. There is no enjoyer to enjoy pleasure. Enjoyer and pleasure both merge in it. Pleasure is turning and keeping the mind within. Pain is sending it outward. Absence of pleasure is called pain. One's nature is pleasure, in other words, bliss. It is not the soul which yearns for realization as the latter is always there. Do you deny yourself? No, then the self exists. It is only the ego which seeks. In Yoga Vasishta, it says what is real is hidden from us, but what is false is revealed as true. 
we are actually experiencing the reality only. Still, we do not know it. Is it not a wonder of wonders? Question, how to get rid of fear? Answer, what is fear? It is only a thought. When there is nothing besides the self, there is no reason to fear. Who sees the second? The ego arises first and sees object. If the ego is not, the self alone exists and there is no second. For anything external to oneself, the source is within. Seeking it, there will be no doubt, no fear, and all other thoughts centering around the ego will disappear along with the ego. Weakness or strength is in the mind. The self is beyond mind. Question. Is it necessary to give up worldly desires? Answer. Why do we desire? Inquire. If you find no real happiness there, then your mind will not go there, but by subconscious tendencies it may tempt you there, but you will return. Why do you want the life of freedom? The fact you crave for it admits you are in bondage, but really you are ever free. Know that self and desires fall away of own accord. Bring all desires and thoughts to one point within, that is realization. Mind should be still. The bee buzzes noisily around the flower seeking honey. When it finds it, it is silent and still. So with man's soul, seeking by desires the one true honey. Question, if one wants to come to goal soon, what to do? Answer, time is a conception in your mind. The goal always exists. It is not something to be newly found out. The absolute is our nature. The trouble comes in because you limit yourself. Question, are our attempts sure to succeed? Answer, realization is our nature. It is nothing new to be gained. What is new cannot be eternal, therefore there is no need for doubting if one would lose or gain the self. Question, how long will it be for one to gain Chintamani, the celestial gem conferring all the wishes on its owner? Answer, the example of Chintamani is found in Yoga Vasistha. Chintamani signifies the real nature of the self. The story is as follows. A man was making tapasya penance for gaining the Chintamani. A gem mysteriously fell into his hands. He thought that it could not be Chintamani because his effort had been too short and too little to gain the gem. He discarded it and continued the tapas. Later a sadhu placed before him a brilliant pebble cut into shape. The man was deceived by its appearance but found that it could not fulfill his desire as claimed. Similarly, the self being inherent should not be sought first elsewhere. Question, how is Purna Brahman to be attained? What is the method best suited to agree haste the householder? Answer, you have already said Purna, in other words perfection. Are you apart from Purna? If apart from it will it be Purna? If not apart, how does the question arise? The knowledge that Purna Brahman and you are not apart from the same is the finality. See it and you will find that you are not a Grihas, Do or any limited being. Knowledge of it will elucidate other matters automatically. In my early manhood when I had the death experience as a lad, I entered into the self and since then, I have not progressed or moved one iota. It has remained the same ever since, no development. Chapter 20 The Need of Ultramysticism All metaphysical discussion is profitless unless it causes us to seek within the self for the true reality. One can and often does go through numerous books, a whole library perhaps, and yet comes out without the faintest realization of what he is. Learning often renders a disservice when through it one's egotism develops with study and also pride. These prove serious obstacles to progress. Science is exploring the external universe when it has not explored the self. Inventions are being made constantly. They will never cease as we can go on inventing one new thing after another ad lib. What is the good? All this is Maya. 
turn inwards and know yourself first. All these notes you are making of my sayings, etc., are useful for beginners, for friends, and to answer the questions of others. But for yourself, you know they are only pieces of paper. Do yourself dive into the self and find all you want to know there. All controversies about creation, the nature of the universe, evolution, the purposes of God are useless. They do not conduce to our true happiness. People try to find out about things which are outside of them before they try to find out who am I. Only by the latter means can they gain happiness, not by understanding the whole universe. For the self is happiness. Ananda is the bliss of not being disturbed by any mental activity or characteristics. There is a temporary bliss and a permanent one. The former state is called Kavala Samadhi. The latter is called Sahaja Nirvikalpa Samadhi, in other words the state of Nirvikalpa that has become natural. The jhani in the former state of Kavala Samadhi enjoys the bliss of Samadhi arising from the cessation of mental activity and disappearance of outside objects, but after a while his bliss ceases as mental activities begin and there is no Samadhi for a time. But the latter state of Sahaja Nirvikalpa Samadhi means that there is no relapse into mental activities etc. and no consequent loss of bliss. His happiness is unbroken and ever enduring. His body, senses and mind may be operative though but the person is hardly conscious of the acts of his body. The life current originates in the heart. This heart is not the physiological organ of that name but a spiritual center near to it. Thus everyone, even a child of every creed or race when referring to the heart as a metaphor meaning the deepest feelings, will nevertheless touch the breast with their hands. But such discussions as inside or outside the body cannot arise in self-realization. When you have found the center, you will find that it is spread out to the circumference of the whole world, if you wish, the radius can be extended to your body or to the world. We start with the wrong presumption that the circle is confined to the human form. Locate the center first. To that you always return in it. You always remain. It is the common center for all humanity when they realize. Question. After some period of meditation I find thought dies away and stillness reigns. Within that stillness I am aware of a tiny seed or point in my breast or heart upon which all my attention is centered. Is this the self you mention? Answer, yes, that is the self, though you have to go deeper to perfect your realization. Hold on to it. Do not lose the current. Do not lose it by having the wrong idea that I am meditating on the self, I am meditating on something else. At such a point try to realize that you are the self, that this stillness is your natural condition. Hence watch vigilantly that you do not fall away from it. The intricate maze of philosophy of different schools is said to clarify matters and reveal the truth, but in fact they create confusion where no confusion need exist. To understand anything there must be the self. The self is obvious. Why not remain as the self? What need to explain the non-self? Take the Vedanta for instance. They say there are fifteen kinds of prana. The student is made to commit the names to memory and also their functions. The air goes up and is called prana, goes down and is called apana, operates the indriyas and is called something else. Why all this? Why do you classify, give names and enumerate the functions and so on? Is it not enough to know that one prana does the whole work? The antakarana inner instrument comprised of the intellect, the mind, ego and the consciousness manas, buddhi, ahankara and sit thinks, desires, wills, reasons etc. and each function is attributed to one name such as mind, intellect etc. Has any man seen the pranas or the antakaranas? Have they any real being? They are mere conceptions, when and where will such conceptions end? Consider the following. A man sleeps. 
He says on waking that he slept. The question is asked, why does he not say in his sleep that he is sleeping? The answer is given that he is sunk in the self and cannot speak like a man who is diving into water to bring something from the bottom. The diver cannot speak. When he has actually recovered the article and comes out he speaks. Well, what is the explanation? Being in water, water will flow into his mouth if he were to open the mouth for speaking. Is it not simple? But the philosopher is not content with this simple fact. He explains saying that fire is the deity presiding over speech, that it is inimical to water and therefore cannot function. This is called philosophy and the learners are struggling to learn all this. Is it not sheer waste of time? Again the gods are said to preside over the limbs and senses of the individual. So they go on explaining herein, agarba the cosmic form of the self etc. Why should confusion be created and then explained away? Fortunate is the man who does not involve himself in this maze. I was indeed fortunate that I never took it. Had I taken to it, I would probably be nowhere, always in confusion. My Vasanas fortunately took me directly to the Who Am I inquiry. Question, what of scientific knowledge? Answer, all relative knowledge pertains to the mind, not the self. It is therefore illusory, not permanent. A scientist who formulates the theory that the earth is round, for instance, may prove it incontrovertibly. When he falls asleep the whole idea vanishes, his mind is left a blank. What does it matter if the world is round or flat when he is asleep? So you see the futility of all such relative knowledge. Real knowledge is to go beyond all such relative knowledge and abide in self. Realize that the self transcends intellect, the latter must itself vanish to reach self. Question. Which is better to practice meditation or to study spiritual books like the Upanishads? Answer. It is entirely a matter of temperament. If you find that meditation suits you and helps to attain progress then go on with it. Some other men find that studying books suits them better than meditation. Different people must have different paths. It is a matter of individual taste and temperament. Question, are there thoughts in samadhi or not? Answer, there will be only feeling I am and no other thoughts. Question, is not I am a thought? Answer, the egoless I am is not a thought. It is realization. Mental quiet is easier to attain and earlier, but the ultimate goal is mental destruction. Most paths lead to the first, whereas self-inquiry leads to it quickly and then to the second. Find where mind takes its rise or who is mentally quiet and you succeed. Question, what particular steps will be helpful to mind control? Answer, that depends on circumstances of each. Bhakti karma, jhana, and yoga are all one. You cannot love God without knowing Him nor know without loving Him. Love manifests in everything you do not that it is karma. The adoption of mental perception yoga is the necessary preliminary before you can know or love God in the proper way. The jhanas point out that the yogi assumes the existence of the body, its separateness from the self, and therefore advises effort for the reunion by practice of yoga. The body is in the mind which has the brain for its seat which again functions by the light borrowed from another source, as admitted by the yogis themselves in their fountain theory. The jhani further argues if the light is borrowed it must come from its native source. Go to the source direct and do not depend on borrowed resources. Just as an iron ball comes into being as separate from the mass of iron when taken from the fiery heat it cools down later giving up the fire, but must be again made fiery to reunite with the mass, so also the cause of separation must also form the factor of union. Again if there is an image reflected, there must be a source and also accessories like the sun, a pot and water for reflection. 
To undo the reflection, either the surface may be covered, corresponding to our reaching the fountain according to the yogis, or the water may be drained away which is called tapas. In other words, the thoughts or the brain activities are made to cease. This is jhana marga. All these are however on the assumption that the jiva is separate from self or brahman. But are we separate? No, says the jhani. The ego is simply wrong identity of the self with the non-self, as in the case of a colorless crystal and its background. The crystal though colorless appears red because of its background. If the background is removed, the crystal shines in its original purity. So it is with the self in the Antakaranas. Question. Three or four times in my life great spiritual ecstasies came and went. I want them permanently. Answer. They have come and gone, but you have not gone. Your real self is still there. There is a unity really, but intellect makes the differences. Yet intellect is a power faculty of the self, but the principle which lies behind the intellect cannot be known by the intellect. However much you learn, there will be no bounds to knowledge. You ignore the doubter but try to solve the doubts. On the other hand, hold the doubter and the doubts will disappear. Yoga and meditation are for ordinary people. Vichara is for the wise. Vichara is the means to get realization. There are men of giant intellect who are spending their lives in discovering knowledge about many things but all this intellect is being turned outwards. What is the use of knowing about everything when you do not yet know yourself? Ask these men if they know who they are and they will hang their heads in shame. Question. What is the difference between meditation and vichara? Answer. Meditation can be upon an external or other object. Thus subject and object differ. In vichara both subject and object are the same, the self. I never knew of these philosophical conundrums and controversies and problems till after I came to Turuvanamalai and people began to pester or come to me. Up till then I had never concerned myself with them. I never knew any system of philosophy. All these systems have evolved out of the one simple fact of realization. Therefore seek realization, practice vichara and do not worry about philosophies and systems and problems. But all these rules regarding hours etc. of meditation are only for beginners. There will come a time when you will say, I have given up meditation. Because then you will have realized that the idea connotes duality, namely a person who meditates, and an object of meditation, and you will perceive the standpoint of the true self which does not need to meditate. Let us not begin to exercise our intellect upon Atman by trying to find of what sort is the self-effulgence of this Atman, whether it is of this sort or that. It is such discursive thought that constitutes our bondage. Do not allow a single mental activity to intrude into your dhyanam. One should continue the practice so long as ego ahankara or sense of possession are not completely put down, in other words, till you can at will and without effort keep the mind free of concepts or activities. Otherwise you must go on with the practice. Question, do you go into nerve kalpa samadhi? Answer, if the eyes be closed it is nerve kalpa, if open it is savakalpa. The ever-present state is the natural one, in other words, sahaja. Ecstatic experience implies association of a very subtle mind. What is your state in sleep? No ecstasy nor pain, but beyond both. The natural state is just that with consciousness of existence added. The final obstacle to meditation is ecstasy. You feel great bliss and happiness and stay in that ecstasy. Do not yield to it but pass on to the sixth stage, which is great calm. The calm is higher than ecstasy and it merges into samadhi. Successful samadhi causes a waking sleep state to supervene, when you are always consciousness, for consciousness is your nature. Hence a man is always in samadhi. 
only he does not know it. All he has to do is to remove the above obstacles. Yes, intellect can be a help towards realization up to a certain stage, but intellect must vanish to reach the self. Question, how does book lore help? Answer, only so far as to make a man spiritually aspiring. Question, how does intellect help? Answer, only so far as to make him sink his intellect in the ego and ego in self. After realization, all intellectual loads are thrown overboard as flotsam. Whose is the intellect? It is man's. Intellect is only an instrument. The study of the sacred books will not suffice to reveal the truth. So long as the sanas are latent in the mind, realization cannot be achieved. Sastra scripture learning is itself of a sana. Realization is only in samadhi. Samadhi alone can reveal it. Thoughts cast a veil over reality and so it cannot be clear in states other than samadhi. Question, yoga means union. But the union of what with which? Answer, exactly. Yoga implies division, union of one with another. Who is to be united with whom? You are the seeker seeking union with something. That something is apart from you. Yourself is intimate to you. You are aware of the self. Seek it and be it. That will expand as infinity. Then there will be no question of yoga, etc. Whose is Vyoga apart from yoga? Find it. Stoppage of mental activities is applicable to all systems of yoga. The methods differ. So long as there is effort made towards that goal, it is called yoga. The effort is the yoga. The cessation can be brought about in so many ways. 1. By questing the mind itself. When the mind is sought, its activities cease automatically. This is the method of jhana. The pure mind is the self. 2. Looking for the source of the mind is another method. The source may be said to be God or self or consciousness. 3. Concentrating upon one thought makes all other thoughts to disappear. Finally that thought also disappears. Question. What is the sun path Ravi Marga? What is the moon path Chandra Marga? Which of them is easier? Answer. Sun path is jhana. Moon path is yoga. Yogis think that after purifying 12,000 nadis in the body, the sushumna is entered and the mind passes up to the sahasrara chakra, and there is nectar trickling. These are all mental concepts. The mind is already overwhelmed by the world of concepts. Better concepts are now added in the shape of this yoga. The object of all these is to rid the man of concepts, to make him in here as the pure self, in other words, absolute consciousness, bereft of thoughts. Why not go straight to it? Why add new encumbrances to the already existing one? Chapter 21 Eastern and Western Thinkers Adi Sankara Question Some say that Sankara was only an intellectual not realized. Answer Why worry about Sankara? Realize yourself. Others can take care of themselves. Sankara's books are good for discussions and intellectual argument, but the practical experience is required. Question, is Maharshi's teaching the same as Sankara's? Answer, Maharshi's teaching is only an expression of his own experience and realization. Others find that it tallies with Sri Sankara's. Question, can it be put in other ways to express the same realization? Answer, a realized man will use his own language. Silence is the best language. Sankara's Vivekachudamani verses 1, 170 sums up the whole of Jhana Yoga. The Mayavada theory of Sankara. The master said in the course of his conversation, reality and illusion are both the same. A disciple asked how it could be so. Maharshi, 
The Tantrika and others condemn Sri Sankara's philosophy as Mayavada, in other words philosophy of illusion without understanding him aright. What does he say? One Brahman is real. Two the universe is unreal a myth. Three Brahman is the universe. The Tantrika may be justified if Sri Sankara had stopped with his second statement but he amplifies the first two statements with the third one. What does it signify? It signifies that perception is wrong and illusory. The antagonists point to illustration, snake in the rope and think they have explained an unqualified myth. After the truth of the rope is known, the illusion of the snake is removed once and for all. Since this illustration does not completely clarify the position he presses another analogy to his aid in other words the mirage. Its mythical nature is qualified. A mirage does not disappear even after knowing it to be mirage. The appearance persists but now the man does not run to it for water. Similarly it is known to be unreal. The disputants continue to argue as follows. Admitting both the illustrations, how is the world proved to be unreal? The water of the mirage is certainly unreal because it can serve no useful purpose, but the phenomena of the world differ from it because of their usefulness. Sankara argues, a phenomenon cannot be admitted to be real simply because it serves a purpose. He brings in the third example of the dream. The dream creations are full of purpose and they do serve the dream purpose. For example, the dream water quenches the thirst in the dream. The dream creation is however contradicted in the waking state. What is real at one moment and unreal at the next moment cannot be said to be real. If real, it should be always so. So it is with the magical creations. They appear real and are yet illusory. If then the earnest seeker asks why the world should yet appear, he replies with the counter question, to whom does it appear? Your reply must be to the self. Otherwise the question will arise, will the world appear in the absence of the cognizing self? Therefore the self is the ultimate and sole reality. His conclusion thus amounts to this. The phenomena are real when seen as the self and myths when seen apart from the self. Now what do the tantrics say? They say that the phenomena are real because they are part of the reality in which they appear. Are not these two statements the same? That is what I meant by reality, illusion are the same. Kotapada. Question. In Mandakya Karika, it says that there is no difference between the two states from the standpoint of absolute reality. Answer, of course. The dream is for the one who says that he is awake. In fact, wakefulness and dream are equally unreal from the absolute standpoint. Buddha Buddha has been unjustly accused of being an atheist because he denied the existence of a substratum. It is true that the self is both everything and nothing. As matter it is every form, but as the abstract self, the void out of which matter springs, it is nothing. Matter is relatively real, real in a limited sense, for its origin is the reality itself. Krishna Krishna's showing the universal vision to Arjuna was only to enable Arjuna to see through Krishna's eyes like a mesmerist. What was given Arjuna for the occasion were not his eyes but Krishna's eyes. The stars and worlds which Arjuna saw were not real. Space is not real. Time also is not real. Another time, Krishna gave the vision of universal form to Arjuna, but this does not mean that Asvara himself sees the universe like that. He does not view all the individuals, he sees only the self. Krishna merely lent his eyes to Arjuna to help the latter to see. Gandhi Babu Rajendra Prasad, the president of the Indian National Congress, visited Maharshi. On leaving he asked for a message which he could convey to Gandhi. Maharshi said, When heart speaks to heart, what need is there for words? 
Ramakrishna. Question, Ramakrishna wept before God. Is that not the path to follow? Answer, he had a powerful force drawing him on through all his experiences. He could trust that great power to take him onto the goal. Tears are often considered a sign of weakness, but that great person was not weak. These manifestations of weeping are only passing signs of the great current carrying us on. We must look to the end to be achieved. Jesus Question. Is self-knowledge what Jesus meant by the expression kingdom of heaven? Answer. Yes. That in teens can understand him. Question. Was Jesus a seta adept with occult powers? Answer. He could not have been conscious of his occult power siddhis. He could not have been aware at the time that he was curing men of their diseases. In Christianity the cross is the body, God is the Father, the absolute being. When the ego perishes the process is called resurrection. Jesus calling out my God. On the cross may have been an intercession on behalf of the two thieves who were crucified with him. A Johnny may appear to suffer, another may be in trance, another may disappear from sight before death. Howsoever he departs from the body, it is immaterial and makes no difference in his state. The Johnny who appears to suffer does so only in the eyes of the onlooker and not to himself, for he has already transcended the mistaken identity of self with body. St. Paul after Paul became self-conscious, he identified the illumination with Christ consciousness. Illumination is absolute. Christ consciousness, Ravana, self are all one and the same. Krishnamurti Maharshi said of a talk by Krishnamurti, how did he get all this enlightenment? Meaning that Krishnamurti had to evolve through many births using idols, images, teachers, yoga, etc., and now kicks away the ladder by which he rose, not being tolerant to understand the limitations of people. Buck. Question. Of what nature is the beatific illumination of the Westerners mentioned in Buck's cosmic consciousness? Answer. It came as a flash and disappeared as such. That which has a beginning must also end. Only when the ever-existent consciousness is recognized will it be permanent. Maharaja of Mysore The late Maharaja of Mysore had an interview with Maharshi for 15 minutes. He said, I am not a free person, I cannot come and stay here like your disciples. So I beg your grace. He remained silent for five minutes and prostrated and left, asking a sram to keep his visit secret. Afterwards, Maharshi observed that Maharaja was a most advanced soul and speech between them was not needed. Sri Aurobindo Question. Sri Aurobindo says that the self-light which resides in the head must be brought down to the heart. Answer. Is not the self already in the heart? How can self be taken from one place to another? Question. He is teaching the ideal of bringing about the descent of the divine. Answer, when the self is known how can it either ascend or descend? It is always in one place. Question, what is Bhagavan's opinion of Sri Aurobindo's yoga and his claim to have probed beyond the experience of the Vedic Rishis? Answer, Aurobindo advises complete surrender. Let us do it first, await results and discuss further if need be afterwards and not now. There is no use discussing transcendental experiences by those whose you pad his limiting adjuncts are not divested. Learn what surrender is, it is to merge in the self. The self is that to which we surrender our egos and let the supreme power in other words the self do what it pleases. The ego is already the self's. We have no right over the ego even as it is. Supposing we have, we surrender. Aurobindo's talk of bringing down divine consciousness from above overlooks that the same is already in the heart. The kingdom of God is within, says the Bible. What is to be brought down? From where? 
Who is to bring what and why? Realization is only to remove the obstacles, to recognize the eternal, immanent reality. Reality is. It need not be taken from place to place, etc. Question. What about Aurobindo's claim to start from self-realization and develop further? Answer. Let us first realize and then see. The Vasish to Advaitins say that the Atma is first realized and the realized Devatma is surrendered to Paramatma. Only then it is complete. The Anga individual part is given up to the Angi, the one who has sepitate limbs. That is Moksha and Sayajiya united with God. Simple self-realization stops at Kaivalya aloneness, state of liberation, says Vasish to Advaitin. The Siddhas say that the one who leaves his body behind as a corpse cannot attain mukti. They are reborn. Only such as whose bodies dissolve in space in light or from sight attain salvation moksha. They say the Advaitins of Sankara type mistakenly stop short at self-realization as if it is the end. There are others who extol their own pet theories as the best. Paul Brunton Several times visitors asked Maharishi how Paul Brunton came to have the illumination described in search in secret India, and why they could not get it after many years. Maharshi said Paul Brunton practiced sadhana in former births to a highly advanced state and consequently was ripe for fuller illumination. Someone also asked whether Paul Brunton's work was merely journalistic or the result of genuine spirituality. Maharshi answered, What room can there be for doubt? One day Maharshi said to Paul Brunton, You are saying the same thing in your books that I say, only you say it in a modern way. Sri Ramana Maharshi's personal message to Paul Brunton sent by post to England, Fear not. Thou art the self. Be that. Mere mental figments are far and near. No room for doubt in the true self so need not worry whether path is right or not. Fear and doubt are only in path unknown. The path itself will teach you right. When the financial secretary, Mysore Govt, came and asked, Is Paul Brunton's The Secret Path useful to Indians also? Miharshi replied, Yes for all. The inquirer then said, The doctrine that body senses etc., are not I, is common among us, but how to practice to realize it. Maharshi replied, by the threefold method mentioned in Brunton's book. The secretary said, there is a blankness intervening according to the book. Maharshi replied, yes. Do not stop there. See for whom the blankness appears. There is Leah. Even disciples become unconscious in Leia and wake up after some time. Mussolini during Italo Abyssinian War Maharshi remarked, It is a pity that a man like Mussolini who is no ordinary person, who is endowed with such unusual gifts, should not use them for a higher purpose but misuse them for the destruction of his fellows.